Good morning, everyone. My name is Ben Self. I'm the uh, understudy for John Steinbeck while he's in the courtroom today. Today we'll be having uh, live coverage of Charlie Adelson's trial, day three. And with me I have Carl Steinbeck. He's a retired uh, uh, former prosecutor and uh, active practicing attorney. So I'll, with that, I'll hand it over to Carl. Morning, Carl. Hi, good morning. So today we're going to cover some of the trial, assuming we have good uh, connections here. And uh, keep in mind, this is day three. We're ready to hear Luis Rivera, one of the hitmen that uh, cooperated with the government, got a 19-year sentence, and he's willing to testify uh, some more and talk about what his involvement was. And last Friday, we saw the government get done uh, with their questioning. And so this morning, we're going to see the uh, Daniel Attorney Rochebaum Defense Counsel for Charlie Adelson be cross-examining him. So we're going to probably see him trying to bring out um, maybe through this witness, I'm not sure if he's going to say that he was part of the, the so-called extortion racket for Charlie, but keep in mind that, uh, you know, Charlie's defense is basically saying that within 24 hours of the hit on um, Dan Mark Hill, that he was willing to give $100,000 to Katie to give to the hit men. And yet think about it less than two years later when the uh, undercover agent bump happened on Donna, his mother, that he was at that point ready to flee the country and uh, also was talking about killing that undercover agent, either having Katie do it or he would do it himself. So it just goes to show that he was very much um, close contact, treating her as a friend, not as an extortionist threat uh, person on his life. And keep in mind, he never once told anything to his family about the so-called extortion on him because it never happened. So let's go ahead, uh, Ben, if you want to focus back on uh, What's going on in the courtroom? There's a jury walking in, that's why they're standing up. Starting a little bit earlier this morning. Yeah, Debbie, I, I think uh, I think it's not as big a question. I think Katie is gonna testify, possibly as soon as today. Morning, yeah, we're going to try to do ongoing. Um, like I said, I don't know if my uh, <clears throat> Wi-Fi hotspot will cooperate the whole time, but if it doesn't, then I'll just go to my Friday cell phone, which seems to not be a problem. The examination of Mr. Rivera, Mr. Rauschbaum, you may cross-examine when you're ready. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, she would know, and that's why she's going to call her as a witness. Veronica, are you having problems still hearing? All right. If you can assist him, Mr. Rivera, make sure you speak as loudly as you can, right. sir. And the answer to that question is no, right? No. You were paid $37,000 in your role in the murder of Professor Mark Hill, right? Yes. You were supposed to be paid $35,000. Yes. Secreto Garcia, the shooter, gave you an extra 2000 right? Yes. Your understanding was that the total payment was $100,000, correct? Yes. And that it was a one-time payment? Yes, sir. And you were told that you, Secreto, and Katie were hired by a lady to do a murder for hire, right? No. <clears throat> I was told about a lady? No, I'm sorry. Let me, let me slow down. You were told by Secreto that all of you were hired by a lady to do the murder, right? Yeah. That you were doing it so that she could get her kids back. Yes, sir. And all of your information came from Sigfredo Garcia and Katie, correct? Sigfredo, yes, sir. Okay. 
and all of Sig Fredo's information, to your knowledge, came from Katie, right? Yes, sir. Everything you knew about the murder plot came from Sig Fredo. Yes, sir. According to you, Katie was the mastermind. Yes, sir. She was the run one, as you've said, running the shots. Yes, sir. Anything that Sigfredo or you did in connection with the murder had to be cleared through Katie, correct? Yes, sir. And Sigfredo and Katie lied to you about a lot of things about this murder, right? Not about what? Well, let's go through it. For starters, during the first trip in early June, Sigfredo told you that you were going to do a robbery, right? Yes, sir. Not until on the way up did you find out that you were going to do a murder. Yes, sir. Before the July trip, you didn't want to go, right? Yes, sir. And to convince you, Sigfredo again told you that you were just going there to scope things out. Yes, sir. During the second trip, the day before the murder, you drove by Professor Markell's house. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And you testified that at some point after you arrived at Markell's house, after noon on the 17th, you saw a woman and two kids walking on Trescott by the house, yes, right? Yes, sir. And the woman looked at you as the Prius passed and immediately got on her phone. Yes, sir. You testified that you asked Sigfredo what was up with the lady. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And Sigfredo responded that that's her. That's the guy's wife. That's the one that wants the kids back. Yes, sir. You asked Sigfredo what the lady was doing there on Trescott with the kids. Yes, sir. And Sigfredo responded that she came there to make sure that everything was all right. Absolutely. Meaning all right with the plan. Yes, sir. As you sit here now, you're aware that the woman and the kids on the street was not the same lady, right? I don't know if that was her or not, but I, she looked at my car. It's possible that Sigfredo lied to you, right? Who knows? Another lie that Sigfredo and, uh, that was, oh, uh, sorry. Strike that, Your Honor. Your understanding is that the money for the murder would be paid by the lady, right? Yes, sir. Again, your understanding came from Sigfredo. Yes, sir. You didn't go with Katie to get the money, right? No. So you don't know where she got it from? No. Nope. And you don't know what happened when she got it? No. Nope. Sigfredo never told you that he and Katie got more than $100,000 the night of the murder, did he? No. That would make sense why you got an extra 2000 right? Maybe. And Katie never told you that they got more than $100,000 the night of the murder, right? No. Sigfredo never told you that he and Katie were getting paid every month after the murder, right? Never knew nothing about that. You didn't know that they were getting paid $3,000 a month. No. You didn't know that they were getting paid $1,000 in Adelson Institute checks, did you? Mm -mm. Nope. But you saw that Sigfredo was spending a lot of money, right? Yes. You saw that Sigfredo even told you that he had paid for Katie's breast augmentation surgery, right? Her yeah. breast surgery? <clears throat> yeah, I know what you're saying. Have you told me about that? Yeah. Yeah. He told you he paid for it, right? That's what he said. You didn't know that Katie was getting money from Charlie Adelson every month in an extortion plot, did you? No. In May of 2015, you get arrested on a federal RICO case, right? Yes, sir. And you were detained. Yes, sir. And you wanted to get out of prison, right? You wanted to get a bail. Yeah. You started thinking about the fact that Katie and Sigfredo seemed to be spending a lot of money, right? No. So let's briefly recap all the lies that they told you. Not that you made, but that they told you. They lied to you about the purpose of the trip going to Tallahassee, right? Yeah. They lied to you about who the lady was on the street. Yeah. They lied to you about the amount of money they received. Yeah. They lied to you about getting money every month. Mm -hmm. Isn't it possible that they lied to you about the purpose of the job to begin with? 
They don't even got the money. Where they gonna get the money from? Isn't it possible that you thought it was a murder for hire, but it was really an extortion? Extortion to who? Charlie Edelson, not from you, but from oh, them. Okay. Isn't it possible? I don't know. By the way, on Friday, you testified that you just wanted to rob the lady, right? Yes, sir. But Sigfredo was adamant. We can't rob the lady. We got to do the murder. Yes, sir. Isn't that because he wanted to keep on getting money every month? I don't know. But you would have just robbed him, right? Yeah. Would have been a lot easier, right? Real quick. Would have been a one-time payment, right? That's it. Couldn't have gotten paid over time, though, right? I don't know. Well, if you rob someone, it's hard to keep robbing them over and over and over oh, again. Absolutely, right? of course. All right, so I want to back up a little bit, and I thank you for your honesty there. You've never met Charlie Adelson, correct? Nope. You've never seen him before this case? Nope. You've never spoken to him by phone? Never. And you've never communicated with him in any way? Never. You've never met Donna or Harvey Adelson? Nobody. You never spoken to them by phone? I didn't mean nobody. And the same goes with Wendy Adelson, correct? Nobody. You knew Sigfredo your whole life? Yes, sir. You're like brothers. Yes, sir. You've known Katie since she and Sigfredo started dating when they were teenagers. Yes, sir. You considered them to be married. Yes, sir. Sigfredo was deeply in love with Katie, right? Absolutely. He would do, as you've said, anything for her, right? Anything. He was, as you said, blind over her, right? Yes, sir. Katie treated him badly. Yes. She messed up his head, as you've said, right? Yes, sir. At some point, you learned from Sigfredo that Katie was having a relationship with someone she worked with, right? Yes, sir. Sigfredo told you that Katie was cheating on him with someone called the dentist. Yes, sir. According to what Sigfredo told you, Katie was sleeping with the dentist at the same time she was sleeping with Sigfredo, right? Yes, sir. So Sigfredo knew that Katie was cheating on him. Yes, sir. And he wasn't too happy about it, right? No. Nope. Sigfredo told you that the dentist had money. Let me rephrase. Sigfredo told you that Katie told him the person she was with was rich. No. Well, he told you that Katie would flaunt and show off to Sigfredo that the person she was dating with had money, right? I don't think so. <laughs> Sigfredo was devastated when he learned about Katie's new relationship. Yeah, anybody will, right? I agree. Sigfredo started drinking too much? Every day. He started doing drugs? Yes, sir. He was acting crazy and unstable? Yes, sir. He couldn't keep a job. In fact, you had to fire him from a job, help get him fired from a job, right? Yes, sir. Because he was drinking even while at work? Yes, sir. And he was fighting a lot? Yes, sir. Katie told Sigfredo that she would only take him back if, if she did this job, if he did this job for her, right? Yeah. Now, before Sigfredo was fired from his job, I want to take you to March 14th of 2014, okay? I'll refresh your memory about it. Let's okay? go. There was a day when you were driving home from work and Sigfredo was driving you and he took a detour to a restaurant on Miami Beach. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. And you and Sigfredo were in Sigfredo's truck, a Dodge Ram. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sigfredo had been drinking. Every day. And you were supposed to be headed home, but Sigfredo drove you to the restaurant. Yes, sir. You parked near the restaurant and you could see people sitting at tables eating outside. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And one of those people eating at the restaurant was Katie. Yes, sir. She was with uh, three other people. I remember that. Do you remember they were all white? I don't remember. Okay. 
Sigfredo pointed Katie out to you and said that one of the people there was the dentist. Do you recall yes, that? And while you were sitting in Sigfredo's truck watching Katie and the dentist, Sigfredo told you he was going to run him over when they got up, right? Yes, sir. And what did you tell him in response? I ain't going to do it. I'm going to get off the truck. But he was serious. Yes, sir. That's what he was like, right? He, he was angry. He was a good man. But anybody get angry if your wife is doing another man. And he was angry. He, he wanted to hurt the dentist, right? Yeah. Are you aware that he actually did try to run him off the road a couple months later in July 1st, 2014? Did he ever tell you about that incident with a jet ski? No. There was a question on whether this is going too fast. I don't know if you're talking about this witness or the whole trial, but there's more details the prosecution could have brought out um, in the last two days, but I think they got enough in there to really show what this scheme was all about. Let me take you a little bit back to the first trip, okay? First trip to Tallahassee. Secreto came to your house and said he had a job in Tallahassee and asked you to go with him, right? Yeah. Yes. He told you that if you took a ride with him, that he would give you around $35,000, right? I don't remember. Okay. He didn't initially tell you what the job was, right? Nope. He rented the car and he picked you up, right? Yes, sir. At some point during the trip, he told you that it was not gonna be for a robbery, but for a murder, right? Yes, sir. He told you that they were going to kill someone because there was a lady who wanted custody of her kids back, right? Yes, sir. You didn't know anything about the person that you were in, you and Secreta were supposed to kill, right? I didn't know none of these people. The only thing you saw was a piece of paper that Secreto had with a photo and address on it, right? Yes, sir. And the photo looked like a, a headshot, right? Like from chest up? Yes, sir something you would get off the internet? I doubt that, but wherever he got it from, he got it. Your understanding was that Katie gave Sigfredo that piece of paper, right? Maybe. You and Sigfredo left for Tallahassee after midnight on June 4th, which was a Wednesday, right? I don't remember. Fair enough. I wouldn't remember either. Come on, man, nine years ago? Well, the next day after you arrived, you got to Professor Markell's house early in the morning and waited for him to come out, right? Yes, sir. And you saw him leaving the house with two kids and you followed him to the daycare, right? Was this the first drive? First, first drive, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you lost him, right? Yes, sir. And Sigfredo wanted to go back to Professor Markell's house, right? Yes, sir. And you refused. You didn't want to go back. I don't remember. You told Sigfredo you didn't want to kill a man over two kids. Oh, absolutely. I'm not going to do it in front of the kids. So you headed back to Miami. Yeah. And that's when you suggested doing a robbery of the lady rather than killing the guy. Right? Absolutely. But Sigfredo said it had to be a murder and he didn't want to rob her, right? Yeah. And that was odd to you. Yes, sir. As you previously have said, you assumed there was, quote, more to it, but you never asked Sigfredo, right? Never asked him. When Katie learned that the murder didn't happen on the first trip, she was upset, right? Probably. Now let's fast forward to July 16 to 18. And I'm not good with dates either, okay? 
a month or so after the first trip, Sigfredo came to you and said that they had to go, you had to go back to Tallahassee, right? Yeah. He told you that he needed you to go back because he needed the money, right? Yes, sir. You told Sigfredo that you didn't want to go. Yes, sir. So he lied to you and told you, we're not going to do a murder. We're just going to do a lookout. We're just going to watch the guy. That's what he told you at first, right? Yeah. The first time you went to Tallahassee, Sigfredo rented the car for you, right? Yes, sir. But the second time, Sigfredo told you that you had to rent the car under your name. Yes, sir. Did Sigfredo tell you why he wanted you to rent the car under your name? I never asked him questions. Now, he actually gave you the cash to rent the car, right? Yep. Did he tell you what color car to rent? No. Did he tell you what type of car to rent? I don't remember. The cash he gave you was in a crumpled bunch, right? Shit, I don't remember though. But let me ask you this way. The cash he gave you to rent the car, it wasn't stapled. Nah, I don't think so. Now, you rent the car and you head up to Tallahassee, right? Yeah. And you arrive at around 1 a.m. on Thursday, July 17th, right? I don't remember the time, but... Early morning. I don't remember. Okay. We got there. Gotcha. You testified earlier that you didn't want to kill Markel during the first trip because he had his kids, right? Yes, sir. And you told Sigfredo that during the first trip. Yeah. You didn't want to do it in front of the kids. I believe so. And we t already talked a couple of times about seeing the woman on the, on the street during the second trip, correct? Yes, sir. July 18th, the day of the murder, you saw Professor Markell with his kids. Yes, sir. Again, you followed them to the daycare to make sure they were dropped off. Yes, sir. And then you went to the gym. Yes. And then you followed him back to his house where he was murdered, right? Yes, sir. And Sigfredo was the shooter. Yes, sir. He wanted you to be the shooter, but you didn't want to do it. Yes, sir. You testified that when you and Sigfredo were on your way back to Miami, Sigfredo called Katie. Yes, sir. And are you aware that the state has call records which put that call at 12.30 p.m.? I don't know the time. Okay. Will you take my word that the call records for purposes of these questions show that that call happened at 12.30? If you say so. The call wasn't at speaker on speakerphone, right? No. And you were driving on the highway at the time, right? Yes, sir. With the window cracked open a bit. I don't remember. Fair enough. But it's your testimony that you were able to hear the, some of the conversation, correct? Yes, sir. And you think you heard Sigfredo tell Katie, it's done, right? I heard. You heard Sigfredo tell Katie it's done. Yes. He's sitting and next you, to me. And what's that? He's sitting right next to me. Understand. And you think you heard Katie respond, I know. I think. I heard her. Okay. When you were interviewed by law enforcement, you were interviewed by law enforcement in September of 2016, right? Yes, sir. That was two years after the murder. Yes, sir. We're now eight years after the murder, right? Yes your memory might have been a little bit better then. Is that fair to say? Yes. And during that interview, you told law enforcement that you didn't hear the I know comment. Do you recall that? No.
nonetheless, in order for Katie to know, she would have had to be told by someone before 12.30 p.m., correct? Yeah. After Sigfredo hung up with Katie, he told you that you would get your money tomorrow, right? Yes, sir. And you were upset about that? Yes. You were upset because you didn't understand why the money wasn't already secured? Absolutely. Because when you do a murder for hire, you get paid up front. Yes, sir. You don't get paid over time. Mm -hmm. Yep. You don't get paid after the fact. Yep. The whole point of a murder for hire is you get paid, you do a killing, and then you separate. Yes. That's the reason for that type of crime, right? I guess. And in fact, you told Sigfredo that since the job was finished, you were supposed to be paid right there and then. Yes, Isn't sir. that what you told him? Yes, sir. Now let's talk a little bit about the payment. You got paid the next day, right? Yep. And Katie dropped off the money, right? Yes, sir. And it was stapled. Yes, sir. And that's the first time you'd ever seen stapled money, right? Yes. You had never, on any of these other trips, you had never seen stapled money. What other trips? Well, the first trip to Tallahassee, the second trip to Tallahassee yeah. ever in your life. Yeah, that's the first time I've ever seen stapled money. And when you got paid, Sigfredo gave you an extra $2,000, right? Yes, sir. Throughout the years after, Katie and Sigfredo got back together, right? Yeah, I was in prison already. But you saw that they had moved to a new apartment? Yeah. That they had bought a new large TV? <coughs> TV. They bought a nice TV, right, after the murder? No, I was in prison. What about before you went to prison? Did you see they bought a new large TV? I mean, they had, they had nice stuff. They started to got, get some nice stuff, right? Yeah. Started to spend some money, right? Yeah. One last area of questions, I believe, and it'll be quick. In 2014 and 2015, during the time of these events, you were a member of the Latin Kings, right? Yeah. And that's a, a crime family, right? It's a family, yeah. Commits crimes, right? I mean, every gang does. It's a gang. I guess that's, that's what you want to call it. I call it a family. In fact, you were the head of the North Miami branch of the Latin Kings, right? Yep. May I have one moment, Your Honor? Mr. Rivera, the defense characterized a lot of things that Garcia told you as lies. Do you know that those things were lies? No. So when he said, oh, that's the lady, she's looking at us, do you know if he really thought it was the lady or not? No, it was the lady. He thought it was the lady, right? It was the lady. Okay. It was her. All right. And how, how long after the murder did Garcia seem to have a lot of money? Like, for years after the murder, for weeks after the murder? I think weeks, months. Okay, so weeks or months, he was spending money like crazy, right? Yeah. But after that, he was broke again. Yeah. When you were in the car with Garcia, 
at the restaurant where he was talking about running the dentist over. Yes, ma'am. Was he, what was his, what was he acting like? I mean, he's, just, he's himself. You would never, you can never tell, but mm -hmm. he drinks a lot. He does a lot of coke, but he was frustrated. Okay, so he was jealous. Absolutely. Angry. Yeah. Pissed off. Mm -hmm. Drunk. Every day. Okay. And heartbroken, right? <laughs> yes. All right. What about on the trips to Tallahassee? Was he was he like that on those trips? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So during the trips to Tallahassee, was he talking about the dentist? No, we we barely spoke. All right. So when y'all were sitting out in front of the restaurant, he was talking about the dentist, right? At that time. Yeah. And specifically mentioning how Katie was dating the dentist and that was upsetting him. That's all he said. He, he didn't mention him too much. He's like, that's the dude she's cheating, me, she's cheating on me with. All right. And what about on the trips to Tallahassee? Was he going on about that on the trips to Tallahassee? No. Did he mention on the trips to Tallahassee, like, this has something to do with the dentist or we got to kill this guy because I'm trying to harm the dentist? No. To harm him, he never said nothing about him. Right. One moment, please, Your Honor. Did this murder have anything to do with the Latin Kings? No, absolutely were you, not. Were you asked? to threaten anybody related to this murder? I mean, were you ever asked to threaten the dentist because no. you're a Latin king and he might be afraid of you? No, no, I don't even know these people, man. The Latin kings ain't got nothing to do with this. No further I promise questions. you that. All right, so that testimony there, I think the cross-examination, they tried to set up the fact that it was really Katie and Sigfredo setting up this so-called extortion, but I thought Luis was pretty credible. He, he wasn't any part of any extortion, obviously, and I think there will be other evidence that shows this whole extortion thing is pretty ridiculous. Yeah, Charlie probably doesn't realize that, but when you stop to think about it, these people are on cocaine, they're on, they're drunk every day, they're career criminals, and this is who you hire to do a hit. I mean, you're just asking for problems to happen, which they, of course, did. So it was just really the hubris of the Adelson thinking they could get away with this and that, um, that these guys would be able to escape any form of justice, and they always had the money to be able to get them out of it. And they were willing to possibly front the legal fees as well. So I think that's what's really going to be interesting when I expect Katie to testify is how she got paid and what she was told. And if you stop to think about the conversation she had um, in the Dolce Vita restaurant with Charlie, Charlie treated her as like a best friend. He never treated her as some extortionist person that turned on him and betrayed him. They were best of buds. They were going to take off together and leave the country over this. So... To go from wanting to kill over a hundred thousand plus extortion that's ongoing, but and, and and you don't do that, but then you want to kill over somebody wanting to hit you up for five thousand dollars. I mean that's just so it just shows what really happened, which is that this was ordered by um, Charlie to Katie, and there was other involvement of the other Adelsons that have been just shown and will continue to show. Yeah, that's true. Katie thought he was, uh, Charlie thought he was street smart, but he really knows nothing about how to deal with these people. It's really surprising they didn't go ahead and uh, rob from Charlie and Wendy. They had Wendy's address, I mean, or, excuse me, Dan's address, and they probably could figure out and look up where Wendy lived too. So it's, it's really a reckless, dangerous scheme where you yourself could get hit and then you're dealing with somebody in the Latin King who's to say the gang won't come after you at some point. So really just recklessly crazy. Yeah. Charlie's demeanor here. He's looking a little bit smug. He's trying to look like he's not really listening to what's going on. Yeah. I mean, uh, 
<clears throat> Wesley, John, yeah, that was, um, I mean, Rashbaum doesn't really have anything to work with. Like I said before, it's like, how, how do you really try to poke holes in the government's case? You really got nothing to work with. So um, anything I've said about, you know, the defense being laughable, I'm not making that as a personal comment on Rashbaum himself, because you, you have no really credible evidence of any of this kind of stuff. So um, and the money trail is what you follow. So he's just trying to reverse the money trail and who was threatening and paying for what. So um, it's, it's really, um, it's really falling apart. His ego was writing checks, his uh, intelligence couldn't cash. Well, yeah, it's sort of like, I think that was part of their brazen effort. Why would you have the uh, checks coming from the Adelson Institute? Some of them sequentially numbered. So it looked like it was a checking account that they had uh, post dated some checks and they were trying to draw on, on it and not, not make it so high amount. And if you stop to think about the uh, Dolce Vita, remember Charlie mentioned, you know, it's not like you're driving around in a Bentley. So what he was trying to do is make assurances to to Katie that, you know, we haven't given you too much money where it looks obvious that you're getting kickbacks for being part of the murder plan. So that's what he was trying to reinforce. So that that's that point alone right there, I hope the prosecutor brings out, that alone will defeat this stupid extortion um, against Charlie's scam. Yeah, I was wondering that too. I mean, look at those circles under his eyes. Um, I forgot to ask John if, uh, is that the lighting or is it because he's got deep set eyes or what, what's going on with why he looks like he got two black eyes <laughs> from being uh, beat up in the slammer? I don't, I don't know. Um, Wendy on the stand, I mean, she was, she was a disaster. I mean, she may try to maintain her composure as much as she could, but she would just double down and she, she just came across absolutely terrible. And, um, I think some of those gotcha moments that Georgia got her on, like the 12 emails sending out this, this know nothing, um, motion for contempt and restrictions of Donna's access to the kids unsupervised. I mean, that would have just lit them up and, uh, she sent it out to 12 other friends of hers. So of course she let Donna know. And that's what really that as well as the fact that she, she was being going to be in trouble with the state bar. Um, and they were going after her. And Dan even said in the motion, I, I was surprised the prosecution didn't, didn't bring that out, but the jury actually will see the court documents from the divorce pleadings that, remember, there was uh, references to Dan Markell saying that Wendy was not fit to practice law at the FSU Law School because of the way she's acted on this case, because he questioned her uh, doings uh, on, on the affidavit, her lack of full disclosure, including the fact, remember, she, had, she said she had zero assets of uh, jewelry on her f affidavit what what person has zero a um zero jewelry if you're a woman and you're a lawyer of course you have jewelry so she put nothing down there but what she really um was aggravating was that she never put down the um the um that piece of heirloom from the markel family from a, a holocaust survivor so why would anybody take that that's really shocking so um the um <clears throat> I thought that they also, I agreed with that lawyer that testified Friday for Dan that, you know, the reason he took us because he's got really a good case against, um, against Wendy for not being truthful on her affidavit. So that's why I think that um, um, this now shows the motive of why Wendy really was in a desperation mode. And so Donna as well, because uh, they were, she was gonna be deposed. Plus also this judge was ready to come down hard She'd already denied um, with prejudice the ability to relocate the boys. So the only way to get the boys to Miami was to take out Dan. That was abundantly clear. Yeah, is Katie testifying, uh, Diana? Yeah, I, I, I think they're gonna go ahead and call her because I think, um, you know, when, no matter how many times you've lied, if you come clean, you don't have to, like I've always said when I argue cases, because I always make find all these lies from my opponent that they don't have control over their witnesses. And and I always come back and say, you know, like Abe Lincoln said, no, no liar has a good of memory to fill in all the details. So that's why Katie did so bad. That's why Wendy has done so bad. You, a, a liar cannot keep all those things going on in their head and, and speak fluently and freely about what really happened. 
and uh, trying to keep a tight package and, and your mind in control of that. It, it's just too exhausting. And if you notice, my perception of Wendy was the longer she testified, the harder it was for her to maintain her composure. And she was actually breaking down and getting tired of ha having to come up with uh, all these these uh, twists and turns that she tried to deflect on. So, uh, Ben, what's going on in the courtroom? Are they taking a break or something? It's a little bit early for a break. Uh, either that or they're talking. I'm not sure. Let's okay. see. Okay. So it's just, um, okay, we got that um, ceiling shot. Yeah, so that's that's one question, Brooklyn Rules. I don't know if that was ever given back, that Holocaust jewelry or not. I mean, you would think that would be like, I don't care how much you have conflicts with, with a um, soon-to-be ex or after it's divorce is final, if you forgot about the fact that you had it, why would you want to keep that? I mean, that's, um, that's a, like a... Talk about a personal treasure to your family's legacy to uh, not turn that over. So, yeah, I don't know if it ever was turned over, but as far as when, while Dan was still alive, it was not turned over. Yeah, so Eminem, um, she basically was, you know, in their, it was in their marital home. So I think she took it when, when Dan was up there and she moved out of the house on that weekend uh, that, she, that she did the Pearl Harbor, as Dan described it, divorce where he was up in New York and she calls him up and says, hey, I filed for divorce, um, goodbye. And then he took a quick first flight he could back home and saw the divorce papers on the bed. And the house was pretty much empty to most everything. And uh, also whatever jewelry they have. So for her to not put any jewelry on her uh, financial affidavit for as part of the divorce proceedings, um, was just sort of, sort of bizarre to think you could get away with that. And I don't know why Dan didn't uh, bring that up sooner. Maybe he thought he had it in possession or something, but. Um, we don't know the details on that, but it's obviously something that he recognized and he wanted to bring up. And uh, there was, he, he alleged that there was a half a million dollars in assets, other assets. I don't know if it's cash or stocks or whatever, but that's what we have seen um, testimony on that uh, there was like a half a million dollars that she had not disclosed. So obviously if that, if that was true, that she did have half a million dollars that wasn't disclosed, that um, it would be something you could get in trouble for. It probably would have guaranteed her losing her job. Because think about it. Dan had all that cloud at the law school. They, they actually moved into a, like a special uh, honored position there at the law school because he was like going around uh, nationally to speak about his theories on criminal justice. And uh, he was a tenured professor. Wendy was more like a contract at term at will attorney for the law school. And so she was not being published. Granted, she had this book about, um, about the, um, uh, what was it, uh, human trafficking. But I, I've looked through some of the book. It, it's really not sophisticated writing at all. And um, a lot of it's just hateful stuff. I, I was surprised that Georgia didn't bring out more details uh, tying her to the hatred and mockery of Tallahassee as well. Um, remember, she said things like it's off civilization going to Tallahassee. And um, she also had uh, any number of other digs on that. I think we're going to bring out some of those indicators. Also keep in mind, Wendy testified that this was based on a friend of hers, not her. But if you look at the, in the afterword of her book, the book actually says that this is largely based on her life. And this fictional husband of Lily, the uh, attorney on this story, um, was supposed to be Dan Markell. And think about it, Dan Markell was from Montreal, Canada, right? Guess where Josh Stone is from in her book? Montreal, Canada. So you could go on and on with a number of details like that. So it really mirrored her um, her hatred towards Dan and the way she wrote the book. And she never gave credit to uh, Dan in the book. She said this is uh, that she lives in Tallahassee, Florida with her boys. Well, you're going to call your husband a boy? So it just, it just goes to show that Dan was already in the process of being eliminated. And he even promoted the book. She said he never read it, but he was even promoting the book on his prof's blog website. So here's a book you're promoting and you're not even referenced in this basically bashing, you know, the husband that's uh, the key one in the storyline. So it's just, I, I, th I just wish they would have brought out more of the book, but I, I think they got enough out of it. It just would have been uh, sort of a sort of a nice thing if they had a little bit extra detail like that. Do we have any questions here? If you guys have any questions, um, will jurors believe that a single broke mother and her druggy baby daddy has their own funds to mastermind this? Well, 
I mean, they're just not sophisticated enough people, I think. You're going to go after somebody with money. You're not going to concoct this reverse extortion scheme where let's kill first and then and then go for uh, ex, uh, extortion of money or blackmail because what happened was um, the this this extortion happened so fast. You tell me Charlie's going to sit there when Katie comes to him and says, hey, cough up a $100,000 or we're, we're going to port you to the police. So it's like, what? You're going to do what? Screw you. Screw you is what he probably would have said. We're calling the, I'm calling the police right now. He could have just said, okay, let me come up with the money. And then he could have gotten the police involved and they could have done the undercover wire and they would have busted all the, uh, uh, the hitmen and Katie or not them hitmen. It would have been just Sigfredo according to defense theory. So it, it really is just uh, ludicrous to think that this is even a, a plausible story. It's a, real life doesn't work that way. Real life is absolutely crazy and stuff. But um, to think that these two guys uh, pulled an over on Charlie and think about it, Charlie even had some corrupt cops on the law enforcement. He was able to get a, a like a joint venture businessman with him that they owned the same property together. He, he was able to get a couple cop buddies to go in there and threaten the guy and and um, and basically made him leave a business he owned jointly with Charlie. So so he was able to pull some real shady stuff like that. So for him to sit there and um, you know say, oh hey, we're going to point the finger at you. They're going to say you did it when there's no linkage there at all. Is uh, just just outrageous. Uh, there's a question here. Yeah. So could the hitmen have been Wendy and and the boys on Trescott the day before the murder? I think that's actually not Wendy uh, that was walking there. I mean, think about it. this is like a family neighborhood. It could be any number of folks. So the fact that Sigfredo mentioned that, um, I mean, I don't think they would have given a photo of Wendy. Why would they give a photo of Wendy to Sigfredo? She was not, they were not gonna meet up with her. So they wouldn't have given a, a photograph of her. And um, I know from a drive yesterday that I saw it briefly here um, that, uh, you know, there's, there was a mother and daughter walking on um, Trescott. So uh, why, why that couldn't have been somebody else, maybe he just presumed that was the case. So that, that's not a big deal. So, um, and uh, yeah, uh, Wendy was jealous of Dan. I mean, um, from, I believe it was Ruth's book, the uh, unveiling, she had mentioned that, that uh, Dan could not even mention Harvard around her. He had some friends, a lot of, you've heard some of his friends testify um, on different uh, shows, um, podcasts about him being a friend of these different Harvard folks. And keep in mind, Tamara Demko was from Harvard there. But if they had any social gathering and stuff like that, uh, Dan had to warn his friends, do not mention Harvard in the presence of Wendy. W why is that? that? This is really bizarre. Um, and, and I've heard that there was, you know, some real um, success that uh, that Amy Adler brought to the table. She was, she was a tenured professor as well, very, very well accomplished as a professor in her own right. So, um, you know why? Why an attorney would be jealous and other thing like that? I don't. I don't understand. But um, apparently that could have helped drive it as well. And keep in mind, Amy Adler's listed on the witness list as well. Don't know if she's going to be called. Um, don't don't know if Rob Adelson's going to be called. But I think if they want to go uh, to show complete history of uh, how you're treated as an outsider in this family and how much Donna had say in who you married and didn't marry and who you dated. Keep in mind, Donna was the one that uh, picked out Dan on the um, on that Jewish uh, dating website. Uh, Katie could be up next. I don't know if she's necessarily going to be the next one up. And keep in mind, they got to bring some of the other uh, witnesses talking about um, what the folks were doing. They may um, try to bring in evidence to show how uh, Katie was being um, given hush money um, while this thing is ongoing and unraveling. Um, and like, like I say, um, Charlie mentioned the Bentley. Well, they didn't give her Bentley. They gave her far from that. But they gave her did give her the, the Lexus from Harvey. I think it was a 1994 Lexus uh, LS460, which is the biggest mothership type of um, Lexus. A lot of folks say it's like the best, uh, most reliable car ever made. And uh, they still make it to this day. So she was driving around with that. And and so um, I, I do think they had a, you know, somebody that could have extorted them for life. And, and keep in mind, if they didn't help pay for the her attorneys and um, she went down or she flipped, that this would have unfolded uh, and unraveled against the Adelsons a lot sooner. 
So how how she was able to maintain her silence and keep away from her kids and spend all these years awaiting her first trial and then awaiting a second trial, knowing that the first jury um, came back and only one of them thought um, voted for not guilty, but she did think she was guilty, but didn't want to convict her because that would leave both her and Sigfredo's two children without any parents the rest of their lives. So it was a, it was a sympathy vote, not a correct legal vote. And so rolling the dice and going a second time, um, a full trial for, for anyone to think that she's going to get acquitted the second time is, um, pretty bizarre. Yeah. Roxanne, uh, yeah. Family dynamics. That's what I've said that, uh, as well. It's, it's really the, um, the history and keep in mind, he also talked to him afterwards. Um, once his murder happened, he was still in conversation with him up to that point. And I think once that happened and he saw how they reacted, I, I think they're in a hush mode and they, they all had this uh, pre-planned idea of how to keep Rob out of it and not talk to him because Rob would have then started comparing notes, comparing stories. And so I think that would have uh, unraveled to Rob, but I think Rob was able to figure it out. And that's why he, he pretty much has stayed away from them. All right, so now we're back to seeing Charlie. Charlie, uh, like the first day uh, of the uh, evidence presented against him, he had his hand over his mouth a whole lot. Um, on Friday, he was sort of uh, humored by anyone from June to um, his ex-friend Fitzpatrick. And you saw a lot more emotion out of him that you didn't see previously. So, um, so Charlie wasn't... Uh, Charlie wasn't uh, some was to get extorted not to go to the cops. He sues everyone. Yeah, I mean, he's he's all about, you know, aggressive mode, just smash and burn and, and uh, beat up your opponent. So somebody as weak and, and unsophisticated as uh, Katie, um, I don't, don't, don't see that happening at all. And, of course, the jury won't see that at all. So, yeah, I think I think the big issue is the money factor. I mean, maybe they, they kept her totally out of loop on how her attorneys were paid. Um, just so they couldn't use that against her. But I, I don't know if they were that smart to, and that's sophisticated down the road to, um, oh, here's John saying, Katie is up next. So what do you know? So um, this is something that uh, other attorneys were saying could never happen. It's gonna, it's gonna be um, a complete disaster for the government's case. I don't, I don't think so. I think, she, like I say, truth is, truth, um, is liberating and truth is freedom. And I think she's finally gonna realize how much she was due by the uh, Adelsons. And um, if you saw that picture of her, once she got uh, brought into the uh, Leon County Jail a few weeks ago, you, you saw the liberation all over her face. So, um, you know, I, I would do that unless she, I thought she was lying about stuff and still trying to cover, but I think she's gonna sing like a canary against these Adelsons. And I think Charlie right now is probably realizing that she's next. And he's just dreading this moment right now. Yeah, associating, uh, right, stripping the boys of their last, well, look at there. What well, we've been waiting for all this time. You can be seated for now. If the jurors are good to be brought in, please bring them in. She's waited all these years. Keep in mind, she's been in jail since 2016. All these years, she's refused to come clean. And they offered her like a get out of jail free card, but she was choosing the money and the promises of Adelson's over freedom and a chance to be with her kids. It's one thing if she didn't have kids, but man, the kid aspect of it is just so horrific. Yeah, she's lost everything already. I mean, she's never gonna see her kids again. So why would you keep holding out the lie? I think you might see her crying even. I, I, I'd be very worried if she was started crying, if I was a defense counselor, she starts crying about how she got suckered by the Adelsons. We've heard her on the wiretap. She sounds like a pretty, pretty um, nasty sounding lady at times, but I think she's had a chance to uh, reconcile her past with what, what it's done to her future, and she's realizing it's, it's game over. Just quit lying and, and get to the truth. The testimony you're about to give will be the truth. 
Right. You may take your seat. Look, they still got her in uh, hand irons and right. leg irons, I'm sure, as well. Yep, she's got nothing to lose at this point, so. Ma'am, please say your name and spell your name. Catherine McBonwaller, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E-M-A-G-B-A-N-U-A. I see that you're in jail clothes. Are you currently in custody? Yes, ma'am. What are you in custody for? For murder. Are you doing a sentence for murder? Yes, ma'am. You were convicted of murder? Yes, ma'am. And is that the murder of Dan Markell? Yes, ma'am. Did you have a trial in your case? Yes, ma'am. Did you testify? Yes, ma'am. You testified in your own on your own behalf? Yes, ma'am. All right, and when you testified, were you truthful with the jury? No, ma'am, I was not. Did you take the same oath that you just took today in your own trial? Yes, ma'am. What was your defense you when you were tried? That I had nothing to do with it. All right, Did that we got it right in reference to Charlie Adelson, and we got it right in reference to the killers, yes, but you weren't in the middle. Yes, ma'am. Was that true? No, ma'am, it was not. Were you in the middle? Yes, ma'am, I was. And didn't you also testify in the trial in which Sigfredo Garcia was convicted of murder? Yes, ma'am, I was. And what was his defense? That he had nothing to do with it. That we got it right in reference to Charlie Adelson, and we got it right in reference to the killers, but he had nothing to do with it. Yes, ma'am. And was that defense truthful? No, ma'am, it was not. So, Sigfredo Garcia was involved? Yes, ma'am, he was. So, why tell the truth now? I believe that the truth needed to come out now so that the family can get some type of closure. Why didn't the truth need to come out last year or the year before or the I, year before that? I was trying to defend myself. You were trying to get off? Yes, ma'am. Did you think you'd be successful in your trial with that defense? I thought so. Has anyone promised you in anything promised you anything for your testimony here today? No, ma'am. Weren't you originally offered immunity for cooperation in this case? Yes, ma'am, I was. But you didn't take us up on that? No, ma'am, I didn't. Because you thought you could get off completely? Yes, right? ma'am. And now you're doing a life sentence? Yes, ma'am, I am. Did Charlie Adelson threaten to harm you if you told the truth? No, ma'am, he didn't threaten me. Did anybody threaten you to keep your silence? No, ma'am. Did anybody promise you anything if you remained silent all these years? I wasn't promised anything, but I mean, the I wasn't promised anything. Go ahead, finish your thought. You didn't, you weren't promised anything, but what? I thought everything was going to be okay. You thought, you thought you'd be acquitted. Yes, ma'am. All right, so did you know Dan Markell? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you have any personal beef with him? No, ma'am, I did not. What was your motivation for becoming a part of this murder plot? Financially. So not as a favor to Charlie Adelson? I'll rephrase it, Your Honor. Was it a favor to Charlie Adelson? Yes, ma'am, it was. Okay, but your primary motivation was not favor to Charlie Adelson? Well, yes, ma'am, it was, and financially. All right, because you were going to get paid for yes. your part? Yes, How much did you get paid? Um, I don't know the exact amount. What was your relationship to Charlie Adelson? He was my ex-boyfriend. When did you meet him? I believe that was in 2013. Do you know what month? Um, has to be around September. Can you point him out and describe what he's wearing? 
he's sitting over there with a blue jacket and a blue tie. Let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. Sure, you would have marked as states 48. This exhibit? Yes, ma'am, I do. How do you recognize it? Um, that's when we went to Key West. Is that a fair and accurate photo of you and Charlie Adelson? Yes, ma'am, it is. Is that when the two of you were taken when the two of you were dating? Yes, ma'am. Judge, at this time I ask to move into evidence states 48. There's been some objections on uh, Georgia leading her. I, I sort of wish Georgia would not lead her as much and let's hear more out of her own words. And because uh, we're getting just a lot of so yes, no, ma'am. Was ma this photo taken of... before or after the murder? Before. Who came up with the idea to kill Dan Markell? Charlie. So Sigfredo Garcia didn't come up with the idea? No, ma'am, he did not. Luis Rivera didn't come up with the idea? No, ma'am, he did not. When did the defendant first bring this idea up to you? My first recollection was around Halloween of 2013. Around Halloween or on actual? On, on Halloween, yes, ma'am. All right, what, what, what's your recollection of how that came up? Um, we were at a Halloween party in Lincoln Road, and right before we were about to go, he got in the car with me and he asked me a question. What was the question? Do you know anybody that can harm someone? And did you know anybody that could harm someone? Yes, ma'am, I did. Who was that? Sigfredo. And at the time, what was your relationship with Sigfredo? It wasn't the best. But he was the father of your children, right? Yes, ma'am, he is. So were you dating both men at this time or were you only dating no, Charlie? No, I was only dating Charlie. And so he initially, he meaning the defendant initially said, do you know anyone that could harm someone? Was he aware of your connection to Sigfredo Garcia when he made not, that statement? Not that I know of, no ma'am. Did you suggest Sigfredo Garcia at that time to the defendant? No ma'am. What I, did you say? I just said yes and kind of left it alone. All right, did it go any further than that at that time? Not at that. Not that night. Right. Did myself. you know who he wanted harmed? Did. At that time? No, ma'am. All right. Had you become aware during the course of your relationship with him that he had some kind of issue going on with his sister's ex husband? Yes, ma'am, I did. What did you learn about that? He was just stating that his family wasn't, his mom and dad was stressed and that his sister was having problems with her husband and custody of her two children. And when did you learn that the person that the defendant wanted harmed was this ex-husband of the sister? I believe later on. All right. And did you, when did you learn the name Dan Markell? It wasn't until, I don't know if it was on my trial or when Sigfredo got arrested. Okay, so even when he was killed, you didn't know the name of the person that was being killed? Yes, I never knew his name. How did the defendant refer to this person, if not by the name Dan or Danny Markell? Wendy's husband. So you knew that the person that was going to be initially harmed was Wendy's husband? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and, and you knew that there were issues, or what did you know about the beef with him? Um, that, I mean, he was just, he painted this picture that this was a terrible man and making his family go through a lot custody-wise with his sister. Right, and was, when he would say these things to you, is it in the context of his mom specifically or his family in general? I believe it was more towards his mom. Meaning what? That his mom hasn't been sleeping, his mom is not eating. I know his dad wasn't wasn't the best health either, but it was he would refer to his mom a lot. 
All right. And the reason she wasn't sleeping or eating, did that have to do with this ex-husband of Wendy? Yes, ma'am. Did you ever tell the defendant who it was that was going to be doing the job? No, ma'am, I didn't. Why didn't you say the name Sigfredo to Charlie Adelson? I always referred to each other as my friend. Either neither one of them wanted to really hear each other's names. And is why is that? Uh, because Sigfredo was the my the father of my kids and I was dating him at that time. I was dating Charlie at that time. Okay. So Sigfredo Garcia did he have strong feelings about the defendant? Yes, he didn't like him. All right, and is that because you were dating him? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and vice versa, you're not going to talk about the child's father with the new boyfriend either? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So is it true then that you were sort of walling these two off from each other before the issue of the murder and the conspiracy ever even arose? Yes, ma'am. And did that pattern continue throughout murder conspiracy. Yes, ma'am, it did. Do you think Charlie Adelson knew that it was your child's father that you were going to? He might have had an idea, but he just never said it out loud. Okay. There's one phone call between, I think it's from Sigfredo Garcia to Harvey Adelson, the father of the defendant. Do you know anything about that phone call? That was on July 1st of 2014. Yes, ma'am. What do you know about that phone call? Um, from the trial, what I remember was that Sigfredo had contacted or was trying to contact um, Charlie, but we were in a heated argument at that time. We were kind of in the middle of the street, and I guess it's the first thing he looked up was his um, work number. All right, so you say you're in a heated argument. Is this the confrontation that occurred where all y'all were, you and the defendant were going jet skiing? I believe that was after. It was after that incident? Yes, ma'am. Okay, how many interactions personally, face-to-face, -face, did, to your knowledge, Charlie Adelson have with Sigfredo Garcia? That was probably the only one that I, I remember was that jet ski accident accident or, or like the confrontation all right tell us what happened at that confrontation um sigfredo had just picked up the kids and he was eating at a corner pizza place with the kids and he saw that charlie was coming by to go pick me up and i guess saw the jet skis in the back of the car so he loaded up the kids and cut us off was screaming a couple things out loud but we didn't really hear anything because our windows was up. All right. Did you say he cut you off? Do you mean in traffic? Um, in the back, in the back street of where I lived at that at that time. All right. And when you say he cut you off, did he run you off the road or something else? He kind of just went right and blocked the road in front of us. So Charlie had to kind of do a three point turn and go around the other way. Did the two men actually get out into the street and confront each other? No, ma'am, they did not. Okay, were any actual words exchanged through the windows? Through the windows, yes, but I had my window up, so we didn't know what Sigfredo was saying. All right, so Sigfredo shouted some things out the window. Did Mr. Adelson do the same? No, he did not. And what were the things that were shouted out the window? Were you able to hear them or not? I didn't hear anything. All right. And at this point, this is July 1st of 2014, the, the plot is already underway to do this murder, right? Yes, ma'am. Does Sigfredo Garcia know that he's doing the murder for Charlie Adelson? To my knowledge, he might have had an inkling about it, but I don't know. That was never spoken of. Okay. The killers, and when I say the killers, I'm referring to Garcia and Rivera, knew they were doing something for a lady to get her kids back. Do you yeah. know how they knew that information? I believe it's because of the envelope that Charlie gave me 
to pass okay. over. So you didn't relay that information to them that it had to do with a lady and her kids? I might have mentioned it to Sigfredo, yes. Okay. So if you mentioned that to, to Sigfredo, would you be, I guess, were you intentionally trying to characterize this job as being related to someone other than Charlie Adelson? I believe so, yes. Because is that because Sigfredo Garcia would not have wanted to do anything to help out Charlie Adelson? Yes, ma'am. All right. So do you think Sigfredo knew that this lady with the kids was somehow connected to Charlie Adelson? I believe so. All right. And there was going to be a lot of money paid for this job, right? Yes, ma'am. Did you know anybody else with that kind of money or that might have had that kind of money to, to get this job? Them? No, ma'am, I did not. All right, you mentioned the paper. Luis Rivera said there was a paper that Sigfredo had when they came to do the murder. Do you know anything about that paper? No, ma'am, I don't. All right. Did you provide a paper to Sigfredo Garcia? Yes, I did. All right, and when you say you don't know anything about it, but you gave it to him, you obviously know something about it, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so tell us what, I know what you're trying to say is you don't know what was on the paper. The content of it, yes. Tell us how you got the well, paper. One moment, Ms. Rockford. Yeah, she is leading. Tell us how you came into possession of this paper that the killers had. Okay. One day, um, just a random night that I was over at Charlie's house, he had a manila envelope that was sealed. He told me, Katie, do not open it. Do not touch it. Do not look inside it. I didn't print this paper out from my office, printed it probably from another office, and basically relate, you know, give that paper to the other person. All right, and who is saying this? This was Charlie. All right, this defendant? Yes, ma'am. So he says to you, I have this paper. How does he give it to you? I had a diaper bag, so he showed me the envelope, and I was like, just put it in there. Did he express any concerns about fingerprints being on the envelope or the contents? Yes, ma'am. He said he wore a glove so that there's no fingerprints on it. He was... He told he was very specific about me not opening it and not looking inside it. And he also told me that he didn't <clears throat> print it from his office. All right, and what about licking the envelope? And that he didn't lick the envelope. He said he did not lick the envelope? He did not lick the envelope. And what was the envelope. purpose of that? I guess his DNA. Okay. So did you touch the envelope? Uh, it was in my diaper bag, but I don't remember if I ever, I never opened it, but <clears throat> I might have touched it just to put, stick it inside in my diaper bag. And did you deliver the envelope to Sigfredo Garcia? Um, I call, I contact, I must have contacted Sigfredo and just told him, hey, um, come by the house. And then, you know, he was kind of in and out of my life. So he popped up, he literally got the envelope. I was like, I, you have something inside that bag. And then he grabbed it, stuffed it in his pants and left. In regards to the June trip that the killers made, did you provide Garcia or Rivera with any money for expenses yes, associated with that trip? Yes, ma'am, I did. And where did you get the money from to do that? From Charlie Adelson. Can you tell us about that? What was, what Sig was the context of you getting that money? Sigfredo would just ask me, hey, um, I'm gonna need some money. I need to go out of town. And I'm like, okay. So then I'd go to Charlie or I'd be at Charlie's house and I, I'll tell him I, I need some money for the expenses. And he gave you some money? Yes, ma'am. About how much money, if you know? I can't recall, but it was a couple hundred dollars. So this thing started back in October of 13 and doesn't get done until July of, of 14. Is there... Can you describe whether there's any pressure as time is going on and this thing is not getting done? Um, 
trying to remember like in the beginning of the year i don't think there was really much i mean he was he's been planting this seed in my head that this needed to get done this needed to get done and i guess towards probably around june july is when he was a little bit more adamant about this job getting done okay and when you say he you're talking about who charlie did you ever have any contact with any other Adelson about this job? No, ma'am. In the context of you know, this needs to get done, this pressure getting put on you, is, is there ever a mention of the mom, Donna, or the divorce situation in the context of getting it done? Um, at that time, not that I could recall. Will you publish 35, please? Is this you on the left side of the screen? Yes, ma'am, it is. Right. And was this picture, where was this picture taken? This was in South Beach. Um, I believe the building that they were living at, at the, where Charlie's parents were living at. Is that the icon? I don't, I don't think that was the icon. I, it was somewhere in First and Ocean. Okay, so a different residence. Yes, ma'am. All right, and this photo, was this the first time you'd ever met Wendy or had you already known Wendy before this photo? I met her one time prior to this because I believe this was in Father's Day. So I met her around spring break when I had dinner with her and uh, Jeffrey. Okay, so at the Yardbird restaurant? Yes, ma'am. All right, so this was the second time you'd met her. Yes, ma'am. Did you have a relationship with her outside of her being Charlie's sister? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you communicate with her by phone or through any app apps or anything like that? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you receive any communication from her specifically about the homicide? No, ma'am, I did not. Did Wendy ever give you any money or other gifts? No, ma'am, she did not. Did anybody pay you for your part in the murder other than Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am, they did not. All right, and the payments from Charlie Adelson, did those include the checks that were signed by his mother from yes, the Adelson Institute? Yes, ma'am, it was. Did you perform any job at the Adelson Institute? No, ma'am, I did not. You didn't go up there and clean on the weekends? No, ma'am, I did not. On the night of the murder, did you go to the defendant's house? Yes, ma'am, I did. And where was that house, or what house was that? That was in <laughs> Whale Harbor in Fort Lauderdale. All right, and did you get payment for the murder that night? I believe it was the following morning. Were you in a panic when you arrived at his house? Was I in a panic? In a panic. I, I wasn't in a panic, but Charlie was. Okay, explain that. How was he acting? Um, when I opened the door, he had, he was kind of frantic and he had a gun in his hand and he was just all over the place. Was that normal behavior for him? N not having a gun in his hand, no ma'am. All right, did you know him to have a gun prior to that? Yes ma'am, he has a gun safe. All right, but he just didn't usually carry around in his hand? Yeah, he's never had it in his hand. Turn the phone off, please. What was he saying to you when he was in this frantic state? I can't really recall because he he had given me some Xanax, so I it was a little blurry that night, and um, I I just tend to I just fell asleep. I think we both fell asleep. So, all right. Can you tell the jury whether the excitement that he was showing had to do with the murder or something else? Yes, ma'am. It, it had to do with that. Okay. Um, was anybody else there at his residence when you arrived? At that day, no, ma'am. Okay. Did you ever see his parents at the residence? 
No, I didn't see his parents. How was the money packaged when you got it? I think you said you got it the next morning. Yes, ma'am. Okay, it how was, was it packaged? It was in um, it was in a plastic, the money was in a plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag that was inside a brown bag and then like a grocery bag over it. And was the money stapled? Yes, ma'am, it was. Can you explain how it was stapled? Like what size bills and what? increments were stapled together? Uh, I believe it was stapled in, I never counted it, but it was like in a stack and it was stapled in the corner. All right, were they $100 bills or something else? They were $100 bills and there was some 20s and 50s. Okay, and was the money damp? Yes, ma'am, it was. Explain what, what you mean to the jury. Um, a couple days after that, um, I went and I opened the bag and I called Sigfredo and I told him, I was like, there's mold on this money. And he's like, well, blow dry it. And I was like, but why would there be mold on the money? And he's just, I don't know, just blow dry it. So um, I believe his parents or his mom might have washed the, the money. You mean like physically washed the money? Yes, ma'am. And why do you think his mom did it? because he, oh, he was always adamant about telling me he didn't have any money in his house. And he told me that his parents had just stopped by right before I got there. Okay. So all of a sudden he had money to put in, my, in the trunk of my car the was following the morning. Money, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Was the money already sorted out and packaged when you first saw it or was he doing that? No, it was there? already stacked and sorted out. And did he have to, so he didn't have to go anywhere to get the money. He already had it when you arrived. Yes, ma'am. Was there any argument that night about the money or the next morning? With me and Charlie? Yes. No. Did you, I guess you did stay there that night. You may have already said that. Yes, I fell asleep. Was there any argument with, with the defendant at all about anything that night? No, ma'am. Not that I can recall. Did you threaten him in any way? No, ma'am, I did not. All right, so there was a uh, <clears throat> question about long-term strategy. I think that uh, we've not heard anything about other Adelsons except just now about, uh, it looks like Donna Harvey brought money over that was moldy. <clears throat> But, um, but yet Charlie also had a lot of money in his safe. So that's what June had talked about his other girlfriend that was subsequent to Katie. So um, in any event, uh, he probably just didn't tell her about the money uh, being stored in his safe and whatnot. So <clears throat> there's a lot of leading questions here that George is doing where this is really calls for a yes, no, or short answer. So it just, instead of saying like, was, well, wasn't the money moldy? That's like a leading question. And instead say, well, it was the condition of the money. And that way the witness is sort of developing their own answers. I just, I just like that approach better. Um, I wish she would have like really hammered her in the beginning about how she would show you commit a murder and lie to two jury trials and really, really got in her face about it. Um, and uh, so one of the things that wasn't brought up was um, and followed through on is Katie mentioned how she was doing this just to tell the truth. She never talked about how she's hoping to get her sentence reduced. As I don't think it was brought up that she's serving life without parole, but this is more minor stuff, but it's, I, I tend to focus more on a lot of those minor details. So in any event, um, I, I think she is coming across credible here. I think she's, they're going to keep going into more details of what happened. And uh, I think Charlie's over there looking like he's pretty much uh, like somebody's uh, M&M's here saying um, Charlie's toast. Yeah. He, He's looking like it. I mean, he's sinking in his chair, but I think still he thinks that he thinks that uh, he can get away with it. And uh, the money he spent on this is going to uh, count to um, get an acquittal. So obviously uh, that's delusional thinking from uh, looking at the evidence here, the states has presented. So um, as we noticed, John is saying the jury's listening intently. They're taking down notes and um, <clears throat> the details are like I said, are what's going to, unravel this uh, concocted defense story about that she was the one extorting Charlie for money. So. Did you, the night that you went to get the money, did 
Did you threaten Charlie Adelson in any way? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you try to extort money out of him? No, ma'am, I did not. The money that he gave you, is that something that had already been discussed or agreed upon in reference to this homicide? Well, I, I believe yes, because it was, it was gonna be payment for this. You weren't, well, were you sent with a message from Sigfredo to tell him he better give it up or else? No, ma'am. Did you relay to the defendant that his family was in danger if he didn't give you whatever it was you were asking for? No, ma'am. How did Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera get paid for their part in this murder? Um, that morning, I, when I woke up, I was like, oh my God, I, I gotta go. So I, I drove back down and I was trying to look for Sigfredo and having a hard time that morning. And then eventually I made it to the alleyway of where Lewis's building was. Was that on North, uh, North Miami? Yes. In like 135th. Where he lived with Jessica? Yes, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. And he just, I was just waiting in the car and all of a sudden Sigfredo just like popped up and got inside the passenger seat. All right, so they got their money from you? Yes, ma'am. Sigfredo did. And Rivera got paid as well, didn't he? I believe so, yes. <clears throat> All right, I wanna draw your attention to what we're calling the bump. You know what we're talking about? Yes, ma'am. Okay. After the bump and the subsequent conversations were occurring, did you have any contact with any other Adelson about the bump other than Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am. So you didn't talk to Wendy about it? No, ma'am, I did not. Didn't talk to Harvey or Donna about it? No, ma'am, I did not. On the Dolce Vita meeting, that, do you recall what meeting I'm referencing? Yes, ma'am. All right, was that a restaurant that you met Charlie at after the bump? Yes, ma'am. Okay, in that meeting, and the jury hasn't heard this yet, but he's saying one of two scenarios. This is one of two scenarios. Do you remember yes, that? Yes, ma'am, I do. What were the one of two scenarios? What were the two scenarios? What he was speaking of was probably the FBI mm -hmm. or Tato um, blackmailing. And by Tato, you mean Rivera? Lewis Rivera, yes, ma'am. Were you concerned about that as well? Yes, ma'am, I was. And what did you do to try to figure out who it was that had approached Donna Adelson? I asked Sigfredo. So he was supposed to be looking into it? Yes, ma'am. Were you there whenever he did whatever he did to try to find out who it was? Was I where? Were you present when Sigfredo, I guess, went out and talked to people about whether- No, ma'am, I was not. Because at that time, was Rivera in custody? Yes, ma'am. He was, yeah, he was already doing his federal sentence, I believe. So was the concern that maybe some of his associates might have done this? Yes, ma'am. Maybe he had run his mouth about it? Yes, ma'am. Have you reviewed what I had marked for U.S. States Exhibit 111 the Dolce Vita recording with the transcript attached? Yes, ma'am, I did. And does the transcript in that exhibit accurately reflect the words that were said at that meeting between yourself and the defendant? Yes, ma'am. When the defendant described the bump to you, strike, When you were speaking with Charlie Adelson and also Sigfredo Garcia about this bump, did you speak in code? Yes, ma'am, I did. And what was the purpose of speaking in code? I kind of just piggybacked with what Charlie was speaking to me in code, so I kind of was like, okay, if he's talking in codes, kind of speaking codes as well. Was the concern that the calls could be recorded, being recorded? Um, my concern was more that I was at work, so I really didn't want to say any phone numbers out loud or speak of what was going on. I'm going to approach and show you what I've marked as state's demonstrative A. Have you seen this before? I don't know if you have. 
No, ma'am, I have not. All right, and it's got several items listed here as code words <laughs> with the actual meaning next to them. Yes, ma'am. Would you take a moment to just, and the ones in red are the ones used by you, the ones in yellow are used by Charlie Adelson. Okay. Will you review this exhibit and just tell me if it's accurate as far as what the code means? Apparently they have some kind of chart showing what different yes, code terms were that they're asking. Uh, at this time I'm asked to make use of states demonstrative A. Is that Yeah, that's a good comment right there, Roxanne. <clears throat> that's why this whole extortion theory just doesn't even have an ounce of uh, credibility to it. Yeah, folks are commenting on her memory. Obviously, her memory is, is better. And um, she looks, uh, she looks like she's coming clean. You can go ahead and make those notes. Yeah, I'm curious also to see, uh, like some of the commenters said, um, are they going to be bringing in more details about other Adelsons after the fact? Don't know about any uh, <clears throat> sons visiting him at the jail. Um, haven't seen anything about those kind of records being produced. So uh, that's true there. Oops. So I'm not sure what George is signing there. Okay, code words are up on the big screen now, so that's interesting. We'll see those here in a second. Yes, ma'am, I was. All right. And the CD, was that reference to a recorded, a recording that the Adelsons made of their contact with the undercover? A recording of their contact with them? Yes. That they were Probably being recorded? No, that they called the undercover. Yes, ma'am. And recorded it. Yes, ma'am. Did you ever actually hear that recording? No, ma'am, not until my trial. And then the client, there's a lot of discussion about this client or this tenant. You need to find out if this is going to be a good tenant or a bad tenant. Yes, Was the tenant 
this person, if it really was a blackmailer, this thug that's somehow affiliated with Rivera? Yes, ma'am. All right, the false lead or the phishing, what is that, what did that mean? There's a lot of discussion about, I hope it's just somebody phishing. You remember that? From the phone calls? Yes, this is all from the phone calls. Yes, ma'am. It was one of the two scenarios that it could be law enforcement. Yes, ma'am. But this was Charlie basically saying this the whole time. He's the one who's coming up with all the scenarios. Okay, but in, when he's talking about the scenarios, he's talking about fishing. Yes, ma'am. He ma doesn't say law enforcement fishing. No, ma'am. He says it could be, you know, a tenant or a, a patient or something like that. Anything but what? Judge, I'm just going to object to the lead. Please rephrase your question, Ms. Kappelman. Sustained. The listing or the properties, what did that refer to? About the paperwork. That's pretty right, accurate. Into a listing. Yes, the listing, because I worked in a real estate agency at that time. So he was just telling me, look into the listing. Oh, this will be a good investment. So it was really Charlie saying all these words. What did the good and what, what was the, what might the good of what might the good investment have been? If he had a good lead. If, if it was a blackmailer, yes. then you could pay off. Objection, yes, you're on your meeting. So the rule. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, it is. Okay. All right, we talked about the two scenarios. The paperwork, what was that? That was the paper that was handed to his mom by the undercover. On the Dolce restaurant meeting, we see Charlie Adelson pull out a piece of paper. Was yes, that the piece, the actual piece of paper that was handed to his mother? I believe so, I just never saw it. He never showed it to me. Okay, did he give you a phone number off of that piece of he paper? He did, that was that six, that phone number that we just can't seem to get right. Yes, the 6570. At any time after, I know we talked about the night of the money, that you got the money, but at any time after that, did you ever blackmail Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you ever threaten him in any way? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you relay any threats on behalf of Sigfredo Garcia? No, ma'am, I did not. Did anyone ever make you extort any money or other favors out of Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am. Before the murder, had you bragged to Garcia and or Rivera about my new rich boyfriend? Um, I never, I didn't even know he had money like that. Well, I mean, he had a... I mean, he had a good job and, you know, he had a nice house, but I wasn't aware of how, you know, what, what, how much money he has. Okay. But he definitely had more than Sufredo Garcia. Oh, yes, ma'am, he did. <laughs> okay. And did you brag to Garcia, like, oh, I got a new, better I mean, guy? I'm pretty sure he, he saw that I was happy and I was, you know, going out to dinners and hanging out with him, so. Okay. But did you tell them specifically he's got a lot of money? No, I did not. Did you tell them specifically... He's got this issue with his uh, sister's ex-husband. I believe I mentioned it. Yes, okay. I did. And when you talked to them about he's got this issue with the sister's ex-husband, was that in the context of hiring them to do the murder? Or just in... Just, just in general. Okay, so they were aware that he had this issue. Well, Sigfredo was, yes. Okay, did you ever talk to Rivera about it? No, I did not. Okay, and when you talked to Sigfredo about it, did he ever say, well, I think I'll just drive to Tallahassee and kill the guy or anything mm. like that? No, ma'am, he did not. Is that something he would have 
mentioned to you if that was his idea? Sigfredo doesn't say a lot of things to me, so and he likes to keep a lot of things away from me. So he okay. would have never asked me that or told me that. Okay. But in this case, I guess, okay. So is it possible that Sigfredo and Rivera came to Tallahassee and did this killing without any communication from you or Charlie Adelson, just on their own? No, ma'am. And then that would extorted be... Charlie Adelson through you to get money because they had killed the guy. No, that'd be impossible. How would they have any information? Well, they could have seen it on the internet. No. <coughs> so. A lot of leading here. I sort of wish you'd let the uh, character of the witness develop a little bit more, but. When you were talking about Wendy's husband and the problems with him to Sigfredo Garcia. I know you've already said this, but I just want to be crystal clear. Yes, ma'am. Did you say the name Dan Markell? No, ma'am. I never knew Dan Markell's name. How was the name Dan Markell, the location and name of the target for this killing, provided to the killers? I believe it was all the information that was given to Sigfredo, which I got from Charlie, was all in that paper. Paper provided by this defendant? Yes, ma'am. In the, inside the envelope. May I have a moment to confer? Go It wasn't brought out that Katie's motive to testify could be to lower her sentence. So that's probably something he's going to start attacking her on. Well, there's no tapping still going now, on. This, this, you were arrested uh, and charged wait. with the murder of Professor Markell on October 1, 2014. I'm sorry, 2016, correct? Yes, sir. Almost immediately, the state talked to your lawyers and offered you full immunity, a get out of jail free card, right? I don't know if that was immediately. Pretty soon after you got arrested, you were offered to cooperate against Charlie Adelson and the other Adelsons and you would get to go home to your kids, right? Yes, sir. And your lawyers told you about that offer? Yes, sir, they did. You also saw an interview on TV while you were in jail in which one of the prosecutors mentioned this immunity offer, right? Yes, sir. You have two kids who are your world, right? Yes, sir. If you took the state's deal, then you would have been let out of jail immediately, right? That's what your lawyers told you. If I took their deal? Yes, sir. But you didn't take the offer. No, I didn't. Instead, you stayed in jail for three years before your first trial, right? Yes, sir. You stayed in jail through COVID after your first trial hung. Yes, sir. You still didn't cooperate. Still, the deal was still open, right? Well, the deal was to give up Charlie. And you couldn't do that? Because in order to give up Charlie, I had to give up Sigredo, the father of my children. So I couldn't do that. So the, while you're in jail, sitting in jail, during COVID, the, you knew there was still a deal possibility open for you, right? You could still take a deal. Your lawyers told you that. Before COVID, after my mistrial? Yes. I believe so. And you still didn't take the deal, right? No. And Charlie Adelson didn't force you to take the deal, not take the deal, right? No, I had no communication with Charlie. He didn't pay for your attorneys. 
he didn't pay for my attorneys, but there there was word that he was my brother declined him paying for my attorneys and had anything to do with him. I, I know you have an agenda here, but just answer my questions. Yes, sir. Did Charlie Adelson pay for your attorneys? No, sir, he did not. Did anyone in the Adelson family pay for your attorneys? No, sir. Did anyone in the Adelson family pay any money to your kids? No, sir. You had nothing to do with Charlie Adelson, right? After the bump? No, sir, I did not. Now, the real reason you didn't cooperate and you made it clear is because Charlie Adelson had absolutely nothing to do with the murder of Professor Markell. Isn't that the case? I didn't cooperate because in order to give, a, give up Charlie, I'd have to give up Sigfredo. Well, let's talk about the testimony in your first trial. And don't worry, we're going to get to your proffers as well. Okay. But let's talk about the testimony in your first trial. You were asked, did you get the father of your children, Mr. Garcia, to commit a murder on behalf of Mr. Charlie Adelson? Answer, no, ma'am. Do you recall saying that? Yes, sir. You were asked, can you, do you have information that Charlie Adelson was involved in this? Answer, do I have information? I don't have personal information. Do you recall that? No, sir, I do not. You don't recall saying that in your first trial? No, sir, I do not. Would you like to see a transcript of yes, it? Yes, I will. <clears throat> Going into details of how she lied is something I would have liked to see the prosecutor do when they uh, brought her up on the stand. So this kind of stuff, I prefer to see it brought out by the government, not by the defense counsel. I'll direct your attention to page 2800, 2800 lines one through five. Please read to yourself. Is that refreshing? Yeah, her brother. That that's yes. what you said? Yes, sir, it does. During your second trial, do you recall being asked, Charlie didn't ask you to do anything weird? Answer, no, ma'am. Like get someone to get a hitman to commit a murder of his ex-brother-in-law? No, ma'am. Do you recall those questions and that answer? Yes, sir, I do. Because you couldn't implicate Charlie, you went to trial and the first trial hung. Isn't that the case? Yes, sir. A few weeks before your second trial, Charlie was arrested. Yes, Isn't sir. that the case? Yes, sir. The state waited and waited and waited for you to cooperate, and then they arrested him on the eve of your trial when you made it clear you weren't going to cooperate, right? Yes, sir. So you went to trial the second time, and this time you were convicted. Yes, sir. And you were convicted of first-degree murder and other charges, right? Yes, sir. A few weeks after your conviction, you were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus another 30 years. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And you were transferred from the jail in Leon County to the state prison where you would spend the rest of your life, right? Yes, sir. Away from your family? Yes, sir. Away from your children? Yes, sir. And you realize that there are only two ways to get out of that prison, right? What are the two ways? Well, one way was in a coffin, right? Yes, sir. And the other way was cooperating against Charlie Adelson, right? No, sir. I wanted the truth to finally come out. What are the only two ways that you can ever get out of prison Ms. Magbanoa. My appeal? Oh, well, we get to that too. You have an appeal pending right now, right? Yes, sir. That claims that you're innocent. Yes, sir. Let, let's just make this clear to the jury. Ms. Kappelman has called you as a witness against this man who's presumed innocent. You've just testified that you did a murder and you have an appeal pending right now in this county claiming your innocence. Isn't that true? Yes, sir.
And lo and behold, weeks after you were convicted and sentenced to life with no parole, you went in and met with the state, right? Yes, sir. And you met with them not once, but twice. Yes, sir. And you met with them for hours. Yes, sir. A combined total of around six hours, right? Yes, sir. Now, we're going to get into that and all the lies that Ms. Kappelman didn't go through with you that you made during those interviews, but let's go back to the first trials first, okay? Mm -hmm. In each of those trials, you took the stand for your own defense, right? Yes, sir. And you took the same oath and looked at different jurors the same way that you look today, right? Yes, sir. And in your second trial, not only did you take an oath in this room, but isn't it true that you tried to get Sigfredo to lie for you? No, sir, I did not. Isn't it true that you were caught on a recording in the prison in which you were going to have Sigfredo Garcia come into the, your trial, your second trial, and say that he did the murder with Charlie Adelson all by himself? No, sir. You never were on a recording never of that said fact. That. Your plan at your second trial wasn't to have Sigfredo Garcia testify on your behalf? No, sir. Are you aware that your lawyer opened up on that plan no, in sir, her opening? No, well, did you sit through the trial? Yes, sir, I did. Did you sit through the trial when she said to the jury, you're going to hear from Sigfredo Garcia, who's going to say that the murder was between him and Charlie Adelson, and that you're just a victim of having bad taste in men? He never came up. He refused to come and testify, right? I don't know if he refused. He just never, he was never called. Are you aware that you and your lawyer subpoenaed him to come down to Leon County to testify on your behalf? He was subpoenaed, but he just never showed up. And he, he didn't he show up? He never took the stand. Right. He was subpoenaed by you, correct? Yes, sir. And you got on the phone with him. You were caught because you're not supposed to talk to each other, right? Yes, sir. But you guys talk to each other because what you do is you call his mom, right? Yes, sir. And he calls his mom. Isn't that what you all do? At that time, yes, sir. Yeah, you call each other so that you can talk to each other <laughs> through the mom. And during one of those calls, you asked him to come testify on your behalf. Isn't that what you did? No, I did not ask him. Okay. Well, we'll move on to some other lies. During your first trial, you were asked, you didn't ask Mr. Garcia to help this lady get her kids back in Tallahassee. Answer, no, ma'am. You didn't solicit him to commit a murder of Dan Markell. Answer, no, ma'am. Do you recall those questions and answers? Yes, sir. You were asked, well, back then, did you know someone by the name of Dan Markell? Answer, no, ma'am. In 2014, you learned that Wendy Edelson's divorce was already finalized, right? I learned that in court. I didn't know it before. Do you remember those, yes, those words? Those were lies, right? Yes, I lied in my trials to save myself. We'll keep going. You lied when you said that Charlie told you that Professor Markell had been in an accident, right? I lied that. Say it again, sir. Well, I'll ask you the questions. Do you remember having a conversation with Charlie Adelson about his brother-in-law being in an accident? Does that sound familiar to you? It yeah. sounds familiar, yeah. That was a lie, right? No, that's what Charlie said. He that told you that he was in an accident? He'd tell you that there was a murder? No, he told me he was in an accident. So you didn't know about the murder of Dan Markell on July 18th? Is that what you're telling this jury? No, not at that time. Well, when did you find out about the murder of Dan Markell? It was later on. Oh, really? So the money that you bought, brought to the guys that Ms. Kappelman brought up on opening, the money you brought up to the guys on July 19th, it was because Dan Markell was in an accident? I didn't know that that was Dan Markell. Like, I didn't know his name. Oh. But there was oh. a murder that happened, yes. At the March 11th dinner that you had with Mr. Lacoste at Yardbird, Dan Markell's name wasn't mentioned? No, sir. 
Would it surprise you that Mr. Lacoste has testified to the opposite of that? No, I haven't seen his testimony. At your first trial, you were asked, did Charlie mention anything to you about a murder out of Tallahassee? So now it's not Dan Markell. It's just a murder out of Tallahassee. And your answer was no, ma'am. Question, did he mention anything about his ex-brother-in-law being murdered? Answer, no, ma'am. Do you recall those questions? Yes, sir. And those were lies, right? Yes, I told you I lied. <laughs> I lied in my trials to save myself. I, I understand. Please let me keep going through them. There's a lot of them, so take, we'll take our time. Yes, sir. Now, you said you never saw any cash at Charlie's place. Do you recall that at trial? He had cash, but I just never, I didn't know how much he had. I know he keeps cash in his, in his um, safe. But I thought you just testified moments ago that you never saw cash at his place. They didn't keep cash at his place. That supposedly his parents had to bring the cash. Isn't that what you just told this jury about uh, 18 minutes ago? An abundance of cash. Have you seen his safe? Yes, sir. Have you ever seen it open? Yes, sir. Doesn't he keep a lot of cash that he collects on the top of his safe? I mean, I'm not like looking in it, but every single time we used to go out, he used to grab some money from the, from the safe and then take it with him. Repeatedly during both trials, you said you worked at the Adelson Institute. You never worked at the Adelson Institute, no, right? No, sir, I did not. Now we're gonna hear about a Lexus. Yes, sir. You said you paid for that Lexus. You never paid for that Lexus. Is that I the paid Charlie cash for that Lexus. Really? Yes. Okay. I think the state might disagree. Has the state disagreed with you on that point? About me paying him cash? Yes, because there was nothing that was coming out of my account, but I paid him cash. I had the cash on me. During the trial, the first trial, you were asked, do you know why it is that Charlie chose you out of all of his ex-girlfriends to call? I don't, I don't know why he called me. Do you recall those questions? Yes, sir. That was a lie, right? I told you I lied in my first and second trial to save myself. Well, let's get to the second trial. Just like you're lying here to save yourself, right? I'm not saving myself, I'm telling the truth this time. Right, because now all of a sudden, after eight years, you have developed a conscience. I think that's what you told the jury. No, it's because my, the father of my children was on death penalty at that time on my first trial. So I couldn't, I couldn't give up. If, I, if it was just Charlie, like I said from the trial, go ahead and arrest him. Nobody ever did. He didn't get the death penalty after the first trial and he was convicted, right? Yes, sir. And by the time of his second trial, you had no reason to protect him anymore. He was done. No, sir. He was under appeal. Okay. Just like you're under appeal now. Yes, sir. So what you said to this jury about 20 minutes ago is you said to this jury, I'm here today to tell the truth, and I want to get your exact words. Because I want to do the right thing. Yes, sir. Isn't it because... You want to go home. And that's the only way that you could ever go home is to help them. That's the only way you can go home by not being dead. I was not promised anything. I'm doing this solely on myself. Clearly, you don't even see my attorneys in this room. Let's talk about the second trial. Again, you lied when you testified that you didn't know anything about or were involved in the murder of Professor Markell, right? Yes, sir. I told you I lied in my first and second trial to save myself. Ma'am, we've heard it. If you could just answer the questions. Did yes, you sir. lie? Yes, sir. You lied when you testified that you knew nothing about Wendy's divorce, Wendy Edelson's divorce. Yes, sir. You lied when you said you didn't pick up money from Charlie's house on July 18th. Yes, sir. You lied when you said uh, you knew nothing about stapled cash. Yes, sir. You lied when you said you didn't bring the money to Sigfredo or, 
or Luis, Luis Rivera the next day? Yes, sir. You lied again when you said you worked as a personal assistant for Charlie, right? Yes, sir. You lied repeatedly when you tried to discuss what would ha had happened, what was being spoken at Dolce Vita, correct? Yes, sir. All right, well, now let's talk about the lies that you told that the state didn't go over with you. Let's talk about your proffers, your cooperation. Yes, sir. So you were interviewed by the state twice in October and November 2022, correct? Yes, sir. And by the way, you've met with them a couple times since then, right? A couple times. Have you met with after? them since? Yeah, after that point? Probably one time. You met with Ms. Kappelman? Yes, yes, sir. Did Ms. Kappelman ask you about our defense during that meeting? No, sir. She didn't ask you about whether, for the first time, whether you ever threatened uh, no, Charlie sir. Adelson? Now, when you met them, met with them in October and November of 2022, this was after you got your life sentence, right? Yes, sir. And um, you met with them first in Marion County Jail on October 11th, right? Marion County Jail? No, sir. I've never been in that county. You met with them in the jail. I got the wrong jail, obviously. I've never met with them in any jails. Where did you meet with them? I the was first already time? in in DOC. Okay. In Lowell. You met with them in prison? Yes, sir. Apologies. And the second time, you met with them at the state attorney's office, right? Here in Tallahassee? Yes, sir. And both times, Special Agent Sanford was there? Yes, sir. Investigator Jason Newland was there? Yes, sir. And TPD Investigator Sherry Bennett were there? Yes, sir. And they asked you questions? Yes, sir. And each time, you told them a version of events that was very different from what you said at your trials, right? Yes, sir. In fact, during those six hours of interviews, you told them about five more versions, right? Five different versions of it? Yeah. No, sir. Oh, so you told them the same thing throughout the six hours that you met with them? I believe so, but I think the first time you can't even visit more than two hours, so I don't know where you're getting six hours. Well, maybe I'm wrong, but let's look. The first interview started at uh, 9.26 a.m., and it ended at 11.44 a.m., so a little over two hours. Yes, sir. First interview. Your position right now, what you're telling this jury, is that the same thing you told them in the first interview, you told them in the second interview? I believe so, yes, sir. You believe so or you know so? I know so. I believe so. I believe so. You absolutely know so. No, I don't, not verbatim exactly what I said. Isn't it true that during the entire first interview you said you had nothing to do with the murder? No, sir, I didn't say that. All right, well, we're going to go through exact quotes, and we'll see if your memory can be refreshed. Yes, sir. By the way, during any of these interviews, did you give them any documentation, anything new, any text messages, documentation, WhatsApps, any new, as people call it, receipts? Did you give them any new evidence? No, I'm in prison. I don't have anything. It, it was just your words, right? Yes, sir. So let's talk about what you said. During the first proffer, which was a little over two hours. Yes, sir. You raised your hand and they put you under oath, right? Yes, sir. And throughout the proffer, the agents, particularly Special Agent Sanford, kept on telling you that you have to tell the truth, right? Yes, sir. He didn't believe you. I mean, whatever his reasons are. Was he know. frustrated with you during the interview? Yes, sir. In fact, one hour and eight minutes into the proffer, he said to you that you were minimizing your involvement.
All right, so on this, um, I think they're just objecting to what the agent's going to say because maybe they did have uh, not the full truth being told by her at that time. Um, I think the thing to keep in mind is this is normal. If the prosecution doesn't set up the personality and character of the witness much, as well as they're lying, like I would have like really beat her up um, and done some uh, quasi yelling at her as well as about how she abandoned her kids, she committed this murder, she's cold hearted, you know, evil, that kind of stuff, and just made it look like how, how is she going to hold up now? How, what's really changed about her now to tell the truth? And then, um, and then going in all the lies, I ought to have gone probably like a, at least half hour, 45 minutes on all her lies. So they basically, when Rashman's up there doing the same thing he's doing now, it's pretty much, yeah, Alcar, we already heard it. So it doesn't make it look as, as much like um, <clears throat> they're able to ambush her because the prosecution has already done it. But in, in the end, though, um, I think it's going to come out that, yeah, she is telling the truth overall. And I think the uh, Dolce Vita tapes are really going to bolster her credibility because of the way Charlie acted. <laughs> what I would think is be better is to do the Dolce Vita first, because that sets a more scene of their and the dynamics between the relationship between her and Charlie. And Charlie so let's was, go back. Uh, basically Your position, what you've told this jury is you are completely mind. consistent. You told the same story during the entire proffer, right? I can't, like I told you, I can't remember verbatim what I've said from the first proffer and the second proffer. Let's just talk about the first proffer. Yes, sir. Your view is that from the beginning of the first proffer to the end of the first proffer, you said the same thing throughout. That's what you're telling this jury. From the first proffer to the second proffer that I'm saying the same exact thing? I don't remember verbatim what I've said. How about from the beginning of the first proffer to the end of the first proffer? What you told the jury is you were consistent from the beginning of the first proffer to the end of the first proffer. Do you recall saying that? Yes, sir. Is that still your testimony? No, I, that I, I was consistent about it? No, because it was very hard for me to confess what I've done. So let me ask the question again. Yes, sir. Isn't it true that during the first proffer, for the first one hour and eight minutes, you continue to say that you didn't murder Professor Markell. No, sir, I didn't say that. I, I, I don't understand your answer, so let me rephrase. Okay. Isn't it true that for the first half of the first proffer, you denied participation in the murder of Professor Markell? No, sir, I was telling him what happened and how my involvement in it. So your position is that throughout the entire first proffer, you admitted that you participated in the murder of Professor Markell. Yes, sir. Judge, may I proceed now? Would it surprise you that one hour and eight minutes into the first proffer, Special Agent Sanford said that you were minimizing your involvement in Professor Markell's murder? Mi like he stated, I was minimizing it. It was hard for me to confess everything that I've suppressed for the past seven years. 11 minutes later, he said that what you were telling him made absolutely no sense. Do you recall him saying that? No, sir, I did not. Oh, let me see if I can show you. There was a first proffer right on the eve of her one of her trials so when he says for proffer i don't know what he's talking to it's basically a denial that she was involved um i don't think he's probably referring to that one he's probably talking to the one that was uh, recently done in the last uh year since her sentence does this refresh your recollection that special agent sanford said all of it doesn't make object. sense I'll, I'll 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 try it does this refresh your recollection of what agent sanford said just the line that you highlighted? You can read before and after to make sure I'm not doing lawyer tricks. Yes, sir, can I? Of course. Yes, sir.
yeah, Katie is tainted, and all these cast of characters has baggage, and you got to deal with it as a prosecutor. So right now, it's sort of like, oh gosh, Katie, Katie's such because a liar. Agent we can't Sanford believe anything she's done. Why am I he not packs it all con together. Conversations, specific conversations, and I told him I can't recall those specific conversations. Was he telling you that what you were saying didn't make sense to him? I'm gonna object to what Agent Sanford said or his opinion. Sustain. Please lay the foundation to impeach specifically. At some point in the interview, did he walk out on you? Uh, yes, he did, on the second interview. Yeah, okay. We're going to get to that. That's like four and hours into your combined interviews, right? I believe so. Right, so you come back, and I think it's over an hour into the second interview, so actually my math isn't great. It's like three and a half hours into interviewing. Agent Sanford gets so upset. Judge, I'm going to object to Agent Sanford's opinions I'll, I'll rephrase. He's withdrawing the question. Please move on. Around three hours into these interviews, Agent Sanford decides to leave the room, right? Yes, sir. He was frustrated with you, right? I believe so. Truthfully, during your first interview, you kept on saying all of these things were jumbled in your head, right? Yes, sir. You said that about 11 times. Do you recall that? I don't recall how many times I said it, no sir. You said that eventually 33 minutes into the interview, you said you arranged through an envelope that Charlie gave you, but that you never opened it for Sigfredo to rough up Professor Markel. Do you recall saying that? Repeat the question. 33 minutes into the interview. Yes, sir. You admitted that you arranged through an in envelope that Charlie gave you, but that you never opened. Yes, sir. For Sigfredo to rough up Professor Markel. Do you recall that? I've never said Professor Markel's name. To rough up the deceased. What do you mean by that? Can you explain? You told them 33 minutes into the interview. Yes that Charlie had given you an envelope that you had never opened, that miraculously got to Sigfredo Garcia, and the purpose of it was to rough up his ex-brother-in-law. No, because I didn't know what the contents of what was in the envelope, so I wouldn't have said that. You said that somehow that plan had transitioned to murder, but according to what you told investigators, you never knew when that happened. Do you recall saying that? Repeat the question again, sir. You said that somehow the rough up plan had transitioned to murder. I never said rough up or any of those words. That's why it's confusing me what All right, you're well, stating. Let, let, let's say it again. Yes, sir. You said that somehow the plan had transitioned to murder. But according to what you told investigators, you never knew when that transition happened. Well, at that time, I didn't know. At, at the time that you were interviewed? No, not at my interview, but when it was happening, as they're interviewing me and we're going through the scenario. I'm going to show you 186 to 187. You told investigators during your first interview, two hours into it, two hours and one minute to be exact. Yes, sir. That you never spoke to Charlie about the change in plans. I never spoke to Charlie about the change in plans. Meaning it going to become a murder. I'm confused about the questions you're asking. Is this what I said? Yes, what you said to these investigators just a year ago, after you were convicted for life, didn't you tell investigators you didn't know it was gonna be a murder? I, when we were talking about this, like I said, it was hard for me to confess my involvement in this. Right, so Can you- Can you show me where I said this? 
let's just let's just go with what you just said. Yes, sir. So two hours into your first interview, when you said this, you still were not admitting that you had a part in the murder. Yes, it was very hard for me to do this, especially that they came to me in prison where, right. why are all these investigators coming in? Okay, so we are now where we started, which is during this first proffer, just a year ago, under oath again, you refused to admit at first that you had anything to do with the murder, that you were a part of the murder. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. It's hard for me to admit it. Yes, sir, it is. It's still hard for me to admit it right now. Okay. <clears throat> During your first proffer, nine minutes and 14 seconds into it, do you recall being asked the following questions? And as you saw in trial, Garcia and Rivera made a trip in June. What can you tell us about that? Answer, see, like, like I don't even remember. I mean, obviously, like you're telling me to, like remember from what I heard at trial, I learned a lot of things from trial. That's why it's so hard. And I want to say the right thing, but like, I don't remember them going up on a first trip. Do you recall saying that during this proffer? I don't recall it if you could show it to me. Does that refresh your recollection that you said that? Yes, sir. You were asked during your proffer on page 68. I don't know how long into it probably about a third into it. Question, before that trip, you knew that Lewis was going to go with him on that trip? Answer, no, I never knew he was going with him. Do you recall answering that way? Yes, sir. You also said during that proffer, 63 minutes in, that you didn't know Lewis Rivera was going on the second trip to Tallahassee. Do you recall saying that? Yes, sir. During that interview on page 83, you told investigators, this is just a year ago, that on the night of July 18th, you didn't know that Charlie's brother-in-law had been shot. Can you show me that, sir? Sure. Yes, because I'm emphasizing I don't know Dan Markell. You said that you didn't know that Dan Markell had been shot, right? Yes, sir. You told that to investigators a year ago, that that's what, on that night, you had no idea that there was a shooting. Yes, I was partly denying probably still my involvement in it. 
This is something I've suppressed for a long time, sir. Now, what's also interesting is when you described July 18th, you said Charlie was panicked. Yes, sir. You said he took his annex and you took his annex. Yes, sir. He gave me. You said that he was upset. I never said he was upset. He was just frantic. Let's move on to the second proffer. Yes, sir. The second proffer was six weeks after the first proffer. Do you recall that? This is when I came back, I came here? Correct. Yes, sir. And you met with investigators for three and a half hours this time? If that's what it states. From 10.06 in the morning to 1.38 in the afternoon? Yes, sir. At the beginning of the interview, you told investigators you didn't know why you were there, right? Yes, I didn't know what I got pulled out for. And 15 minutes into the interview, Agent Sanford left the room, right? Yes, sir. And he didn't come back? No, sir. During the interview, you were told, do you recall being told that you weren't giving the state anything to make them want to do anything for you. Can you repeat that question, sir? Do you recall that during the interview, you were told that you weren't giving the state anything to make them want to do anything for you? Who stated that? Investigator Bennett. Okay, yes, sir. She, she was upset. I mean, we were just talking about the same thing over again. When she said that you had a real issue, right? Not that I can recall, what's the issue? Well, if you didn't help the state and give them something that they could work with, there was only one way you were ever getting out of prison and that's in a box. Why do you keep stating that, sir? You're in jail for the rest of your life, right? Yes, sir. If the state doesn't help you, the only way you're getting out of prison is when you die. But they never said they were going to help me. I wasn't promised That's anything. not my question. What's the only way that you're getting out of prison if the state doesn't help you? I'll die in prison. During this second proffer, they asked you, you mean to tell me that you had no clue that he came to Tallahassee? Answer, he told me he was not, he never told me he was going to Tallahassee. Do you recall saying that you didn't know that Sigfredo Garcia was going to Tallahassee? Yes, sir. I never knew he went to Tallahassee. You never knew Sigfredo Garcia went to Tallahassee? No, sir. Okay. During these proffers, you never told the state about monthly payments, did you? Monthly payments? That Charlie was making monthly payments to you. What, the checks from, from the Adelson Institute? Yes. They were aware of that. How about the cash he was giving you every month? He wasn't giving me any cash every month. Oh, really? Yes. He wasn't giving you $2,000 of cash every single month that you're heard on the wires trying to accept? No, sir. He was just giving you a, an Adelson Institute check? Yes, sir. What would the $2,000 be for? Before he gave you the Adelson Institute checks, you were getting $3,000 a month, right? No, sir. It wasn't until one hour and 13 minutes in the first proffer that you first admitted that you didn't work for the Edelson Institute, right? Yes, sir, I lied about it. In the proffer? 
in the proffer, I don't know when I said it, but I lied in my trials about getting those checks from the Adelson Institute. So I said those were checks that I needed to show so that I can get insurance for my children. You recall them asking you about a meeting with Charlie in the car before Dolce Vita? Yes, sir. And you said that you couldn't recall what was discussed? Yes, sir. You recall that during the second proffer, you told the state that you didn't know the police were at your door during the wire? And if you had known they were at the door, you would have let them in? I, I don't think I mentioned it in that way, but they didn't announce themselves when they were knocking on the door. In fact, aren't we gonna see in the wires that you were hiding from the police? I was not hiding, I was at home. Weren't you hiding at home? From what? I was working from home that day. Weren't you making a bunch of phone calls to a lot of people saying the police are at my door, I don't know what to do, I can't answer the door, I'm afraid. Weren't you hiding from them? Somebody was knocking at the door, they didn't state who they were, so I was calling Sigfredo and nobody was picking up. Then one of his coworkers finally called back and said that there's FBI over there speaking to him and he's gonna come by the house. And he came by the house? Yes. And you all discussed how you were gonna stay hidden and not answer the door, right? I didn't discuss anything. They just said that there was like an FBI agent or an agent outside. So and I just never answered. And you decided not to answer the door and let them in, right? No, why would I let them in? Let me make sure that we're being clear here. Yes, sir. Did you know that the police were outside your door? I didn't know who was outside my door. I didn't know until his coworker had stated that there was an undercover or an agent outside. And after he stated that, did you know that there was police outside your door? They were gone. Oh, really? Yeah, like they knocked Okay. and then they were gone. You didn't stay hidden for over 45 minutes no, while sir. these phone calls are happening? I was at home. I just didn't open the door. Okay. During the entire first proffer and two thirds of the second proffer, you never said that Charlie did it or ordered it. Isn't that true? Not specifically, no. Now today you come in here and you talk about how on Halloween, Charlie asked you if there was someone who could hurt his ex-brother-in-law, right? I stated that on the proffer. That's fine. Yes, sir. It took you a while to state it in the proffer, but I admit you did. It took yes, you about an hour and 40 minutes. But today, that's what your testimony was, right? Yes, sir. Do you know that you had only started dating Charlie Adelson about two weeks before Halloween? Probably, we just started talking. I don't know specifically if it was two weeks. Do you know that at the time of Halloween 2013, Charlie Adelson had absolutely no idea anything about your ex? I wouldn't know, sir. Well, let me, let me see if I can refresh your memory. Do you recall text messages in no, November 27th of 2013, where you said to... Refreshing the proper refreshing. Okay. We show the witness the document. But let me ask some questions first. Right. Isn't it true that Charlie Adelson didn't know about your ex until November 27th, 2013? I wouldn't know, sir. And even then, he didn't know much about him? I wouldn't know. Let me approach with, uh, what number is it? Defense Exhibit 34. You have it.
Does that refresh your recollection that he didn't know about your ex until at the earliest November 27, 2013? Yes, sir. Halloween's in October, right? Yes, sir. Now, you talk about this letter and Charlie printing it up. In all the times in Charlie's house, you ever see him, does he have a computer? He doesn't own a computer, right? He had a little office in his, in his house, but I don't know if there was a computer or not. I don't recall. You recall during these interviews that the investigators kept on pushing you whether Charlie gave you money during the trips? Repeat the question, sir. Do you recall during these interviews that the investigators kept on pushing you, asking you a lot of questions mm -hmm. about whether Charlie Adelson gave you any money before the two men took the trips? Yes, and I answered them. I know you did. Okay. And it took you 22 minutes left in the second proffer where you finally said he gave us a, he gave him a, he gave you a few hundred dollars before each trip. Yes, sir. Repeat, I was repeatedly before then, you couldn't even remember that, right? You were confused as you said it. No, I could remember it. It was just very hard when I was speaking, especially when I was speaking with um, Sergeant uh, Sanford in the room because he was frustrated with me. So once he left the room, it was an easier conversation to have and I wasn't so pressured. It was an easier conversation to have because in fact, investigator Bennett started to play the part of Katie Magbanawa, right? I don't know what you mean by that. Well, sir. she started to testify for you. No, sir, she did not. It wasn't mostly her talking and you saying yes? No, sir. Isn't it true that it wasn't until an hour and 16 minutes and 31 seconds into the second proffer where you were still continuing to say that you didn't become aware that this was going to be a murder until sometime between the first and second trips to Tallahassee? Yes, sir. I told you it was very hard for me to admit my part in all of this. I'm sorry. So four hours into your proffers, you were still saying that you didn't know the first trip was for a murder. That's fair to say, right? Yes, sir. Let's go on to a little different subject. You started dating Sigfredo Garcia just after high school. Yes, sir. By the time you broke up with him, you had been uh, with Sigfredo on and off for more than a decade. Yes, sir. By the way, when you dated Charlie Adelson, he thought you were broken up with Sigfredo Garcia, right? I was broken up with him. Well, did you have sexual relations with Sigfredo Garcia while dating Charlie Adelson? Yes, I did. Charlie didn't know that, right? I mean, that's not something I would tell him. Now, you, you considered him to be your husband. Yes, sir. You met Charlie Adelson at work. Yes, sir. At a place called Sophie Dental. Sophie Dental. Sorry, Sophie Dental. Yes, sir. And that was in South Beach. Yes, sir. And you started dating in the middle of October of 2013. In the middle of October? 
No, we started dating before that. When did you start dating? I, I don't recall the, the exact date, but it was definitely before October. If I told you September. I have a, do you recall that your first date was at a restaurant kind of in the building? I believe so, yes. If I told you that the date of that was October 9th, would that refresh your recollection? Could yes, that be sir. right? Possibly, yes, sir. Now, when you dated Charlie Adelson, he treated you well. Yes, sir. I think you said you didn't know he had money. You knew he had money. I mean, he wasn't very flashy with it. I know he was well off. He took you to nice dinners. Yes, sir. That was different than your past relationship, right? I've been in nice dinners with Sigfredo. Did Charlie treat you nicer than Sigfredo? I wouldn't say that he treated me nicer at that mo at that time, yes, because I was going through a lot with Sigfredo. Did Charlie ever lay hands on you? No, sir. Did Sigfredo? We've gone into arguments, yes. One where he ripped off your necklace? No, he's never ripped off any necklace no? of mine. No. Now, at first, Charlie was the pursuer. Is that fair to say? He pursued you. Yes, sir. Over time, you became more serious. I believe so. And he made it clear to you over time, namely in the spring of 2014, that he didn't want anything different than casual, right? I mean, I think we were both in agreement with that, yes. But you had, que you had questions about it. You asked him, right? I believe so. And he told you, I like the way things are. Yes, sir. Now, Sigfredo came to know that you were dating Charlie, correct? Yes, sir. And during your second trial, you testified that you told Sigfredo about Charlie to make Sigfredo mad. Probably. You wanted to throw it in your, his face that you were dating a successful dentist, right? That I was dating somebody, period, because I never really dated anybody after Sigfredo. Sigfredo hated Charlie. Um, I mean, yes. You told Charlie on one occasion, if you see him, run. Isn't mm -hmm. that what you told him? Not that I can recall now. Is it possible that you told him that? No, but he would be scared of Sigfredo, yes. Sigfredo considered you the love of his life, right? I believe so. He made it clear to you that he wanted you back and didn't want you to be with Charlie, right? It's not that he made it clear, but we were trying to work it out for our family. Now, Charlie talks a lot, right? Yes, he does. And he repeats himself over and over. Yes, sir. As a traveling uh, periodontist, he's in the car a lot for work, right? Yes, sir. And what does he do when he's in the car a lot? Talks on the phone? Talk on the phone, yes, sir. And he'd call you a lot on the phone, right? He would at that time, yes. And at that time, he would sometimes call you early in the morning, right? Yes, sir. He'd call you sometimes in his breaks at work. Yes, sir. He'd call you late at night. Yes, we were dating. Exactly. He'd talk to you a ton. Yes, sir. He talks to his mom a lot on the phone too, right? I believe so. Well, you witnessed it, right? Yes. You would be with him a lot when he would talk to his mom, right, on the phone. Yes, sir. And by the way, you talk on the phone a lot with Sigfredo Garcia, right? Yes, sir. And that makes sense because... He's the father of your two children, right? Yes, sir. Now, in 2014, you became aware of Charlie's family issues, right? Yes, sir. You heard him talking on the phone a lot to his mom, right? Yeah, he's always talking to his mom. And also, when you guys would go out, as you know, Charlie likes to talk, right? Yes, sir. And so a topic of frequent conversation would be what he had just talked to his mom about, right? 
No, he never told me what he was talking to his mom about. No, so he never told you about the problems that his sister was having? He wouldn't recount those conversations that he was having with his mom? Not when he's on the phone with his mom. Maybe if we're just, you know, laying down or and talking, he'd mention it once in a blue moon. And you would ask him questions about it, right? Not really. He told you about this TV was cheaper than a hitman joke many times, right? Yes, he's made that comment before. And he repeated it to many people, right? Yes, sir, he has. He makes a lot of bad jokes, right? Yes, he does. Did you ever tell him, Charlie, why are you making that joke when we're actually hiring a hitman? Like, don't you think that's a bad idea? Did you ever say that to him? No, because he's feels like he's untouchable. No, because you really weren't hiring a hitman. He didn't know he was hiring a hitman, right? That's why you didn't tell him that, right? He knew he was hiring a hitman. So when he made that joke in front of Professor Lacoste on March 11th at Yardbird. That he made that joke? Yeah, you know he made the joke at that dinner, right? I don't recall that, no, sir. Okay. Um, unless I was talking to Wendy and I didn't pay attention to what they were talking about. Well, let's talk about that dinner a little bit on March 11th, just six weeks before the first attempt that in your proffers you didn't know about. You all ate outside on the patio? Yes, sir. And during this dinner, you and Wendy talked a lot about your exes, didn't you? Not that we talked a lot about the exes. I always speak of my children, so I'm pretty sure I mentioned my kids and she mentioned her kids. You didn't probe information from Wendy about her ex and while you were t that's why you brought up your exes, your ex? Mm, no, sir. We did not talk about any exes. You were aware, were you aware that Sigfredo and Luis Rivera were sitting in a car scoping you out? I didn't know that until my trial. Now, the state showed you a picture of you on the beach with Wendy Adelson. Yes, sir. No discussion about a murder plot during that. No. The jet ski incident, was Charlie scared? Yes, sir. Were you upset? Of course. Did it cause a whole string of text messages? and fights between you and Sigfredo? After that incident, yes. You were afraid that Charlie was gonna break up with you, right? Not really. Really, your text messages don't show that you were upset that Charlie might break up with you? That Sigfredo was trying to run your life? Well, I was upset, but I didn't really care if, if Charlie was gonna break up with me or not. Now, I want to take you to the week of the murder, and we'll start with July 14th. You had dinner with Charlie the night of July 14th, right? Not that I can recall. Oh, you don't recall having dinner with him the night of July 14th? No, sir. Are you sure you didn't have dinner with him the night of July 14th? I can't recall if you'd show me something. Do you recall him working late? and coming towards your house and meeting him at a place near the water on July 14th? No, sir. Well, let's do it this way. If you had dinner with him on July 14th, just four days before the murder. Yes, sir. Did you pick up money from him at that point in time? No, sir, because I don't even remember that dinner. Assuming that the dinner happened, yes, which sir. I think the state's gonna prove. Okay. Did you pick up any money from him at that dinner? No, sir. I don't even recall that dinner. Fair enough. Do you recall having lunch with him on July 17th, the day before the murder? No, sir. Well, let me try to refresh your memory on this. Do you recall on July 16th that Charlie worked late and went out to dinner with Erica Johnson? 
I can't recall. Do you recall that you got in a fight with him that night because you thought he might be cheating on you? No, sir, I don't recall it. Do you recall that there are text messages in which you were upset that he was out so late? You don't recall that? No, sir. Do you have something to show me? I don't need to. Do you recall that he told you on that call that he had worked late, that he had gone out with Erica, and that he would have a lunch with you the next day? I don't recall any of those days, sir. Do you recall that on the call on that night, the evening of the 16th, it's actually the very morning of the 17th, it's after midnight, that you were adamant that you wanted to have dinner with him on the 18th? No, sir. I, you I don't, don't remember recall that. any of those days. That's why I'm You don't remember that. It's fine. Show me. The answer is you don't remember that, right? No, I can't recall. I get to ask the questions. Yes, sir. Okay? Yes. That's how this works. Yes, sir. Now, you went to lunch with him near his house. Do you recall that? No, sir. One moment. Yes, sir. Do you recall going to Vila's? It's like a Cuban Mexican place right by Charlie's house. I know of the restaurant, but I don't remember the date when we went or, you know, we've been there before. Yes. You don't recall going there the, the day before the murder? No, sir. Nonetheless, if you had been there, you didn't collect any money that day, right? No, sir. Do you recall that during that lunch, you got in a big fight. During what lunch? The lunch on the 17th that you don't remember. How can I tell you what happened if I don't remember the date and you're not showing me anything? Let's talk about uh, after the murder. One moment, Your Honor. Uh, you're... Sorry, it's on mute there. Yeah, if Rashmon has something to impeach her on, some other specific evidence, it'd be helpful to show her. So don't know what he has, uh, if he's going to present that. But I think overall, the um, how she's coming across, I, I just wish... All these different times she lied, like in the different proffers. I'm surprised the prosecutor didn't bring that up. But overall, like I say, the evidence is all going to fit together. And it's going to, the uh, Dolce Vita tapes will actually show who is really the one planning and, and leading uh, the conversation when, when the bump happened. And it sent them in a scurrying fashion to figure out, is this law enforcement or is this really one of the hitmen? So um, I, I think that will bring any clarity about this. And I sort of wish they would have brought no, that in. Charlie first. Adelson gave you $138,000 the night of the murder, not $100,000? I never counted the money. Isn't it true that you were paid $3,000 every month after the murder? No, sir. Isn't it true that you told Charlie Adelson that a terrible thing had happened? Your friend got an idea to do this. You didn't know anything about it, but you would help him. Repeat that question, sir. Isn't it true that you told Charlie Adelson that a friend of yours had done this, that you had talked no, too sir. much, but that you would do everything you could to help Charlie Adelson? No, sir. Isn't it true that you told him that if he ever went to the police, these people would do to him and his family what they had done to Professor Markell? No, sir. If the state proves that for the next 20 months you received payments, does the state have it wrong? that I received payments. For the next 20 months after July 18th, if the state proves, I'm, they're gonna bring up a financial person who's yes. gonna show cash payments. When the state proves that, yes. do they have it wrong? No, because I deposited throughout every month. The payments that Charlie were making to you? No, what Sigfredo had given to me.
Is it true that you were the mastermind behind Professor Markell's murder? No, sir. That was Charlie. I I'm sure it was. I didn't have any information on Mr. Markell. Do not volunteer information. Yes. Wait for a question. Respond accordingly to the question. I'm but, sorry, Your Honor. By the way, on these wires that we're going to hear, you're repeatedly lying to Charlie, right? Repeatedly lying about what? Well, you're telling him that you're calling the undercover number, right? Yes, I lied to you him. You never called the undercover number? No, because I was telling Sigfredo to call that number. Ma'am, let me ask the questions. I'm asking. I know you have an agenda, but let me ask the questions. Objection, move to strike, argumentative. Sustained. Move to the jury to disregard the last comment about any agendas, please continue. On those wires, you tell Charlie Adelson that you've called the undercover number, don't you? Yes, I said that. And you never called the undercover number? Of course, why would I call it? You tell Charlie Adelson that you tried to call the number, but it's a non-working number. Do you recall saying that? I believe so, yes. And that was a lie? Yes, we were all lying to each other. You call, judge, Responding to your question, you don't have to like the answer. I actually love it. You never lied to Secreto on those wires, did you? Yes, I did. When did you lie to Secreto on those wires? Well, he was lying to me, actually. I asked a different question. When did you lie to Secreto on those wi li wires? No, Give me no. one example of lying to Secreto. You're right. I'm, st I'm stating that Secreto was lying to me. Ms. McVander, I'm going to ask the question one more time. No, I didn't lie to Sigfredo. You never once lied to Sigfredo Garcia on those wires. Not that I can recall, no. But you repeatedly lied to Charlie Adelson on those wires, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. By the way, you and Sigfredo Garcia talked about how you needed to get a burner phone, right? No, Sigfredo was the one who got the burner phones. Okay. You and Sigfredo got burner phones, right? Sigfredo bought the burner phones, yes. And you used a burner phone, right? Yes, he advised me to do so. Did you ever talk to Charlie Adelson about getting a burner phone? Mm, I wasn't aware, but I think I thought he had one. You told Charlie Adelson that Sigfredo Garcia left a voicemail for the undercover. You recall telling him that? I believe so, yes. That was a lie, right? I believe Sigfredo did leave a voicemail to the undercover. You think he did or you think they just heard about the voicemail, that he actually never called the undercover? If he said he did, he probably did. Now, shortly after the murder, you and Charlie break up, right? Yes, sir. Like immediately after? I don't know if it's immediately after, but we stopped, you know, hanging out as much. Now, you keep on saying that the state hasn't promised you anything, right? Yes, sir. But you're hoping that they're going to help you, right? Of course. I want to see my children again. Looks like it's coming to closer the cross examination. Rashwam had a loud voice. He seemed to be angry, have a little emotional anger there, Direct which I think can be off-putting to your thumb on the jury. You do want to have a defense attorney robustly cross-examining the state's evidence. I mean, that's part of what our constitution is about. So, um, and she, she is a liar, and she has lied many times. So that's the kind of stuff you'd expect. And um, I just with the text message exhibit that the defense showed you. but is this text showing that the defendant found out about Sigfredo in November or that Sigfredo found out about the defendant in November?
from the text messages, it's it's that Sigfredo found out about um, Charlie. All right. The job in this case, there's some question about, is it to harm, is it to rough up, is it to kill? What, what was the job? It was to kill. And you knew it was to kill? Those exact words weren't mentioned, but Did you yes. know that this was going to result in a death? Yes, ma'am. Not a roughing up? Yes, ma'am. And I know you don't, do you know precisely when you found out it was going to be a death? No, ma'am. But can you tell us, Jerry, it was definitely before the murder? Before July. And did Charlie Adelson know it was a murder? Yes, ma'am, he did. Did Sigfredo Garcia know it was a murder? Yes, ma'am, he did. No further questions. You may step down. Will the witness be recalled at any point? Judge, I would ask that she remain under the rule. Well, please approach. All right, I agree with the strategy that um, would have what Georgia did beat her up a little bit in the beginning. I didn't think Georgia did enough of it. Um, and I would have gone into all the lies, like all the different lie time frames, like the proffers and stuff like that. Georgia didn't talk about that. So I, as a prosecutor, I, I think it's good to attack somebody and to show some, show some um, anger and be in their face to say, you lied here, you lied there, you didn't tell the truth this time, you lied for three hours here, and you know, really grill them like that. And then when it's, um, when it's time to get over all the lies and say, well, let's talk about how you got up to this crazy point in your life, and then sort of lay out who they are, where they're from, develop their character and their persona more, like, we don't know where she grew up. We don't know her education. We don't know anything about her. Um, Georgia didn't even bring up the fact that she has two kids, if I remember correctly. So you got to try to humanize any particular client, especially when they got a baggage Boy, like that. So that's what I would have liked to see done. Mail but mail nevertheless, I think. So the jury's going out, and it looks like they're taking a lunch break. So it's uh, 11.38 Eastern time there. We'll take a five-minute recess. Yeah, so a lot of the details, like how, like somebody's saying here, the, how the plan happened, what was said, when. We also didn't really get clarity on what was said there at the when they got the cash how did charlie react what did he tell her what they say had half the dan because keep in mind um i guess she got the cash the next day but that evening dan has still not been killed yet he he was alive until like 1 30 the next day in the morning early morning hours so at that point was um you know was he going to come back and survive i guess maybe he was he had heard it he wasn't survivable based on what uh, wendy had told him but in the end, um, you know, what was his reaction? What time frame? I'd have been really weren't trying to zero on the time frame and all that happened as well, because um, keep in mind, Wendy was there being interviewed at law enforcement until eight something that night. So it'd be curious to see what um, what time frame that she did actually come over and uh, what they heard about. So anyway, those are the kind of things I'm looking for. But um, so any of you that are cringing for Katie's um, testimony and the fact that she got caught up in all these lies. I, I think it sounds like you, you cringe worthy. Yes. But in the end, all the evidence has to be played out. I think she didn't get caught in any real big lies here that were intentional. I think some of her memories confused. I think the way the Rashman was questioning her, a lot of those were confusing in and of themselves. So, um, as far as Sigfredo being called as witness, I don't see that happening because he hasn't been uh, interviewed yet by anybody. They did transport him um, from his uh, prison location somewhere in Florida, but that's all that's all we know. He's sitting in Leon County Jail. So if no attorneys talk to him, I think um, I think we don't have uh, any any expectation that he's going to uh, testify. As far as implicating other Adelsons, yeah, I was surprised that she did not talk more about other Adelsons. We also heard that 
there was money, no money that was exchanged to support her defense. So I would ask where the money came from. Um, how did, how did, how did, how was she able to privately afford three attorneys that had to travel to two separate trials, seven and a half hours away. So a lot of these, um, were, uh, kind of details we didn't have. So, um, <clears throat> it's, it's not, uh, it's not crushing for the prosecution not to have this. So it's just the kind of things that have been nicer to, to, uh, have it packaged, having the concrete details of, uh, things that Charlie had said and done or whatnot, but she's been in jail, keep in mind since 2016. So she's not going to have a lot of those kind of, uh, factors. Garcia is not a witness because he's not agreed to cooperate. He's fighting his case on appeal and he's not willing to talk and become a state's witness. So that's why he's not, um, that's not why he's not uh, listed as a witness. Actually he is listed as a witness, but that's why I don't think they're going to call him. So overall, I think, I think it could have gone better for the state if they would laid that all out. But I think, like I say, when the rest of the evidence comes in and they show how um, obsessive controlling Charlie was on the uh, Dolce Vita videotape, which is a restaurant after the bump happened where he, he got with her like the next day and was scrambling to figure out what we do next. And that's where he talked about, you know, having to flee the country if they, if they knew they had evidence on him. And also um, that he was telling Katie, you know, if this, if this guy still poses a problem, they need to look at having Katie kill him um, through some of her hitmen uh, contacts or else Charlie said he'll have to do it as well. So Charlie was definitely in a panic button mode. So if he was uh, extorted over uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars by uh, Katie and her men, then why would, why would he turn around and want to kill somebody over a little uh, $5,000 uh, request or demand? So in any event, um, <clears throat> I think that part of the thing also keep in mind as a prosecutor, you want to, you want to present the truth. Um, and if this is the truth and a witness comes clean, because if she's not called as a witness, then guess what Drosh going to argue? He's going to argue the state was afraid to call her. They know she's such a liar and he's going to create all reasonable doubt because the state hasn't proven that Wendy, uh, is, is, is not a part of this, uh, this, uh, extortion, uh, racket that he's arguing. So in the end, I think, I think it was uh, still the right move to make. It just could have been packaged a little bit better or, or a lot better, depending on how you look at it. Rashbaum, you know, some folks are saying he was uh, too angry to to um, outlandish and stuff like that. I, I think it's more his tone of voice. I don't mind it when an attorney gets loud, but I think your tone of voice has is, is got to be a little bit better than what he did. But uh, like I say, you want to have a you want to have a uh, robust cross examination. That's a constitutional right. And uh, you want to have a good attorney. I mean, I've seen a lot of cases go down. And uh, somebody gets convicted a lot, largely in part because their defense counsel is ineffective. So um, you don't want to see that. And then the case gets busted on appeal. So um, that's my opinion on that. Uh, yes, they are in the same jail, but they have segregation cells. There's a segregation order that the sheriffs would have in place for all the uh, jailers to be aware that um, they have different wings there to uh, be a part of that. So they, they would be separate that way. So um so uh, also, I think that um, one, one of the things that'd be very helpful, I don't know if they're going to bring this up, but uh, I would ask Katie about the fact that if you, if you look at what Fancy Fiction posted about the call between Jim Lewis, the attorney for um, Sigfredo, had indicated on this wiretap phone call that he also was in contact with Charlie's lawyers. So there you see really is how the conspiracy developed. They all locked horns. They all said they're not cooperating and uh, so don't know if the judge would necessarily allow that in because it was uh, under the guise of attorney client privilege. But since those aren't the clients here at this trial, I think it might be able to uh, be presented as uh, showing uh, how these uh, clients um, and co-conspirators are actually linking all their lawyers up together as well. Um, so if you have some comments to post there, uh, Ben. <clears throat> Some of the, uh, the issue on the cash, like how much cash she is receiving and stuff like that. I don't, I don't know what records are going to prove on that. Maybe she doesn't recall on that or whatnot. Maybe Rashbaum's trying to say the more cash she got and the more she's not going to admit to it, that shows it was part of extortion. But I, I just don't see that being credible. This thing, thing about a dinner on the 14th of July, um, don't know where he got that information or I don't, I don't think that's really a big deal. She says she doesn't remember. And, and that's, that's, I think very plausible. So. Um, the, uh, yeah, the details, somebody saying that not enough details on the conspiracy. I, I think it could have gone in more details and also how she trusted him. What was the extent of her relationship with Charlie? Which, how long were they dating? Did, how often did she stay overnight? Did they have split custody with the kids? Was she, 
you know, how much of the day was she hanging around Charlie? How much she became attached to him? All, all these kind of like relationship details were not really gone into by the prosecution, but I, I think in the end, it's still not going to um, matter. I think there's, there's still overwhelming evidence um, to show that there was a conspiracy, and I, I think uh, the uh, jury will, will get that. So, um, yeah, I thought there was going to be more details, definitely more details about um, the interaction between all the parties, not just some of the parties. So, um, but like I say, I think uh, I think they did the right thing still, and in um, calling her and uh, they still got a lot more evidence to present. So um, with that, uh, Ben, if you have any other questions to post, uh, we'll take a lunch break as well. Did Katie know Rivera was uh, going along? Um, that's something that I think I believe she was. And so um, that's, that wasn't clear for a while, but I think somebody cleared that up for um, us in the last month or so on something that developed somebody posted a comment on that so apparently she know she knew he was going along i think the issue was though that charlie didn't know that he was going along so when they said that this you're taking care of these this one hit man but not the other charlie was probably really confused about well the, what do you mean there's a second hit man and he never really grilled um katie about it, and katie played stupid about there being a second hit man to charlie so she was lying to him yeah and that's what she was doing because i think they um she wasn't gonna go back to Charlie and say, well, you know, we actually, we enlisted another hitman because they probably were told to, uh, you know, keep the stories tight and not introduce other people into conspiracy. But those kind of conspiracy details weren't really, um, really brought up well. So I wish that would have happened well. So um, anyway, um, I think those of you saying you're not feeling too good about Katie's testimony. Yeah, the Dolce Vita tapes, that's, that's really gonna, save save the day for the prosecution because if this is just her testimony alone trying to prove a conspiracy then obviously you got you got problems but i think uh this is like another data point that the prosecution can rely on and the jury will go yeah you know what um she was really um she was really foolish for uh trusting um charlie's plan so that's why i would have developed more of the like the interrelationship dynamics why would she trust charlie and um and uh also i would have uh beat her up on the fact that she, you know, did, uh, did lie and left her, could have gotten out right away to help her kids. So it's sort of like she sacrificed her kid to help Sigfredo. So don't understand that, that mentality at all, especially after the first trial, um, almost was a unanimous vote to convict. So anyway, this is a lot of bizarre stuff. And, uh, in, in terms of like bad decisions, horribly bad decisions that adverse adversely affected, uh, a lot of folks, uh, to include children. So um, I think that will be it for now. We'll take a lunch break. So we'll circle back uh, once the trial starts. So thanks for attending.
them in the dreams. States 127. Witness may be seated. Please raise your right hand, ma'am. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do. 
You may take your seat. Please speak loudly and clearly. Good morning. Good morning. Will you tell us your name and spell it for our court reporter, please? Clarissa, C-L-A-R-I-Z-A, Libretto, L-E-B-R-E-D-O. Did you work at the Adelson Institute for a number of years? Yes. About how many years did you work there? Almost 40 years. Okay, and was the Adelson Institute sold about two years ago to another dental practice? Yes. And do you still work at that dental practice yes. that they were sold to? Yes. All right, where was the Adelson Institute located? In Tamarack. Tamarack, about how far is that from Miami? About 30 miles. And is the exact address uh, 7737 University Drive in Tamarack? Yes. All right. Um, the Adelson Institute's a dental, was a dental office, right? Dental office, yes. Okay. The questions I'm going to ask you about the Adelson Institute are about the years from 2013 to 2016, okay? Okay. What was your position at the Adelson Institute during that time? Dental assistant. Okay. And did you ever work the front desk? No. And do you know Har Dr. Harvey Adelson? Yes. And did you know his wife, Donna Adelson? Yes. Did both of them work there uh, during 2013 to 2016? Yes. Okay, and what was, uh, what was Dr. Harvey Adelson's job at the Adelson Institute? He was the dentist. Okay, and was there another dentist that worked there as well? Charlie worked there too. Okay, Charlie Adelson? Yes, Charlie Adelson. All right, and what was Donna Adelson's role at the Adelson Institute? Donna was our office manager. Okay. Um, and how long have you known the Adelson's fam the Adelson family? Forty years, over forty years. So ever since you began working there, it was Adelson Institute even back then. The name changed, but it was always a dental practice. Okay, mm -hmm. and you've known their family for forty years. Yes. All right. Um, in addition to Harvey Adelson, Donna Adelson, and Charlie Adelson. Back from 2013 to 2016, I want to ask you um, about the other people that worked there. Um, what about Erica Johnson? Did she work there during those years? Yes. And what was her role there? She was front desk, and she was Charlie's assistant. Okay. And was there also a hygienist? Yes. And was her name Amy? Yes. Okay. And was that all of the office staff? Yes. Okay, so Donna Adelson, Harvey Adelson, Charlie Adelson, you, Erica Johnson, and Amy the hygienist. Correct. Those were the employees of the Adelson Institute during those years? Yes. What were the Adelson Institute business hours during that time? Hmm. Nine, nine to five, and we had a late night. Okay, was it when... nine to five um, only three days a week? Yes. Was that Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday were the nine to five hours? Yes. Was Wednesday the late night hour? Late night was Wednesday, 11 to seven. 11 to seven, okay. I guess to try to accommodate the people that had a hard time coming during regular business hours? Right, yes. All right, and did the uh, doctors routinely see, the pa see patients on Fridays or on the weekends? Emergencies only. Okay. So that wasn't a routine thing for them no. to do? And Adelson Institute did not have operating hours on Friday or the weekends, correct? No. Now, back during those years, if a patient called Adelson Institute on a Friday or on a weekend, would it be routed to voicemail? Yes. And when y'all came in on Monday morning, would somebody check that answering machine to return the calls of patients? Yes. Who had access to employee records? The Adelson. Okay, so that's not something you would have access no, to? No. And when you say the Adelsons, you mean the Adelsons? Donna that there? and Dr. Adelson. Okay, thank you. Um, did you do you remember two law enforcement officers coming to Adelson Institute back on June 1st of 2016 at about 11 a.m.? Yes. And did they ask you if you were familiar with an employee named Catherine Magbanois? Yes. 
Um, who did you, uh, are you familiar with an employee named Catherine, I'm sorry, with a person named Catherine McDaniel? Yes. Okay, and how do you know Catherine McDaniel? From the office. Okay, from being a patient at the office or yeah. being an employee at the office? No, a patient. Patient. And about how many times did you see her there as a patient? Uh, I believe two or three times. Okay, um, did you provide testimony in another proceeding um, for a co-defendant's case back in May of 2022? Did you provide testimony in a, um, another proceeding in a co-defendant's case back in May of 2022? Yes. Okay. And I'm gonna show you your prior testimony. I'm looking at page 1226, lines six and seven. Mm -hmm. I know it's been quite a while. Looking at those lines when you were asked how many times had she been a patient, did you say once? I said once that day, yes. <laughs> In your 40 years with the Adelson Institute, had you ever seen Catherine McVanwell at Adelson Institute as anything other than a patient? No. When investigators asked you about Catherine McVanwell that day, if you were familiar with her as being an employee there and you said no, who did you refer them to? Which, which employee at Adelson Erica. Institute? Erica. Okay and Erica was um, kind of working front desk at that time? Yes. All right, and then from there on, Erica spoke to the investigators? Yes. How did you get paid by Adelson Institute? The checks. And about how often would you get checks from them? Every two weeks. Had you ever been paid for weeks of work prior to completing your work there? Yes. Um, when that would happen, would it be because the Adelson family was going out of town or going on a vacation for a right. couple of weeks? Right, they were going time? away, they were going on vacation, so we got paid before. About how often would that happen? Two, maybe once or twice a year. Okay, so just once or twice a year. And when that would happen, how many paychecks would you get um, at one time? Two. Two. All right, would you ever get four, five, six paychecks in a row? No. Have you ever been aware of any Adelson Institute employee in the history of your employment there that has worked exclusively by phone or remotely? No. Um, did the Adelson Institute have a cleaning service at that time? Yes. And was it a husband and wife team? Yes. Uh, and have you seen those people before? Had a, yes. Okay. I'm, I know who they are. I you knew know, who they were. Yes. Was Catherine McBanwell part of that team? No. Those are all my questions. Thank you. No question, Your Honor. The witness may step down. Will she be recalled at any point? Uh, no, sir. Have a good day, ma'am. They call Please. Erica Johnson. All right, this is another employee from uh, Adelson Institute. So they're just going to talk about their normal payroll and whether Kitty was um, an employee there at all. Please just keep in right mind, hand, checks came from the Adelson Institute directly to Katie. Testimony you're about to give will be the truth. You may take your seat. 
please clearly and clearly. Good morning. Will you um, introduce yourself and spell your name for the court reporter, please? Erica Johnson. E-R-I-K-A-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Okay, and did you work at the Adelson Institute for a number of years? Yes. For about how long? About 11 years. And were you employed there from uh, 2013 to 2016 during those years? Yes. And what was your job there at that time? Front desk. Okay. Were you also a, kind of worked as an assistant to Charlie Adelson and the front desk? Yes. Um, what were your tasks at the front desk? Making appointments, collecting pay payments. All right. Um, were you the primary person who did that for Adelson Institute? Yes. Um, did Adelson Institute often deal in cash for their services? Sometimes. Uh, would sometimes they offer cash discounts for their, for their dental work? Yes. Back during the time period of 2013 to 2016, um, did Clarissa Labredo, Harvey Adelson, Charlie Adelson, Donna Adelson, and Amy the Hygienist, were those the other employees of Adelson Institute besides yourself? Yes. And were the Adelson Institute business hours Monday through Thursday, kind of regular work hours, nine to five, and then on Wednesdays would be a late day from 11 to seven? Yes. And those were the operating hours, Monday through Thursday of the Adelson Institute? Yes. So back in 2014 to 2016, if a patient called the office and it was closed, would a voicemail that were a, a call, would it go to a voicemail machine? Yes. And would you be responsible for checking that message when you arrived on Monday morning? Yes. All right, I wanna to talk to you about an incident back in June, on June 1st of 2016 at about 11 a.m. Do you remember two law enforcement officers coming to Adelson Institute? Yes. And did they ask you about Catherine Magbanwa? Yes. Were they asking you whether or not Catherine Banwell worked at Adelson Institute? Yes. And did they ask you for employee records related to Catherine McBanwa? Yes. Now, did you have access to her employee records there? No. Um, who at the Adelson Institute had access to employee records? The owners of the business. So the Adelson, okay. Um, meaning Donna, Harvey, or Charlie? Correct. When police asked you for the records, did you call Donna Adelson? No. Or Harvey Adelson? No. Did you call Charlie Adelson? Yes. Okay, and when you called Charlie Adelson to let him know that law enforcement was there and what they were asking about, did you uh, step away from them a little bit to the back of the office to make that call? Yes. Now at the time, did you know that the call was being recorded? No. Have you had an opportunity to listen to that call in prior proceedings and also before court today? Yes. And was it your and Charlie Adelson's voices um, in that call? Yes. From your memory, is it an accurate recording of that conversation that day? Yes. This time I move states 106, the call that um, Erica Johnson made to Charlie Adelson into evidence. Any objection? No objection. States 106 is admitted. Hey, what's going on? Hey, the FBI is here asking for records for Katie. Um, for what? Um, that she that she works here. Um, I would, um, I wouldn't uh, give anything. Yeah, I mean, and they, I don't know. the ex, the ex, did she work there? I was like, yeah, she works here, but I don't know what you want. Because remember Erica, we sent that. Erica, Erica. Yes. Do me a favor. Um, 
I'm not there right now. Uh-huh. And I'm in surgery. Uh-huh. But it's not my office. It's my dad's office. Uh-huh. So I can't give anything out. Right. I mean, you know, I don't have access to it. I don't know where anything is. Okay. So you don't have, you don't have access to anything. So don't I, would, I don't know where anything is either. Yeah. So I would do this. I would not. Um, I would not speak to anybody. Mm-hmm. Um. I mean, you could. I mean, you can do whatever you want. But I don't. It's my dad's office. Yeah. So I don't have access to, to any of that stuff. Okay. So they can talk to my dad and I'm sure they'll be able to get whatever they want from them. Okay. Understandable. So if I, if I had it, I, I mean, listen, you can talk to whoever you want. I shouldn't say they'll talk to anybody. Um, no, you know, I'm going to do whatever you want. Yeah, but anyway. yeah, I mean, no, 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 I mean, I'm not, I shouldn't say don't talk to anyone. <laughs> talk to whoever on the planet you want to talk to, um, but it's not my office, and it's not your office. Right. So you don't have uh, records to give them, and I don't have records to give them, so I'm sure they'll be able to help them out in any way, um, any way they can. Okay, so that's what I'll tell them. Tell them that, yeah, tell them that it's, it's not, I mean, it's not my office. The office was sold back to my dad actually a, right. a long time ago. So tell them that you will, so it's actually you're talking to the wrong Dr. Anderson. Right, right, right. So what you need to do is tell them that you will get in contact. So tell them, uh, I mean, it's not your office. You can't get that question. You know, yeah, they said within 20 days of the Florida, Florida statute, provide above cause uh, with are they, are, they, are they there now or do they just stand They're there, that, but you know, I'm in the back. I'm in the back. They're just waiting for me to come back. Oh, and they want records? Yeah. Do me a, do me a favor. I'm going to call you from a landline on your cell okay. phone, okay? Okay. All right, bye. Bye. We heard you say at the beginning of the call, um, you're referencing Katie. When you said Katie, were you talking about Catherine Magbanois? Yes. And how did you know Catherine Magbanois? She was a patient at the office and his girlfriend. Okay. A patient at Adelson Institute and Charlie Adelson's girlfriend? Yes. Had you ever seen Catherine Magbanois work at Adelson Institute? No. Did Adelson Institute have a cleaning service that came? (laughs) Yes. And was it a husband and wife team that cleaned the office? Yes. And was Kate, Kate, um, Catherine McBanwell part of that husband and wife team? No. Were you on yearly salary or paid by the hour at Adelson Institute? Hourly. And would you get paid every two weeks? Yes. At that time, were your checks around $589 every two weeks for about 28 hours a week? Yes. Would you ever get paid for weeks of work in advance? Yes. And when would that occur? What was going on for that to occur? They would go on vacation. Okay, and when that would happen, when they would go on vacation, would you sometimes get two checks at a time? Yes. Would you ever get four, five, six checks at a time? Not that I can remember. Were you aware of any Charlie Adelson's girlfriends being on the payroll at Adelson Institute? No. Was Donna Adelson the person that took care of payroll? Yes. Had you ever been aware of any employee in the history of Adelson Institute that worked exclusively by phone or remotely? No. That's all I have, thank you. Cross-examination. Very, very briefly. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. At the time of that call, Charlie Adelson didn't own the office, correct? Correct. And the reason why you called him is because his parents, Harvey was out of, and Harvey and Donna were out of town, right? Yes. 
the reason why you went to the back of the office when they came is because there were patients in the office, right? Correct. And you were nervous about this all going on with patients in the office, right? Absolutely. And Charlie, when he called you back, that was his big concern, right? The patients yes. being in the office, right? When he called you back, was there anything crazy that he told you? I don't know nothing. Now, there's been talk about this answering machine. It was like an old fashioned type of answering machine, right? The other ones, a voicemail, yes. And on the answering machine, Harvey Adelson would give his name and cell phone number for an emergency, right? Correct. By the way, Charlie Adelson, he only worked at the Adelson Institute maybe one, maybe two times a month, right? Yes. And when he would work there, he'd work mostly with you, right? Yes. You liked working with him, right? Loved. And uh, you'd work late at night? Yes. And sometimes you'd go out to dinner late at night after, right? Yes. By the way, you say you loved working with Charlie Adelson. Uh, did you continue to work with him after the allegations in this case? Yes. Did you ever worry about working with him? No. Stay. You disregard the last answer to that question. Please move on. You continued to work with him until he got arrested, correct? Correct. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Rearrest examination. So at one point, Adelson Institute was sold to Charlie Adelson and then sold back to uh, Harvey Adelson, right? I think so. But Charlie Adelson still worked as a dentist there, right? Yes. At the, his family's dental practice? Yes. And he also worked as a traveling periodontist, correct? Yes. Okay. Just a second. Do you remember previously saying that you didn't remember what happened when he called you back on the landline? Um, I don't remember. Okay, that's all. Will Ms. Johnson be recalled at any point or is she released? I oh, know she can be released. She can be released, Your Honor. Have a good day. Members of the jury, we're going to take our lunch break at this point. Once again, I'm going to remind you of the thing that I always do. Do not discuss the case with each other or anyone else. Do not watch any news coverage. Do not seek out any information concerning this matter. We are going to resume with the trial at 1.45. Please report back by 1.30. Okay, uh, sorry about that, folks that were listening. And uh, I thought we were on a lunch break. We didn't hear any clarity, just went to no sound. And um, the uh, screen showed their logo. So I, w I was uh, under the pressure when we went to lunch. So I'm sorry if you uh, took a lunch. Sounds like a, like a nervous person uh, with something to hide when that came on. So in any event, uh, do we have no sound? It's back now. Okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> what um, what I said, though, was uh, these, these uh, sorry, I thought we were going to lunch break. We didn't hear any instructions. And then when the uh, court logo showed up there, I assumed we were on lunch break because it was right about noon. So um, anyway, I, so do we still have sound? We ben, should clarify. Okay, maybe there's a late. Uh, there's a switch comment. that was off. 
Okay, so um, in any event, the uh, I thought this was this is important because what jury is uh, jury's always looking at is how is the defendant acting? If they really scrutinize the words, his body language. Keep in mind, he's looking very comfortable. He's laughing. He's smirking. He's, he's uh, his eyes are bouncing around at different times. So you see how it's different for each particular witness um, that's testified there. And um, I, I think Charlie looking comfortable is is not a good sign. And me as a defense lawyer, I would never want my client looking comfortable when they're facing murder char charges with life law parole. So Charlie looking comfortable there. It's sort of like he's used to lawyers fixing stuff for him. So I think that's what uh, is sort of his mindset. He's got really um, not a whole lot to worry about. And I think when the, the more damaging information against him, I think normally he does cover his hand over his mouth. And then when he thinks that uh, Rashbaum is winning over the jury on some points, then you notice he try, tries to take it away sometimes. So in any event, you still sort of notice that behavior of his. So um, yes, if you could, uh, you just come back. They're, they're having a longer lunch break right now. So right now there's it's uh, 12th. 28 Eastern time and they're coming back at 145. So they actually have over an hour and 15 minutes of a, a break. So um, what um, now there's no, I don't, I don't see any possibility that they're, uh, I mean, it could be possible, but I don't see that being a realistic possibility that his parents could be paying off a, a juror. Um, I, I think that usually uh, is a really rare kind of thing. It's more like with a true mafia type uh, situation. And uh, so I, I think we got a good jury here from what I'm hearing about it. I think they're gonna do the right thing. And um, I think that they're gonna be um, pretty much, um, pretty much uh, keying in on all these little details and coming to the same conclusion that, you know, Katie did not give us not much information as we wanted, but she did tell the truth, I think overall. And I just don't know more of the conversation. I was thinking also that would have been really interesting is, uh, so she shows up there to Charlie's house. What was the conversation? We didn't really hear a lot of detail about that. And why didn't she get paid then? Think about it. Why didn't she get paid the day Dan Markell was shot? Because he wasn't killed yet. That's why she had to wait until the next day to get the money because he didn't get he didn't die from the uh, gunshots until the next morning at 1.30 roughly in the morning. So that's why... He wasn't going to pay her if the job wasn't done. If he survived and whatnot, he's holding out money. So I, I, that's what I would have, you know, wanted to know um, if um, if I was questioning her, those kind of details. So anyway, like I said, I think they got enough, and uh, I'm, I don't think it's anything to have consternation or worry about if you're on uh, justice for the Mark Hills. So, and uh, yeah, you think uh, Charlie seems confident? Well, that confident I think is very misplaced, and I think. Uh, the government's going to continue to build their case and uh it will be something that he's gonna um you know eventually find out in the end here the jury is not um picking up on his uh his uh actions and taking it in a good way the way charlie probably thinks of it so his body language is not good i would say for a, a defendant so um yeah till the 19th you're right so that he got uh he had the hitmen show up at his uh, garage there and they, they shot him twice in the head on the 18th. And that was around 11 o'clock in the morning. And he survived um, for over like 13 and a half hours. So um, just think how terrible that suffering would have been for him. So um, in any event, uh, I think I think the timing of it, the fact she didn't get paid till the next day, even though the fact she rushed over there, think about it, Katie's gonna be so anxious to get money for the hit to spit go go off and uh, split it up with the uh, hitman. But she got denied any money at all that night. And she had to wait till the next day. Why? Because Dan, Dan hadn't been killed yet. So um, in any event, um, yeah, what what kind of conversations? Why Charlie was waving a gun around? I mean, I, I don't really understand a lot of the backdrop for that. Uh, but uh, anyway, I think I'm uh, said enough about that. As far as the actual payment from attorneys, how was her attorneys paid for? That's what we still don't know. Uh, there's a lot of people that suspect it. Um, why would she not take the immunity deal? And if she had three lawyers fighting for her, how that all happens? I mean, I, I think that's like one of the worst case of a great deal that gets um, mucked up and messed up really bad for a client when you had that on the table. And uh, so she's trying to save Sigfredo. Well, maybe Sigfredo needs, if Sigfredo would have flipped and he's a trigger puller, they probably would have given him 20 years. 
or maybe 30 years, like um, uh, because he's actual trigger pull, they probably would have offered him a higher amount than what they offered uh, Luis Rivera, is my guess. So anyway, none, none of it makes sense. And it's sort of like, um, it's just frustrating to see um, lawyers not bashing some heads around on some clients that are making really bad decisions. So that, that's really what's frustrating me about it. So um, in any event, uh, is Kenny going to get resentenced? Oh, that's a good question, you Chris, Holly. Um, so in, in Florida and different states, um, I, I'm not going to specifically talk about Florida per se, but I imagine the way it is like in federal court um, and up many other states, but the, the way they work it is if she doesn't have a deal right now on the table, there are provisions under state law where a defendant um, can have their sentence reassessed if they provide substantial assistance to the prosecution of another co-defendant or another unrelated case as well. It doesn't have to be a co-defendant of the same crime. So um, I, I imagine that's what probably is going to be her best chance to get away from life without parole is if the government does uh, provide a motion after she testifies here. And they may wait until after she testifies in uh, potential other Adelson's uh, charges as well, uh, their trials as well. So I think it's probably going to be at the end of uh, what they what they see happening and keep in mind I think a very strong motivation for Charlie is um, assuming and, and expecting that he's going to be convicted of these charges he, it's probably going to take him a few months before it sinks in on what his uh, rest of his life is going to be so I I would be surprised um, if uh, he doesn't try to then flip on Wendy and try to cut a deal to save his parents so that could also be a possibility I, I would say that uh, the Adelsons think they got Charlie on their side, and he's never going to uh, flip on them. But I think that, uh, you know, that that really remains to be seen. And I think the horrific uh, prison conditions and, and uh, likely extortions that Charlie's going to be facing are, are really going to change their whole living dynamics uh, in, in a really radical fashion, much more than just facing the trial and having to pay all these attorneys and expert um, jury selection folks and whatnot. So I think. Um, um, there's a lot, a lot of stuff we don't know about those kind of details. We probably won't know more about those kind of details because of the fact that, uh, Katie wasn't asked that, but, you know, keep in mind also that Katie could have not been informed of where the money came from. Right. So, um, they probably, if, if there was money being, uh, funneled, um, to her lawyers that were, weren't from family members of Katie, then, um, they could have kept that a secret from her. We don't know. We don't, so we don't. Um, know if she really does know the true answer to that or but I'm I just be curious to see where did she think the money was coming from right and uh, and so for her attorneys to have um, all their fees paid for the way um, they were able to show up for two trials at, at a courtroom seven and a half hours away all the logistical expense for that think about the cases uh, the two trials in and on themselves I mean you pretty much have to shut down your law office practice just to focus on this case so there, that's a lot of money you'd want to have um, as a, as a um, attorney fee to cover this case. So I would say also the, um, the fact is we don't know when, um, when exactly um, they came and, and they pretty much cut sling load on her when uh, she doesn't have an attorney now. And I do recall seeing something about Lacoste. Uh, Crystal Coster, one of her uh, co-counsel with Tara Kawas, was um, up there with her shortly after the trial and uh, wanting to apparently talk then. And that must have been the time she was uh, lying about that uh, Rashbaum was indicating when she had the proffer and wasn't coming clean on that initially. But um, And also, what, what other conversations she had with Charlie? I mean, I don't... So aside from the, uh, the day of the, the gunshots... Uh, what what happened in the days after that and how how was she getting the money where did she show up to get it all those kind of details we really just don't know so that's that it is disappointing but i i think it's um it's, i think it's going to help carry the day um when do i think donna and harvey will be arrested um i think they're going to um do that sometime after this trial maybe they'll wait a few months to see if charlie wants to flip and change his mind um but i think it's going to be coming uh, much sooner than uh, much later, and uh, I think it's uh, I think it's uh, probably the uh, big elephant in the room. Like, who else is going to be uh, arrested once his trial leaves? Um, and Charlie's Charlie's held off to state prison, and uh, it's just really going to be. Um, I think it's going to be a really 
Um, there's going to be a lot of twists and turns, a lot of exciting things going on. So who know, who would have thought that Katie's going to testify? You know, most people um, from the uh, legal community said that they would never do this. This is going to really backfire in the prosecution. But I, like I say, if they didn't call her based on this defense theory, then you, you pretty much got it where you got nothing to, to counter what Charlie's going to say. So might as well get it out in the open. Let the jury assess what uh, Katie's credibility is. And I think she became, I think she was telling the truth as best she knew it. Um, and if she would have been asked more open-ended questions instead of leading questions, I think we'd have seen more of her personality develop. But under the circumstances that came out, I think, um, I think it came, uh, I think it, uh, came out well enough given what they had to work with. And so I'm, I'm not concerned about them uh, getting a conviction because they also, like I say, have the Dolce Vita that's going to really show the dynamics and interplay between her and Charlie. So, um, so yeah, this uh, if it's a, if they get a conviction here, it, I think it will help her con, uh, credibility for future trials. And I think the more that they're, like they're going to uh, want to retry basically Charlie again, just like they're showing all this evidence against Donna and Wendy. So it's really showing like it's a family affair. And yeah, it could be about up to two million dollars for um, for the trials for um, for Charlie. And when you th stop to think about all the money they've already spent on the custody battles against Dan. And then um, also John Laurel being hired and him coming down. I mean, his, his fees are probably um, to do this, probably like 800 bucks an hour and whatnot. And he stayed overnight. He was there for almost, I'd say probably at least two days. So, and then he probably had some prep time. There's probably conversations going on between him and Roshbaum. So there's a lot of detail uh, work that he would have done to prep her as well um, that uh, would have generated a huge amount of legal fees. And then keep in mind also, Charlie, um, with a conviction, he's got to find a, a private attorney to, to then represent him on appeal. So that's probably another, you know, maybe 750000 or something like that. So uh, don't know exactly who they'll charge and what it'll amount to. But um, so, um, yeah, that's that's what I, I thought about. Um, no matter who paid for the money um, for her attorneys, I, I just think it's really, um, if it came from family, then think about it she had no family members in the back there behind her supporting her just like charlie has no family members no friends of his supporting him neither did katie for her two trials so if the families had the big bucks if they had um a million plus dollars to pay for a couple trials um don't know the exact amount it had been for but uh yeah it's just sort of sort of uh makes you wonder um why that wasn't asked but um but yeah they could very well be uh broke um donna and harvey having to pay for all these uh, legal fees and if they uh charge donna you know an attorney's going to want to ch charge a whole lot for her as well and uh i imagine they wouldn't probably go to trial with donna i think donna and harvey probably cut a deal and flip on um flip on uh flip on uh, i don't know who because the Char charlie's already going to be convicted and I, I don't think they'd do it for wendy but um yeah it's pretty um pretty interesting how that'll come out but I think Charlie's going to be the one that's going to want to flip and then maybe I'll do a, an agreement to have all the family flip in exchange for limiting the amount of um damage that uh and sentence that Wendy would have to serve and and uh the mom and dad so can't Sigfredo testify regarding regardless of a deposition um yeah he could but if we don't know what he's going to say and his lawyers are not letting him talk then you're not going to call somebody the witness stand if if you have no idea what they're going to call, normally a prosecutor wouldn't do that. I mean, here I think it'd be, maybe he would lie and say he framed Sigfredo just to stick to the government if he's mad or something like that. So you you don't want to ever have somebody like that just um, willy-nilly not, where you don't have a previous statement from them, uh, probably be testifying like that. So he's sort of a wild card that way. And um, so, all right. Um, So Sigfredo would be worthless on the sand. Well, we don't have ten, any testimony from him previous. And so he did not really have any uh, much direction and conversation with Charlie and committing the hit. So I think his value added is a lot less. I think the key key person here was Katie more so because that she was the go between between the two folks. And so that's why I think it was um, that was the benefit of calling her. At least the jury got to assess her credibility, got to assess her truthfulness. And um, so I think that's uh, that's going to be working out fine for the uh, prosecutors. So um, in any event, so I, is there any other questions, Ben, you want to provide uh, before we go to lunch break ourselves? Um, I don't see any recent questions right now that haven't already been answered. 
So if anybody okay. has any more questions or if we want to go break for lunch. Okay, let's take a lunch break now. And uh, I, I think I said that, maybe said that wrong. He said that jury's going to, we're going to start at quarter till 145, but he had him, he told them to be back at 1230. So maybe they'll start yeah. early. So let's go ahead and start at 1230. Okay. All right. So, um, all right, we'll, we'll see you all back here in a little bit.
All right, you're good. Okay. Good afternoon. Sorry for those of you that went to uh, what I thought was a lunch break and came back to find out we're on a lunch break at that time. I didn't realize that they were on a short break right before um, like 10 to noon. They went on a 15 minute break. So I apologize for misleading you guys inadvertently. But um, <clears throat> in any event, um, I think the uh, the interesting thing to note, I think besides the, uh, the uh, I, I mentioned about the lack of details of the relationship that Georgia should have I thought brought out on the on the uh, testimony through Katie, um, but what also Rashmam never brought out was the details of how the supposed extortion happened. Right, so I, I don't recall really anything that stood out of how he was a, actually able to put a glove on her and how um, she was able to extort him. And I think her personality is such that if you had an easy immunity deal, get out of jail free, you're not even going to spend another day in jail and just sit there and, and think that you're going to save you something better for uh, Sigfredo not to have to be prosecuted or something by lying uh, through your teeth so bad like that. I, I just think it shows she's not very making what vice choices, has a history of making bad choices. And um, and uh, I think that's gonna also play in the fact that, um, um, like John said, he talked to, uh, I talked to him at break and he said that, you know, he thinks the jurors are sort of being um, tired of, of Rosh's, uh, Rashman's cross-examination because it's sort of like badgering and coming across too loud and things like that. And I, I think also that can happen with jurors too, where they think, you know what, all right, you're beating the dead horse. We've heard 150 million times she lied. All right, we'll get to something else that's that's uh, besides that point. So um, in any event, I think that, uh, so I think, it, you know, for whatever the prosecution didn't get out of, of details, think about Rashma, all he really talked about was her lies. He, and I don't really, I don't really, have anything that sticks out in my mind where he was really able to score a point that, sh that describes how her scheme was, who she talked to, how she pulled it off, none of those kind of things. So he's really left with Charlie just making some stories of how um, he was supposedly extorted through Wendy. But like we say, the Dolce Vita tape is the one that's going to really set the scene on what kind of uh, relationship dynamics there were and who really controlled that relationship. Um, Veronica, you believe that uh, Don is a mastermind, at least the root of root of all the evil of, of this family. Um, I, I do think that, you know, obviously he was doing this to please somebody. Charlie was doing this to please his mom. His mom was highly upset. Think about the, uh, the motion that Dan had filed um, that also had referenced um, that he was asking for supervised visitation. I mean, that, that, that would have gone over extremely, extremely... Um, explosive to the Adelsons, all the Adelsons. And uh, that, that really, I think, upped the ante and, and put in the urgency, the plan to have him killed. It had been talked about since, uh, you know, roughly a year prior, Katie talked about how it happened um, in a conversation uh, around Halloween that Charlie had talked to her about having, does she know anybody that can do damage to other people or worse to that effect? So didn't come right out and say kill, but hurt somebody um, was the kind of effect that she, he was, um, asking her and they were in the beginning of their dating stage. So think about it. Maybe he was dating her just a groomer. So maybe she was being groomed just like, uh, Jeff Lacoste is being groomed, uh, right about the same time. So, um, I, I think the jury's going to see through all this. And I think the jury's going to really get it. And, um, if you stop, think about it, she did hold her composure and he never got her in any, you know, contradictory lies and, um, whatnot, like, uh, Wendy had, the pre previous uh, last week. So I, I overall, I think the prosecution is still on track. And um, I haven't heard back from John yet on who we got next here. He doesn't know yet. Yeah, no idea, he says. So um, <clears throat> so we don't we don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, Lily asked Carl what I think about Wendy. I mean, I, I thought she was uh, really a really bad witness uh, for the defense, a good witness for the prosecution, in other words, where I thought her her ability to tell all these lies and, and be calculating about it. And um, she wasn't really able to show a lot of emotional body language. And, and she was trying to control her, her um, visual expressions of when she wasn't telling the truth. However, keep in mind, she was doing stuff like closing her eyes like this before she would answer a question that you knew was a zinger question. So when a witness does that a lot, jurors pick up on that. She was closing her eyes a lot on those zinger type of questions. And uh, the kind of stuff like the Cupid, uh, not not telling the truth about uh, Cupid, and she was uh, cheating on Jeff Lacoste, and Jeff Lacoste then um, calls her out on it, and 
she basically, um, you know, makes it sound like he was, uh, he was being a little jealousy. It was, just, it was just a jealousy issue with him. He was insecure that way or something to that effect. That's how she's trying to make him come across. But uh, she got slammed really good by Georgia on the fact that she actually was um, seeing other men and they did have her email traffic from downloaded from her phone to show she actually was having um, uh, maybe not relationships, but she at least was having contacts behind um, Jeff Lacoste. And think about it, Jeff Lacoste was being told, come on, you know, we got to make plans to move in together. Don't buy this type of car, buy something that can hold, uh, you know, the, the two kids and stuff like that. So um, hotshot guy, yeah. Uh, my brother John uh, said that the jury's getting bored by the cross-examination of Roshbaum. And uh, so they pretty much see it for what it is. Um, I, I called it basically a lot of theatrics by Roshbaum, the way he acted, a lot of emotional stuff. And uh, so, yeah, Johnny thinks uh, as well that the, the uh, jury, jury gets this. They understand that, um, you know, she's got baggage. Katie's got baggage. And uh, um, also the issue about um, I didn't get a chance to ask him. I should have asked him though, but uh, we can later on what they thought about the uh, um, the audio tape. That's the first time the jurors have heard Charlie's voice. And, uh, you know, for him to talk, Johnny used the term cagey. And uh, so him to be all cagey like that, he does not act like he's got nothing to hide on that tape. He's got obviously something to hide very much so. And we know what that is. So um, anyway, he was in control. He was in control of Katie, not the other way around. And the jury, the jury gets that. So, um, so um, any event, we got. Um, we're going to start here in a few more minutes. I, I think overall, let me look over some of my notes here. Oh yeah, the um, I meant I had this written down. I forgot to circle back to it. But somebody had also mentioned this. Remember when? Um, Katie brought up her brother, her, something about her brother when it had to do with attorney's fees. And um, and Roshan right away cut her off. He did not want her talking about, uh, oh, yeah, it had to do with it. Uh, her brother, something about, was, she said something like her brother denied uh, the attempts by Adelson's to pay for attorney fees or something like that. So he got that cut off, and Georgia never brought that up on redirect or what that was about. So I thought when an attorney wants to cut somebody off like that so quick, they know it's a bad, they know it's a bad thing they're going to say for, you, for their case. And so that should have been like a big asterisk mark. Hey, make sure um, that Georgia should have like done that. Hey, make sure to bring that up again. Maybe she didn't know about it. Maybe it wasn't brought out in their questioning, but it was obviously something to do with um, um, Adelson's and, and, the, and the attorney representation, representation issue. And keep in mind, as I just said a little bit, bit ago, one of some of you might have been on break, but, um, Keep in mind also the uh, f phone call that we have from Fancy Fiction that was the uh, right around the time that um, that the uh, hitmen were arrested. Katie was talking to Sigfredo's lawyer, Jim Lewis, down there, and he was mentioning that he was talking to Charlie's attorney as well. So it's sort of like he was letting her know nobody's talking. Everything's quiet. We're not going to cooperate with the government. And that's your best chance to get out of this situation. So why would you be collaborating uh, you know, with, with an attorney that uh, is representative of a Adelson when you were supposed to the hitman extorting and, and Charlie's attorney is telling him, yeah, yeah, Charlie's going to maintain quiet. All the Adelsons are going to maintain quiet and not talk to the police. So I, I thought that was really a key detail. So maybe we'll see that tape admitted in evidence. I, I hope we do. So um, we still got a lot of, uh, we still lot, got a lot of detailed evidence to bring bring out here. We'll probably have the uh, wiretaps here before too long, the Dolce Vita tape from that restaurant. And uh, so I, I think it's going to be a lot of, lot of good information still coming out that's going to definitely help uh, prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt for uh, Charlie Adelson. Um, so I don't, um, what's this question here? I don't think Rashmon's strategy was to counter the prosecution's one by one approach of convictions by going through all or nothing united front all adelson's one shot uh, i'm not sure i understand your question um tornado artist but i i think he's like trying to defend all the adelson's right because i mean he sort of has to from my perspective because if you don't the prosecution's trying to bring up the fact that you know all these other family members were involved so i think it makes sense for the prosecution to do it but it also then makes sense for roshbaum to do it and he's really got nothing to work with right so granted Katie had all these lies, so he's able to make a lot of grandstanding type comments for that. So um, 
I, I think it's all like, like I say, theatrics, and it's not going to do any damage to the government's case. In fact, it helps settle um, the issue once and for all. Was was Katie doing any extorting on Charlie? The obvious answer is from the demeanor, personality, background, and, and, and history of Katie that she's not capable of doing something like that, uh, even if Sigfredo had put it up to her. So I, I think I think the government's totally fine. Um, Okay, this is uh, apparently the financial analyst uh, per Roxanne, thank you. So now they're probably gonna go over the uh, bank records involving Katie specifically. Yeah, this judge is doing an awesome job. He's, he's so likable. He's all, almost like we're straight out of central casting, isn't he? He's such a, has such a great personality, um, makes makes the right rulings, and and has control over the courtrooms, and he doesn't hesitate to uh, shut down um, shut down Rashbaum on his grandstanding and theatrics. can be seated. Please raise your right hand, ma'am. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? You may take your seat. Please speak loudly and clearly. For our court reporter, please. My name is Mary Hull. It's M-A-R-Y-H-U-L-L. -L. Okay. And where do you currently work? I currently work at the Attorney General's office. And where did you work when you became involved in this case back in the summer of 2016? I worked for the Department of Financial Services in the Office of Fiscal Integrity. And what did you do there? I was a financial investigator. What were your duties as a financial investigator there? We um, investigated all fraud, waste, and abuse of all state funds. Can you tell me a little, about, a little bit about your educational background to hold your position? Sure. I hold a Bachelor of Science degree in Finance from Florida State University. I'm also a Certified Fraud Examiner in good standing with the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Okay. And at DFS, were you a financial investigator of economic crime specifically? Yes. Uh, do you have experience in analyzing financial data? I do. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I have 20 years of financial analysis and auditing experience for both the, in, a, uh, in a state level and uh, for the United States Attorney's Office. 
Okay, and what about white collar criminal investigations? Yes, um, I've had 10 years of investigating criminal white collar crime investigations to include money laundering, mortgage fraud, contract fraud, identity theft, and embezzlement. Do you have a specific area of expertise? Yes, my specific area is financial and as um, is it forensic accounting. Forensic accounting. And um, what is forensic accounting? It is a very detailed analysis of financial records and data to be used in a court of law. Have you ever testified in court about your analysis of financial records? Yes. Okay, and about how many times? Um, this would be my 20th time. Okay, and those are all my questions I have as to her expertise in that field, Judge. Defense wish to what dire the witness. No, Your Honor. Is there any challenge to her ability to provide an opinion in forensic accounting? No, Your Honor. Members of the jury, the witness will be permitted to provide you with an opinion in the field of forensic accounting. All right, so you became involved in this case back in 2016. How did you become involved in this case? Um, it was a criminal unit, and I did all the uh, financial analysis for it. Um, I was asked to do an agency assist case. It wasn't my normal contract fraud or state fund fraud, um, but I had the um, skill set that was needed. And what were you asked to do in regards to this case? Uh, to review um, mostly the bank records, but I did review some other records. Okay. I'm going to ask you about all the different things you reviewed. Did you review um, the bank accounts of Harvey Adelson, Donna Adelson, Wendy Adelson, and Charlie Adelson? Yes. Okay. And does that include not only bank accounts, but investment accounts of theirs as well? Yes. Uh, speaking specifically to Charlie Adelson, did you review his Regions bank, his primary bank savings and checking account with Regions um, from the years 2013 to 2016? Yes. And did you also review uh, States 104, what's been marked as States 104, which is uh, the records from his Capital One and, and Amex cards from 2014 to 2016? Yes. And what's been marked and shown to you before court today as 104A, is that a, a printout of one of the pages of those records? Yes. All right, um, I wanna ask you about a few other folks you reviewed records for. Did you review uh, bank account records of Luis Rivera? Yes. And was that one Chase bank account? Yes. Okay, and that's been marked as and shown to defense in the witness of States 97. Were those through for the years um, 20, 2014 and 2015? Yes. All right, for Sigfredo Garcia, did you review two different accounts in this case, savings and checking um, that were from Bank of America? Yes. And were those for the years 2015 and 2016? Yes, that's correct. So that bank account was not established until the year after Dan Markell was killed? Correct. Did he have a bank account, Sigfredo Garcia, we're talking about the year that Dan Markell was killed? An active account was not located for him. Did you also review some employment records for, um, for these gentlemen from Coastal Masonry from the years 2009 to 2014? Yes. Okay, and that's States Exhibit 69. For Catherine McVanwell, looking at States 99 and 100, did you review bank records from Bank of America that would include her savings account and her checking account? Yes. And were those for the years 2013 to 2017? Yes. Okay, and did she also have a, another bank account as well? Yes. Was that with J.P. Morgan Chase? It was. Okay. That's been marked as states 101 and 102. Are those two different numbers because there's also a savings and a checking account for those? That's correct. And were those also from 2013 to 2017? Yes. Did you also review a credit card of hers, a synchrony credit card? Yes. In addition to her bank records, did you review Catherine Ray Banwa's income tax filings for 2013 to 2015? Yes. <laughs> Was that a yes? Yes. Okay. Um, and did you also receive several 
um, records of different businesses. Yes. I want to ask you specifically about States Exhibit 60. Did you review Adelson in, in, an Adelson Institute subpoena response uh, from a subpoena that was sent to them regarding Catherine McVanna's employment? I did. And did that subpoena response, was that from September 2014 to May 2016? Yes. Did you also review State's Exhibit? Just a second. <clears throat> 70, which was um, records from Dr. Rudner's He's a plastic surgeon's his office. Yes. Was that for a breast augmentation for Catherine Magbanois? It was. Did you also review records from Jerome Obed's office, Broward Dermatology, <clears throat> regarding Catherine Magbanois employment from July 2015 to March 2016? Yes. Did you also review States Exhibit 77, which were copies of checks from Edelson Institute to Catherine Magbanois. I did. Did you also review several DHS MV records as well? Yes. All right, let's go through those. Did you review State 68, which was a Lexus uh, titled to Catherine Magbanois? Yes. And what about what's been marked as 72, 73, 74, and 75? DHS MV records for multiple different vehicles for Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera. Yes. All right, and did all of those records from all of those various companies, um, they came with uh, certifications that certified they were legitimate records from those businesses. Is that what those are? Yes, they did. All right, at this time, I would enter all of those records into evidence. So for, um, will do. That's gonna be States Exhibit 68 through 77. Any objection from the defense? No objection here. State 68 through 77 are admitted at this time. Okay. Those are documents and for disks, we have States 97 through 104, and then the printout will be 104A from the Amex records. Any objection as to those records? No objection, Your Honor. They are admitted at this time. <laughs> all right, so all of those records especially the bank records, are those uh, pretty voluminous? Yes. Hundreds and or even thousands of pages at times. Oh, yes. In order to illustrate to the jury your findings in this case, are you going to rely on a summary of the bank records and all of the different records um, that you uh, just told us about? Yes. In addition to looking at those records, did you also look at um, the certain messages from the iCloud of uh, Charlie Adelson um, in your preparation or your work for this case? I did. Okay, and are some of those messages incorporated into the summary? Yes. And is your summary an accurate reflection of those records that you just told us about. It is. At this time, I would move States Exhibit 76 into evidence, which is the summary of the financial records. Any objection to State 76? No objection. Those will be admitted at this time. All right, in State 76, I just want to be clear. We have a paper copy, right? That's yeah. going to be in evidence. I do. But we'll look at it today and on a PowerPoint view for the jury. Okay. Okay. Permission to publish via PowerPoint, Judge? You may.
All right, so I'm gonna ask you about the different records um, that you looked at and you'll tell us what we have here on the screen and all of the records that you told us about though are in evidence if the jury wants to see any more that they'll be back in the deliberation room with them. Okay. So looking at here at the first slide of your summary, what if any vehicles did Luis Rivera acquire after the murder of Dan Markell on July 18th, 2014 per his DHSMV records? Um, he purchased on July 28, 2014, a 2003 Suzuki motorcycle. Okay, and were there any others? Yes, he also purchased on July 31st, 2014, a 1996 Toyota Camry. Okay, and in reviewing the records, was there a picture of the yellow motorcycle um, among his social media information? It was. Okay. And I don't think we were able to find an image of the green Toyota, but is that kind of a, a silhouette of what a green Toyota of that make and year looks like? Yes, it was a sedan. All right. Um, all right, so when you analyze Luis Rivera bank accounts, what did you learn about his banking patterns or banking habits? Um, Luis Rivera had a very unique banking pattern. Um, all his payroll checks were direct deposited, but as soon as they hit his account, he'd pull them all out in cash, virtually all of it but he had auto draft, auto payments set up. So every time an auto payment would come through, it would bounce and he would end up with a bank overdraft charge. So we had a lot of overdraft charges. And where were his paychecks coming from? Uh, coastal Masonry. Okay, so he had a steady job at Coastal Masonry throughout the records that you looked at. He did. And when his paychecks, you said they were direct deposited into his account? Yes. Were those for about five to $600 a week? It was. Okay. And he would pretty much immediately withdraw the money, you say? Yes, he operated mostly in cash. And then would he begin to overdraft after that until his next paycheck? Yes. All right, did the pattern, his banking pattern change after the murder of Dan Markell? It did. All right, how did it change? Um, he no longer pulled out large amounts of cash and leaving his paychecks in there, the auto payments no longer provide caused an overdraft payment. Was the last large cash withdrawal before the murder of Dan Markell just a couple of days before his murder? Yes. <clears throat> When did his normal banking patterns resume again after the murder of Dan Markell? About four months later. All right, what do we see here? Um, this is a graph that shows his banking pattern of the overdrafts. So, and it's split into three, three month segments. So, um, all the red bars will show where he was uh, had an overdraft charge. And then you see that long pattern between the two yellow bars and then a little after that shows there was no overdraft charges. But by November 11th of 2014, his pattern picked back up. So in the three months before the murder from April to July, he had a, a pretty low balance in his bank account, about $65.30 and about 21 different overdraft penalties. Yes. Looking from the first yellow line from the date of the murder to three months after the murder, so mid to end July of October, did he have any overdrafts during that time? No. And for him, did he have a relatively high balance in his bank account of $249.94? Uh, for him it was, yes. Right. In the three to six months after the murder, did he then start to pick up on the overdrafts again? Yes, he did. Okay. And this time the average balance is a little less than it was in the three months preceding it. A little bit, yes. Now during the time when he's not withdrawing money from his bank account or having overdraft fees, could that be indicative of him having another source of cash that's separate from coastal masonry, um, which would be the money coming in from his job? Yes, that indicated to me that he had additional source of cash and he was not having to rely on removing cash from the bank to operate. He liked to operate in cash. 
All right. You said that you looked at the DHSMV records of Sigfredo Garcia. What, if any, vehicles did Sigfredo Garcia acquire after the murder of Dan Markell? On uh, July 26, 2014, he purchased a 1997 Honda Racer, black and yellow. He also purchased on August 22, 2014, uh, 1984 Chevy Monte Carlo in blue. Um, in October of 17, 2014, he also purchased a 2000 Nissan Maxima uh, gold sedan. And um, you mentioned that you analyzed Sigfredo Garcia's bank accounts. What kind of bank records did he have? He had a checking and a savings account. And were those for the time period of June 2015 to July of 2016? It was. And you said before you didn't have any bank records to review of his from the time of the murder because he didn't have any active accounts at that time? None that we could find. Okay, were subpoenas sent to banks that yes. came back indicating closed accounts with no records? Uh, they, they just came back with no response. Okay. All right, you mentioned um, you received coastal masonry records. Um, did you also have coastal masonry records for not only Luis Rivera, who had steady paychecks from there, but also for Sigfredo Garcia? Yes, there was um, some records from there, but he worked very sporadically. Okay, so just a couple of months here, one year, a couple of months there, and the other, another year? No yes. steady paychecks? No steady paychecks. At some point during his bank records, did he or at some point during the years 2013 to 2016, did he begin receiving uh, steady paychecks? Yes, he did. Was that in September of 2015? That sounds right, yes. And did that last up until he was arrested in May of 2016? It was. Where, was, where were those paychecks from? Um, I'd have to refer to my notes. Okay. okay. Uh, he was employed at Rapid Capital Funding. Rapid capital funding? Yes. All right, moving on to Catherine May Banwa. Did she already own a car at the time of Dan Markell's murder? She did. When you looked at the iCloud um, for Charlie Adelson, did you find messages that indicated that Charlie Adelson provided her with some financial assistance for that vehicle? Yes. And in, in the way of repairs? Yes. Okay, looking at this, this first set of text messages, what date are these from? Uh, this one is November 18th, 2014. Okay, and I won't ask you to read all of it and the jury will have these in evidence, but does, on this page, does it say that she needs a loan. She calls him buddy. She says, I need a loan, buddy, because the parts alone are going to be expensive. Um, imagine what it would be if she took it to another mechanic and he said he texted Sully his CC. That's correct. And he said, you'll be fine. I got you. Right. Are his messages, Charlie Adelson's messages in the blue and Catherine Urbano is in the green here? It is. Okay. And then she says, stop paying for shit with a Y on your card? Yes. Looking at the next set, this is in on May 30th of 2015. Yes. He says it's, she, need, she needs to get her timing belt changed. Um, he says bring it to Mazda and he'll take care of it for her in this message. Yes, he does. And in this message, is it him offering to take care of the repairs for her? Yes. Looking at this one on November 18th of 2014, whoop, sorry, I went back up instead of down. <laughs> okay. Looking at the next exchange on November 9th of 2015, she's asking her for credit card authorization. I'm sorry, she's asking him for credit card authorization. He says he'll pay it if he can put it on his credit card. What's the amount? She's telling him, just put 1630. He offers to put 1650 there at the bottom. And then looking at the next page, 
She says it came out to 1620 and says, thanks again, I'll pay you back. That's correct. And then when you compared the timing of these messages on November 10th, 2015, where they seem to be talking about him paying for something for her, what did you find when you looked at his, um, at his Amex credit card? I found the payment to Mazda of North Miami for uh, 1620 and 77 cents. Okay. And in the previous text messages we saw from several months or sometime before, he had been saying, take your car to Mazda. That's and this is also Mazda? That's correct. All right, so did it appear from the iCloud and from other records that at some point in late 2015, uh, Catherine Magbanua got a different car. Yes. Okay, looking here at the message from December 14th of 2015, does Charlie Adelson say that he's gonna cancel the Lexus insurance today? His mom is paying it now, but please go this SAT? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and she's, Catherine McBain was then later saying, you know, I'll take care of it, don't worry. And he says, I already paid it five minutes ago, just chill, you're still the best. That's correct. All right, did you then look at the DHSMV records to see if there was a DHS, or I'm sorry, a Lexus title to Catherine McBain from around this time? I did. All right, and what is this? That's the certificate title for Catherine Mapanua. All right, and does this, I'm gonna try to zoom. All right, the jury will have this in evidence and if you need me to bring the actual title up there for you to see it closer, you can let me know. I, I think I'd see well enough. Did she acquire the vehicle in January of 2016 per this title? Yes. Okay, and what type of vehicle was it? It was a 2001 Lexus four-door sedan in black. Who was the previous owner of the vehicle? Harvey Adelson. And how much did the DHSMV title indicate that it was sold to Catherine Magbanua for? $1,700. Is that there about halfway down the page? Yes, on the right side. Were you able to find any record of payment from Catherine Magbanua for this vehicle? No, I did not. Okay, so no check made out from Magbanua to an Adelson for that amount? No. Was there any matching like cash withdrawal, like a withdrawal for $1,700 from her account? No. Were you able to find any $1,700 deposit into any Adelson accounts for that amount? I did not. Was there a drop in the money that she was receiving from the Adelson Institute at that time to account for um, this car if it had been taken out of her salary? No. Can you insure a vehicle without trans actually transferring the title? I don't believe so. Okay, and we saw that they were talking about the insurance in the prior text message, right? That's right. Do you have to put a sale price or list, list it as a gift when you transfer a title? It, you have to either list a price or list it as a gift. Okay. If you say that it's a sale on the transfer title and not, and not a gift, are you taxed? Yes. Is there a financial benefit of listing like a really low sales price on the title transfer for a vehicle? Yes, it lowers the amount for the registration of the car. Who decides what number goes on the title transfer? It's supposed to be the seller, but most often the, the seller just leaves it blank. So just whoever's submitting it to the tax office then would fill it in? That's correct. If I sold you a car for 3000 but we agreed to put 300 on the title transfer, would we pay less taxes on it? Yes. Um, looking at the iCloud messages between Catherine McVanawa and Charlie Adelson, did it appear that Charlie Adelson pro provided other financial assistance or gifts or favors for Catherine McVanawa? Yes. Who 
Okay, what do we see here? Okay, this is on March 6, 2015. Um, it's from his Charlie's Delta uh, Sky Miles account, um, showing a purchase of a ticket to Santa Domingo for Catherine McBanua. Okay, and do you see Catherine McBanua's name there under passenger name? Yes. Santa Domingo, is that in Dominican Republic? It is. And what were the what was the price of these tickets for with Spirit Airlines to Santa uh, Domingo? Nine hundred seventy dollars and seventy four cents. All right, looking at messages from the iCloud on October nineteenth of twenty fifteen. Does Catherine McBanwa ask, say to him, hey, don't you have a hookup with plane tickets? I want to leave for Thanksgiving and take my mom. It's her 60th on November 9th. Um, and then there at the bottom, Charlie Adelson asked, where do you want to take your mom? Yes. Okay, looking at this conversation that continues on the next page. She says, I want to do something for my mom. Let me see if she has days off on Thanksgiving. She thinks about renting an RV. Um, and then about halfway down the page, Charlie Adelson volunteers to get a cruise for her and her mom. That's correct. And then he says, perfect. They have really nice ones that you guys can leave on a Friday, go to two ports, and come back on Monday morning. You won't miss any work. That's right. All right, and this was October of 2015? Yes. Looking at the continued conversation, he says, okay, so I think it would be super cool for you to go with just you and your mom from Friday to Monday on a Norwegian cruise. It leaves Friday at 4 and gets back Monday at 7. Does that work? And then they talk about where and looking at dates. That's right. Okay. So in that exchange, she mentions wanting to do something nice for her mom. She has the idea of maybe renting an RV, and he offers to take to pay for them to go on a cruise. Yes. On May 20th of 2015, in this exchange, does Catherine McVanua say that she has a shitload of things to pay for and needs a little help because of the kid's tuition. I hate asking. And he says, I will lend you whatever you need. Yes, that's correct. Shortly after this text message exchange in the few days following, did you look at Catherine McVanua's account to see if there was any large um, cash deposit into her account? Yes, I did. She uh, received $1,400 that she put into her um, Chase 7, 7242 account. Okay. So what we have there at the bottom is literally like a, a still shot of her record showing the cash deposit into her account on yeah, May so 26th. That's a snippet of her bank account. Okay. Thank you. So a snippet of that $1,400 deposit. Yes. And in this message, she says she hates asking for the money, and he says he'll lend it to her, whatever she needs. That's right. One second. <clears throat> All right, you mentioned that you looked at Dr. Rudner's um, plastic surgeon's office records. Did Catherine McVanwan have a breast augmentation surgery in October of 2014? Yes, she did. Okay, what do we see here? That is a, a snippet of the payment record for Dr. Raudner. All right, and before tax, what was the cost of the breast augmentation? Uh, it was 4,595. All right, how was this paid? Like how much was it cash, card, check? There was 4,400 paid in cash and 195 paid uh, through her debit card. All right, was that 4,400 paid in cash? Was that 
two separate payments, one of a $4,000 in cash payment and the other one a $400 in cash payment? Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> what percentage of her breast augmentation was paid in cash? 96%. Were there any corresponding withdrawals from any of Catherine Rambano's accounts that would reach $4,400 or even $4,000 no. during that time? Did you add up all her cash withdrawals from that whole year, like January 2014 all the way to October 2014? I did. Okay, and did they total only about a little over $2,000 during that time? That's correct. Okay. So not enough to pay for the 4,400 in cash. Not pulling it from a bank account. All right, now I wanna focus on Catherine Rambanua's bank records. Okay. Based on the records that you reviewed, were you able to ascertain where she may have worked or what businesses she received income from, um, from those bank records? Yes. Okay, what do we see here? Um, what you see is a summary of how much money she got, and I can show for each year from where she was employed. Okay, can you tell us which businesses she received income from and when? Um, sure. You want me to list all the dates? If you would. Okay. Um, Millennium Therapy Services from January 7th, 2013 to July 5th, 2013. Encore Nationwide, January 18, 2013 to December 31st, 2013. CEO Next, LLC, April 1st, 2013 to April 30th, 2013. Sophie Dental Care, May 8th, 2013, July 31st, 2014. The Adelson Institute, October 7th, 2014 to May 17th, 2016, Dr. Obed, July 29th, 2015, and Mar to March 23rd, 2016, Dr. Lopez, July 29th, 2016, October 14th, 2016. Okay, did you review um, employment, re I will, let me ask you, could Quintana Lopez, could she have been a realtor at that time? Um, she may have been. Okay. Um, did you look at the actual employment records, though, from Jerome, for many of these, including Jerome Obed? Jerome's, uh, yes. Okay, was Jerome Obed a dermatologist's office? Yes. Okay, and was there um, a relationship between Charlie Adelson and Jerome Obed? Yes, I believe they were good friends. Okay. Were there messages in the ICOD indicating that Obed was Charlie Adelson's roommate at the time? It, there was. Okay. I want to ask you about some of this income. What do we have here? Um, this is a chart that shows the money that was deposited into her account by her employer in the blocks um, vertically and then, um, I'm sorry, horizontally, and then the months on the bottom from January 23rd to December 16th. Looking at the dates, the date that we see here from the time that the employment begins, was that the date that the check was written or the date that the check was posted to her account? It was the date it hit her account. Okay. So this reflects income from her account from those businesses from the date of the first check, the day it was posted to the date of the last post. That's correct. All right. Now, looking at the, this graph and the date of the murder in this glass graph, which is reflected by the first red line, July 18th, 2014, was she employed um, in the, at the time of the murder or the five six weeks afterwards? No. We see that she received income from the Adelson Institute from October 8th of 2014 through a check dated May 17th, 2016. Was there evidence from Charlie Adelson's iCloud that referenced how or why she began receiving income from the Adelson Institute? There was.
All right. <clears throat> Looking at this message, is this message from June 24th of 2014? It is. So this would have been from bef three or four weeks before the murder of Dan Markell? That's correct. Okay. And in this message, she says, I'm going to need help on the employment info I have to send to DCF for my kids' insurance. I'm sorry, INS. Also, I have to end up moving late. Also, if I have to end up moving later on, I need to show I'm working for you or else I won't be able to get an apartment. And he says, no prob. That's correct. And then about two months after the murder of Dan Markell, she begins receiving checks from the Adelson Institute. She does. In order to rent an apartment, do people sometimes have to show proof of employment so that the um, the apartment complex will rent to them and know that they will reliably pay their rent? That's correct. In order to get public assistance health insurance, do people need to show that they are employed um, but don't make above a certain amount of money? That's right. Did you review checks from Adelson Institute that were deposited into Catherine McDaniel's account? I did. And in what accounts did you find those checks? Um, they mostly went into her checking accounts, but occasionally she put some in her savings. Okay. And they were coming out of Adelson Institute's Regions account? That's right. How many checks total were there from there the Adelson Institute to Catherine McVanois? There was 44 checks. And what do we see here? This is a list of the checks that were paid to her, and um, it shows the date they were posted to her account the date that was written on the check, the check number, the payment, and the memo field. So looking at what's been entered into evidence as State 77, a copy of each check back in front is State 77? Yes. All 44 checks? Yes. Okay. But just for ease of presenting and explaining these checks to the jury, um, you're relying on this summary here, this kind of Excel table summarizing the checks? Yes. Right. Were all of the checks deposited by Catherine McVanwell? They were. Who were all the checks signed by? Donna Adelson. When was the first check issued from Adelson Institute to Catherine McVanwell? The date on the checks was uh, September 17, 2014. Okay, so that was just short of one day, I'm sorry, that was um, about two months from the murder of Dan Markell. That's correct. And how often did Catherine Banner receive checks from Adelson Institute after that? She received two checks a month. Until May of 2016? That's correct. All right, if you could walk us through, here are just an example of three different checks. Um, there's a pointer there in front of you. You might have to make sure it's on uh, up on the ledge. There you go. Okay. What can you tell us about? Well, first of all, I asked you who signed all the checks, and you said Donna Adelson. Can you show us the signature on these checks? Right here. Okay. This so is Donna Sue Adelson. Yeah, that's the. Um, signature line on all of them. And what can you tell us about the memo lines of these checks? The memo line uh, reflects the date she would have worked on each of these checks. Okay, so they reflect kind of like the pay period for that amount? Yes. Okay. I want to go back to our summary, or let me ask you first. The, the memo lines, the date ranges, were these usually about every eight to 10 days? Yes. The range? Go back to our summary. What amount were all of the checks for? Um, all except for the first one were $407.58. So all of them except the first one were for the exact same amount? Correct. And is that what the... Uh, column furthest to the right indicates for each one? Yes. Were some of these checks advance pay? They were. What does that mean? 
that she was actually paid before the end of the time frame of the payment. So she would get the paycheck before the work period was complete? Yes. Or post it before the work period was complete? That's correct. And on the right, does that indicate which ones were advance pay? That's right. <clears throat> were some of these checks sequential? They were. And what does that mean? That they were paid by the same set of checkbooks, checks in a book. Mm -hmm. So they're one, two, and three sequential. Okay. Now, were the ones that were sequential, were they at or around the same date? Um, no, they reflected different dates. <laughs> All right, so when you say they're sequential, the number here at the top of the check? That's right. That would mean that the next check she received, even though it's supposed to be for two weeks later in a different pay period, would be the next number in sequence. That's right. How many sequential checks did Catherine Banwell receive in a row? She had 18. All right, looking at this column furthest to the right, our checks, it appears to be 11, 12, and 13. Were they all sequential? Yes. Okay, so that would be three in a row? Yes. And then looking at checks or i'm sorry the number 28 through 33 those checks that was six sequential checks in a row yes and then looking at 36 through i think it's three up so 36 through 41 was that another six sequential checks in a row it was and then the final three i believe that is were those sequential checks all in a row they were You mentioned earlier that at the time of, or we saw that she received a breast augmentation in um, October of 2014. We saw, was Catherine McVanwell receiving checks at that time from the Adelson Institute? She was. Was there any disruption in her paychecks from October of 2014 when she received a breast augmentation? When she received a breast augmentation, like time where she would have been out of work or recuperating or anything like that? No. Was the amount the same as it was on the other checks except for the first one? It was. What about the time for the trip to Santa Domingo that departed on March 22nd of 2014? Um, was she, did she have any less of a paycheck around that time that might reflect time that she was off or didn't work when she was in another country that week? No. So no decrease of any money she received? None. What other records did you review with respect to her empl uh, employment at Adelson Institute? Um, the only thing I received from the subpoena was uh, a QuickBook summary. Okay. Yeah. And what do we see here? That is a printout from the QuickBook report um, for the Adelson Institute. So this is what y'all received from the Adelson Institute when y'all subpoenaed her employment, or when her uh, employment records were subpoenaed? That's correct. What is a QuickBook printout? It's an accounting software program a lot of businesses use for um, payroll and um, keeping traffic expenses. What time period did the printout cover? Um, this printout covers uh, uh, September 18th, 2014 to March 31st, 2016. What date range did the law, did the law enforcement subpoena request? Uh, the request was for any and all records for her employment. Okay. Were all of the checks that Catherine McManua received reflected on this QuickBooks? No. You said the last check on the QuickBooks was from March 31st of 2016? That's correct. Okay, when looking at her account, how many additional checks were there 
um, after the time, uh, after that time that she was paid by Adelson Institute. She received three additional checks. And when was the last check that she posted according to her bank account? I believe it was May 17th, 2016. Okay, but in May of 2016? Yes. So if Garcia was arrested on May 25th of 2016, um, and the last check to Catherine McVanois per the actual, oops, per the actual checks was written on May 12th of 2016. Um, they stopped pay making payments to her after his arrest on May 25th. It's possible same time frame. What was the total net amount received by Catherine McVanois from Adelson Institute from September of 2014 to May of 2016? It was 17,729, I believe. $17,729? I believe so. Look it up. And did Adelson Institute provide any type of employment application, timesheet, W-2, tax filing, performance valuation, job description, anything like that for Catherine McManwell? No, they did not. Just the, just the QuickBooks? Just the QuickBooks. I want to ask you about the timing of Catherine McVanwell's final Adelson Institute checks. Um, the, are you familiar with what we call the bump in this case? I am. Um, and that was on April 19th of 2016. Looking at the final three checks to Catherine McVanwell that were sequential and not in QuickBooks, was there evidence of a check that was later in sequence that was actually posted in a party's bank account before the bump on April 19th of 2016. Yes, it's the second bar. Harvey deposited a check of 2083 on April 11th, 2016. Okay, and that check was posted to an account, to his account, but it was after Catherine Rangbanoa's last three sequential checks in sequence. That's right. And that would have been before the bump. Correct. All right, did you um, look at Catherine Ragbanwa's bank account to determine what her income source is for um, the year before the murder, the year of the murder, and the two years following the murder, what those were? Yes. Okay, I want you to walk us through each one, one of those. Okay. Looking at 2013, how much did she, how much cash did she deposit that year into her accounts? Uh, $13,035. What percentage of her total income that year then was cash? 23%. Was cash deposits her highest source of income into her account that year? Yes. Looking at 2014, how much cash did she deposit into her account that year? Uh, $46,820. What percentage of her total income was that cash that year into her account? 64%. And was cash deposits her si highest source of income that year? Yes. What does the yellow reflect here? We, saw, we talked about the red, the cash deposits. What does the yellow reflect? It's for the checks that she received that year for Adelson Institute. And the checks that we saw didn't begin being posted to her account from Adelson Institute until October of 2014 that year? That's correct. So this would just be about two months worth of checks? Yes. So when combined with the Adelson Institute income, cash in Adelson Institute money was about 68% of her total income that year into her account? Yes, that's correct. Oops. All right, looking at 2015, how much cash was deposited into her account that year? Um, $26,523.77. And what percentage of her total income was cash deposits? 51%. 
Was cash deposits her highest source of income that year? Yes. And the yellow, does that again represent Adelson Institute in this graph? It does. Okay. And what does the purple represent? Uh, that was paychecks received from uh, Dr. Obed. Okay. Um, and that was Charlie Adelson's friend and roommate? Correct. So looking at her cash and Adelson sources, when combined all of that together, um, it's about 81% of her income is cash Adelson Institute and Jerome Obed paychecks. Correct. Finally, looking two years after the murder in 2016, does she deposit significantly less cash than the last two years that year? Yes. How much cash does she deposit that year? $11,921.33. And that was about 20% of her total income? That's correct. We saw where the last check deposited into her, posted to her account from the Adelson Institute was in May of that year. So in those five months, the 4,890 amount, that was the amount that she received from Adelson Institute just for 2016? Yes. And then um, from Jerome Obed, this reflects the amount uh, deposited into her account from, from him as well? Or yes. from his business? That's correct. All right. What do we see here? Um, this is a different way of reflecting the cash deposits into her account by year. It's a bar chart. Okay. <coughs> so at the bottom, we or we see the pers the um, amount of cash, the, the percentage of cash deposited into her account compared to the total amount of income she received. Correct. All right. And at the top is the actual number as far as cash deposits into her account in a bar graph that reflects that. Right. Which year had the most cash deposits, looking at 2013 in the first column to 2016 in the last column? Uh, 2014. And 2014 was the year of Dan Markell's murder? It was. was 20, in 2014, did she have about three times as much cash deposited into her account as the year before? Yes. And about twice as much as the year after in 2015? Yes. And looking at the graphs below, in 2014 and 2015, her, the, total per, or the percentage of her total amount of income into her account that was cash was 64 and 51 percent compared to the years before and two years after the murder being only 23 and 20 percent? That's correct. All right, what do we see here? This is a chart, the bar chart above shows the amounts um, for the cash deposits, the Adelson Institute and Dr. Obed. And the bottom reflects the percentage of those combined. So looking at cash and income from Adelson related sources, Adelson Institute and Jerome Obed, that was 67 and 81% of her total income in 2014 and 2015, the year after the murder compared to 2013 and 2016 at 23 and 35%. That's correct. You said that 2014 was the year that Catherine Banwa had the most amount of cash deposited into her account. What does this graph represent? So this graph shows cash deposits by month, and each month has a point on the scale on the left, and it's connected by a line, so you can see the, um, the flow. So it's a, a line chart. So in this year with the most amount of cash deposits, 2014, which month of that year was the most cash deposited into her account? It was August of 2014. Okay, and is that reflected by the yellow circle with a one in it? It is. And how much cash was deposited into her account that month? I believe it was $13,200.
And that was the month following the murder of Dan Markell? It was. How does that amount of cash deposited in August um, compare to the other months in 2014? It was the highest of all the months. What were the second, what was the second and third highest cash deposit months in 2014? Uh, the second highest was October of 2014. Okay, and what about the third? Uh, July of 2013, 2014, sorry. Okay, so the third highest was the same month as the murder of Dan Markell? Yes. And the second highest was the same month that the checks from Adelson Institute began being posted to her account and she also received a breast augmentation? Yes. What do we see here? This is um, a another graph showing the cash deposits by month, but this is a bar chart. So the higher the bar, the more cash she would have received. So looking at this 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, this four-year span, um, which month in that four-year span has the most amount of cash deposits? It's the August of 2014. And what about the second highest? The second highest was October 2014. And the third? July 2014. So even looking at that four year span now and not just the year 2014, those are still the three highest from all four years into her account were those three dates we talked about before. Yes, that's correct. What do we see here? This is an overlay of two sets of data. The red line shows her cash deposits by month, and the bars are showing her employment. Okay, and what does the first black line represent? The murder of... Uh, so that was July 18, 2014, that represents the date of the murder? Yes. And then the second black line that says bump on top represents the date of the bump? Yes. April 19th, 2016? Yes. All right, looking at all of the red lines, looking at all the red lines before the date of the murder, what was the amount of cash deposits in those 12 months before the murder? How much cash did she deposit into her account? Uh, one year before she deposited 15,600. And that would be like from July 2013 to June of 2014? That's correct. All right, looking at then in the 12 months following the murder, so from the red line for about the next 12 months, how much cash was, was deposited into her account? She deposited $44,963. So about three times as much as the entire 12 months before the murder? Yes. All right. And then right next to the line that indicates the murder, we see a giant red spike. What does that represent? That re represents the spike of cash that she put in um, between July and August. And looking at now the bar graph around that murder line and the cash spike, is there any record of her being employed during that August cash spike where $13,200 were deposited into her account? No. So no bar during that part. That's right. What about from the day after Dan Markell was murdered, so July 19th to just the end of August, those six weeks, how much was deposited into her account? Uh, $17,300. And then by the end of the next month, by the end of September, she's on the payroll at, at Edelson Institute? Yes, that's correct. You told us earlier that you analyzed the Adelson Institute records. What was the annual income for Adelson Institute, approximately? Um, based, on, based on the records I have, about $2 million. About $2 million a year? Yes. And was that profit? No, I didn't do a profit calculation. OK. 
okay? About how much money did Charlie Adelson make per year? Um, it varied between three and 3.5 million according to his bank records that I had. And that was for each year between 2013 and 2016? For each year, yes. Okay. Did he make money from not only working as a dentist at the Adelson Institute, but also as a traveling periodontist? Yes, he also had some rental income and some land sales, real estate sales. Okay. You mentioned earlier that you looked at the Adelson family bank accounts um, and investment accounts as well. Can you give us an idea of the total amount of money in these investment accounts in the years surrounding this investigation? Um, yes, it's about 4.1 million to 5.8 million at the end. Okay. And you, you mentioned earlier that you also looked at the individual family members' checking and savings account, their business accounts as well. Um, can you tell us what those amounts were yes, when in you, June and July of 2014? Yes, when you um, put all of the 32 accounts together, there was, um, was uh, 8.1 million uh, in July, in June of 2014, and 8.1 million in July of 2014. And that's just money in the bank, right? I mean, that doesn't include real estate, cars, other assets. That's correct. Or um, cash of theirs that they never put in the bank in the first place. Correct. Now, based on your review of the Adelson Institute, did their businesses, um, did their business give cash discounts for services? Yes. Were there records in Charlie Adelson's iCloud where he discusses providing cash discounts for services? There was. Okay. And I won't make you go through every single one of these, but are these messages where they talk about cash discounts for clients, the cash price for different services? Um, they try to give people an incentive to use cash as opposed to a card. It seems so, yes. And were there messages in Charlie, I, Charlie Adelson's iCloud where he and Adelson family members are discussing um, having large amounts of cash? There was. Okay. And they, did they discuss how they keep it, that they keep it in piles or keep it in a safe? They, yes, they kept it in a safe and some reference of piles of cash. Okay, I'm going to show you two different sets of messages. Um, in this one... Harvey Adelson says to Charlie Adelson that he says, Charlie, I spoke to mom. We will take the 26000 in cash. Then sometime later, he seems to change his mind and says, there's no tax advantage for the $26,000 gift. I have, too much, I have too much cash and would rather you have it, you transfer it from your personal account. So... Here they're talking about one gifting the other 26,000 in cash, but then decide against it because they already have too much cash. That's correct. And then in this one, does this appear to be Donna Adelson saying, good morning, Charlie. I need to take 25,000 from your office checkbook, put it into dad's office checkbook in order to break even this month. Can we do that? Do you have enough money in your office account to write that check? If you do, then dad will move 25,000 in cash in the safe into your pile. Please let me know so we can take care of this today. And he says, no problem. That's correct. So they're talking about moving large amounts of cash from one pile, one person's pile to another person's pile in a safe. Seems so, yes. And this safe would be at a place where Donna Adelson and Harvey Adelson are in control of it. I, I believe so. Just a second. That's all I have. Thank you.
try not to break it. And also watch out for those cords because we don't want to have any sound malfunction. Good afternoon, Ms. Hall. Good morning. Good afternoon. You recall that uh, on page two of this exhibit, um, you were asked about Luis Rivera's financials? Yes. And you recall that you were asked whether you saw any spike in cash deposits over time? For Luis Rivera? No. You recall whether you were asked that question? No spike of cash. So you have a spike at the time of the, of the murder. He's not withdrawing cash, correct? Correct. But over time, his habits go back to how they were before, right? Yes. So unlike Katie Magbanawa, you don't see the cash keeping on going up, right? Right. With Luis Rivera, you see essentially a spike in cash and then nothing. Well, the spike was from his direct deposits, but you're essentially correct. He had cash. Yeah. Before, he would take the money out because he had no money. Right. But after the murder, he doesn't take any money out for a while. That's right. But then he runs out of money again. Seems so. So he starts taking it out again. Right. Different than Katie McVanawa, right? Oh, yes. Actually, the complete opposite. Yes, he didn't put money in accounts, apparently, unless he had to. With Katie McVanawa, the money just keeps going forward. Yes. Now, Ms. Dugan showed you some text messages. Do you recall that? Yes. And she showed you text messages regarding some car repairs? Uh, that's right. And uh, on those text messages, Charlie Adelson has no problem whatsoever creating a paper trail and putting those car repairs on his credit card, right? Correct. And in fact, you were able to go to his credit card and see it, right? That's right. Katie McBanawa tells him not to put it on the credit card, right? That's right. And he doesn't listen to her? No. You were asked about Alexis, yes. right? Alexis with, I think, if my eyes don't deceive me, at 160,000 miles? Um, I'll take your word for it. Yes. You want me to show you it? You know, sure. May I approach? You may. Oh yeah, that's very small. Yeah, right. At 160,000 miles? That's correct. And you couldn't find any payment from Catherine Magbanawa for that car, right? I, I could not. Are you aware that Catherine Magbanawa came in here today and insisted that she paid for that car? Uh, no, I didn't know she testified. But you saw no evidence of any payment, right? No. From your forensic analysis, no payment was ever given, correct? Not in, through the bank records. Now, you also talked a little bit about the Adelson Institute checks. That's correct. And uh, you talked about how those checks or the employment began sometime around October of 2014? Yes. And that was approximately two months after Professor Markell's murder? Yes. And the checks 
they were after taxes, right? No, they were, um, there was taxes taken out of it. That's what I mean. Yes. So the, the numbers we see here of $407.58, which every check is except the first one. Right. That's after the taxes were taken out. That's correct. It's a net amount. And the checks were for about two times every month, right? Yes. And so essentially the checks were for around $1,000 a month. Um, yes. And I think you testified that it looked like the checks were given at the same time, a bunch of them. They could have based on being sequential. And that would maybe be because the person giving them didn't want to see the other person that often, right? That'd be one reason? It could be a reason, yes. talk a little bit about the cash increases in her account. Now, you saw a spike in the cash increase. The biggest spike was uh, the month after Professor Markell's murder, correct? Yes. But the cash just kept on coming, right? Uh, yes. And when you do the math, by the year, it seems that she was getting paid in cash around $2,000 a month, right? Um, it varied, but yeah. For the most part, it's right around $2,000 a month, right? Basically, yes. I mean, to a T, right? I mean, let's look at it. I think we have it by year here. If you look at 2015, for example, you have her cash deposits at $26,000 and change, right? Right. 12 months, $2,000 a month, that's $24,000, right? Sure. And in 2016, you have her cash deposits at around just under $12,000 a month, right? That's I mean, correct. sorry, just under $12,000 for the year, right? Yes, correct. And you have those deposits stopping in May. That's right. I'm not great at math, but that's yes. about six months, right? Right. Now, if Ms. Magbanoa had testified today that she never got paid any cash after the first month, according to your forensic analysis, that would be a complete lie, right? Yes, it would. <clears throat> Let me ask you, when you do these graphs, The word murder isn't scientific, right? Correct. It could, equal, it, could, it could easily say extortion as well, correct? I suppose, yes. You talk about these piles and it possibly being a same safe. You, you don't know if all the money was in the same safe, right? No, that's just, they were moved from one pile to another. Couldn't that be not a real pile? What do you mean? Well, parents, when they're leaving things to their kids, if someone lends them money, might they make a notation 
so that they die before paying them back. They would put in their pile that they lent money to them. I, I suppose, but it does reference pile in a cat in a safe. Did you ever see any safe that had piles of cash with different Adelson names on it? No. Have you ever heard of people assigning certain items to their children when they die? Sure. May I have one moment, Your Honor? Okay. talked about that $2,000 of cash every month, remember? Yeah. And if you add that $2,000 of cash every month with the $1,000 of Adelson checks, what would that equal? 3000 Would it surprise you that Catherine Magdanawa was paid $3,000 every month by Charlie Adelson? Would it surprise me? No. In fact, it would be consistent with your forensic analysis, right? Yes. I have no further questions. Free direct examination. Defense counsel asked you about Rivera not having a cash buy. Did Rivera have a habit of depositing cash into his accounts? No, he did not. Um, Did you look at the cash deposits for cash for Catherine McVanwa every day for 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016? Yes. And are all of those spreadsheets also in here in addition to everything that we saw in the PowerPoint? Yes. And does she have a kind of what it seemed the defense was indicating, like a $2,000 payment in cash at one time every month? No, they were always broken up. I think the highest deposit she ever put in was 2000 though. Okay, so in this report, our, each cash deposit she makes by day for every year, and are they all different amounts? Yes. Some as low as $43. <laughs> yes. Some as high as $1,000. Yes. Okay. And so it wasn't a situation where she was coming to the bank every month, one day a month, and putting in $2,000. No. Okay, that was the accumulation of all of the money throughout those years that we saw. That's right. Okay. <clears throat> if she was being just given a one $2,000 payment in cash every month, would it make sense to deposit that or would it make sense to go back to the bank 20 different times that month with $40 and $50 and $600 and $700. Um, what would it, make more sense, it would seem? Well, I think she was trying to hide the fact she was putting in cash and flying under the radar, so she was breaking it up. So I don't right. know what she had to start with, but I just can only show what she was putting in the account in small increments to several accounts, sometimes the same day. Okay. And looking at the cash that she was putting in, could this been, have been cash that she was, well, let me ask you this. Okay, when you looked at the messages from the iCloud, a couple of which we saw, was she asking Charlie Adelson for different favors? Yes. Was she asking Charlie Adelson at time for cash or for loans? Yes. Okay, were these friendly exchanges between the two? Yeah. Was she ever demanding anything from him? No, I don't think so. And were many times he was offering, was he offering to do favors for her or different nice things for her, or yes, provide her with things? They seem to have a good relationship. Defense asks if the, a possible explanation for the sequential checks could be that she 
was getting paid a bunch at a time by someone who didn't want to see her very often. Would another possible explanation be that she wasn't actually working there and someone was just handing her a bunch of checks at a time when they didn't see her? I suppose that's possible too. That's all I have. Is Ms. Hall going to be recalled by other party? Uh, I'm not sure there are any under the rules, and I don't believe so, Judge. You may step down, ma'am. Members of the jury need a break before we continue. Please raise your hand. Right, the bailiff will take you to the jury room. We'll resume with the testimony in 10 minutes. All right, so that was really interesting. A uh, lot of information there on the financials for all the Adelsons, not just Charlie, um, as well as the, uh, the people involved in the murder itself. So I think that this was very helpful to show that uh, Donna was also paying checks, giving the checks of $407 a month. And I'm glad they brought up the clarity that this was actually treated as an employee expense. So they would have actually had this coming off their uh, tax returns as a tax deduction for actually employee uh, expenses. So that right there um, should be tax fraud in and of itself. So not only is he supposedly being extorted, but he's also committing tax fraud as well. So I'm not a tax professional, but it does, it does seem like it's uh, a bogus uh, expense that you try to itemize. So now granted they paid uh, some other taxes on there and whatnot, but in and of itself, you have to be accurate in your tax returns. So you cannot sit there and make it where um, you're retitling stuff and calling it something else, even though the numbers are um, not off or maybe they want to pay more taxes than not putting her on there. The fact is they're giving misleading information to the IRS. So, um, and then to have all that money that uh, Charlie's making three to $3.5 million per year, that's, that's quite of a astronomical amount. So for him to be, then be supposedly uh, blackmailed by someone like Katie, who's not sophisticated at all, it just, it just reeks of uh, uh, ludicrous. And um, I think it's pretty prosperous for that to even be um, argued. But granted, uh, somebody asked here on the questioning comments, is, uh, is it possible that his lawyer knows that this is like a losing defense. And I, I would say absolutely any, any lawyer that would present this kind of defense knows that they're a sinking ship. And so um, it's pretty, it's pretty, um, it's pretty damaging um, for Charlie. Keep in mind all these sequential checks as well. Um, she got 44 checks and a lot of them were se sequential. 18 of them were sequential. That also proves that she never really worked. And um, the, uh, checks started what the biggest dump of cash she got was right after the murder and it continued for two years and so that i think is really um an indicator that she was telling the truth that she was on the payroll as a part of the um uh what charlie owed her for the murder of dan markell and think of the also the conversations like uh that were brought up for this witness that uh, sarah dugan asked her there was no uh, it, threatening words from from um, from Katie to Charlie at all. Charlie was like freely willing to help her out. It's it, the flavor of the conversations that we saw are totally such that Charlie knew he owed her and he need, owed her hush money for her helping out in the murder. There's no other way you could int reasonably interpret that the other way around to say, oh, she was blackmailing him and demanding these things. So um, he owed her and that's, what, that's the flavor and, and nature of what those conversations were about. Let me see if there's any other uh, points I had here. And even, oh yeah, there's here's a good quote uh, by Katie. Um, this would be a good thing in arguments the uh, prosecution could use. Katie was one time quoted as saying, I hate asking for money. So here, does that sound like an extortionist, a blackmailer saying, oh, I hate asking you for money. So that one sentence in and of itself really just reflects the true nature of all this. Um, And then, and then the other key uh, data point to take away from this as a prosecutor, I would say, is what you're looking at is when Sigfredo arrested, then suddenly it stopped. You're telling me that was a coincidence when Sigfredo got arrested? Um, and also, obviously, Luis got arrested, too. I forget how close in time those were. but um, And then you look at all the cash she got as well. So them trying to make this out, she says she didn't get extra cash, the $2,000 extra per month that she says she didn't re recall. 
receiving. That's um, that's uh, you know, maybe maybe she just doesn't remember something. I don't know why she wouldn't, but um, perhaps the prosecutors forgot to ask her that um, when they interviewed her and whatnot. So, in any event, I, I don't think that's really uh hurtful at all to the prosecution's case. If anything, I think it strengthens the fact that she was paid to remain silent. She was on the payroll because they had to pose as her as an employee. Because think about it. If this was really a blackmail, why would she ever have to go on the Adelson payroll? Charlie is washing in all that cash. He would just pay her directly. But if he was that stupid enough to do that, but think about it. Once he starts paying her and giving checks and putting her on the payroll, guess what that would do? Any re reasonable person would realize if this person's extorting me for money and then I give him um, a paper trail to follow me paying this money, then I then it does look like I hired her to kill Dan Markell. So it just it's just so laughable, this this whole defense. It's really ridiculous. Um, yeah, Julia, that's uh, too, absolutely correct. Intelligent jury can see through this. Um, they're, they're just really grasping at straws here. Um, and, uh, and from what I understand, we got a good mix of the jury. It's a good cross section of the community. They're very uh, smart, educated. They're taking good notes. They're paying attention. And they see right through this stuff. I mean, yeah, I was sitting there thinking, yeah, a lot of the stuff is sort of, sort of boring, but it's so in-depth, it was so detailed. And as a prosecutor, you really need to get that out because each juror doesn't necessarily know how the other one's thinking right now, right? They're not gonna, we're, they're not gonna get to discuss this until the very end when it, the case is sent to the jury and they're given uh, instructions and closing arguments. So there's still a lot of stuff that they don't know how much is enough to prove. So they, they wanna go, if there are all those details are there, they need to do that as a prosecutor. So, um, so I think you, you can't, you can't assume it's a, you know, such an easy win and you're just going to go ahead and just streamline it. You can't, you can't cut corners like that. You got to go that level of detail. So I thought it was a great job by Sarah. And, uh, so that's, that was really excellent to see. And, uh, so Roshbaum, um, if you think about it on, I'm, I want to refer back to Katie Roshbaum never once laid out the details of how Katie came, was was basically extorting um, anything to do with uh, Charlie Adelson. How, how was she, how did the conversation happen? How did the, the um, how was he able to push her, uh, push him into that corner to be able to blackmail money? He didn't suggest anything that he had received from Charlie. So for example, if I'm in a case like this, what I, what I would be doing is I get the information from my client. So if my client says, this, this is how I was extorted, then Charlie hasn't testified yet, right? But what I would be doing is peppering her with questions saying, isn't it true you told Charlie X, Y, and Z on such and such a date and time, and you were sitting there at the kitchen table, and you go into all those kind of details that you'd ask your client, and then you bring it out through that witness. So then the jury goes, oh, that's what the defense theory is. But what do we get from Rashbaum here? There was really no explanation of how the supposed threat of extortion and blackmail even occurred. So he's not even attempting to fake it. So um, he's just throwing some, like I say, some loose loose accusations out there, no detailed follow-up and whatnot. So if there's any detail, I mean, that's going to have to come from Charlie now because he failed to do that for uh, Katie. Yeah, if, it's, if this could be designed to run uh, ring up the attorney fees. Uh, I don't know if he's charged a flat fee if it's by an hourly rate. I think I heard it was an hourly uh, flat fee, excuse me. So, um, but I think he's still, you know, trying to fight to do his job as an attorney should, especially because he's, you know, got all this uh, media attention and, and live stream. And so there's going to be a record of what kind of attorney he is. So he's going to try to try to do something to, to fight for the guy if he, um, if he has any uh, common sense about it. <clears throat> Um, yes, I think, um, I was just, uh, I was really thankful that the prosecution had the details of all the Adelson's records. Cause that's what they've been talking about. They've been talking about Katie and they're talking about Wendy. They've been talking about, um, Donna and now they got Harvey's financials on there and Charlie's as well. I mean, the only one they don't have involved in this, all this, uh, cash flow and joint accounts and all that. They didn't flash that up there very much, but you look at all the joint accounts between the parents and their children that that's a little bit odd i thought you got that much money and you're flowing it down to all your kids and stuff like that yeah maybe it's an early uh thing to do instead of uh putting it in your will but um it's just very very much um very much uh really odd i i think uh 
the way they're all in each other's accounts that way. Um, so John says he was impressed with his jury following the back and forth is like watching a tennis match. So, um, yeah, I mean, he, Rashman's not really touched any of these witnesses and drawn on any strong points that I think, um, really nothing that's, uh, really strong for the defense. So I, I think, I think they keep every, with every witness, the defense keeps losing it more and more. The jury's looking at this and they're thinking, yep, this is what, uh, Georgia argued in the beginning is really what's panning out. Um, through the evidence and Rosh bombs not able to lay enough of a glove on on uh, any of these witnesses so I think it will, I think it's going really good for the prosecution um, question Carl do you think Charlie suggested such ludicrous defense to save his family Mary I I think that's very uh, much probably the case because here's the way it works as a defense attorney um, if I'm defending somebody like Charlie I cannot suggest a defense to him um, I can discuss elite, the legalities of a defense, but if a client comes into you and says, look, I didn't do this, this is what they did to me, they extorted me and that kind of stuff, it's not like you can ethically tell them, well, come up with some, let me tell you what would sound better, and then, and then you basically coach the client how to lie on the stand and create a better defense. So even if the defense is much worse as, um, as your client sitting in the office, you cannot make up a defense and 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 uh, tell them what to say. Now, does it happen with defense attorneys? Yeah, I'm sure it does, um, but I don't I don't I don't know. I can't cite you a specific example or anything like that. None of the attorneys I've ever worked with when I was co counsel, um, none of us have done that to to fabricate an entire defense like that. So what it, what's happening really here is um, probably Rashbaum uh, did get that from Charlie. That's his defense, and that way he's not going to put it back on um any any of his family think about how um even the the vinny on court tv talk about how charlie's got to point the finger at somebody in his family because where'd all this money come from somebody had a somebody had to do it instead of charlie it had the money had to come from the adelsons so so i guess the only way to not to point the finger at the adelsons for the uh, getting a wash in this cast is to admit that charlie paid and the reason being is because she was extorting him and him only and so that's why, you know, this whole thing about well, Wendy didn't know about the extortion. Wendy was clueless that uh, she was actually moving closer to the actual killers. And uh, so, and keep in mind, Charlie didn't, um, he wasn't acting scared. And why wouldn't he tell his family if these guys were extorting him? But the bottom line is he would have called the police because he wouldn't have left a paper trail for extortionists to, to put that kind of trail on him. Or all they've got to do if they're ever arrested for the murder is then say, well, look at the money trail. Charlie Adelson hired us. So he's, he's not that stupid. So jury's going to see through all that. So I, I think we're sitting really good here. Um, yeah, I do feel bad for Katie's kids. It's, it's I think I just think she could have gotten out for for um, in full immunity, not even a conviction to her name for taking part of this. That's how willing the state was trying to go after these other Adelsons. And she just would not do that so um and then you go to trial and have three lawyers and all that kind of stuff i would never be a part of that i would i, I believe this if i had a client like katie i would get them totally to flip and i would it would make sense from from a discussion standpoint of why it's in your best interest i would i would bring up the kids i would bring up the fact that she's got zero chance of getting an acquittal and uh it is going to cost you a lot more money so why what are you trying to do um, when, when you're actually going to, everything's going to implode on you and, and actually turn out worse. We're going to be spending a life behind bars. You're not going to see your kids for all these years. So yeah, it's just, it's th the decision-making of these people. is just really bizarre, extremely bizarre. Um, <clears throat> yet, um, I, I do think that, um, yeah, they would have called the police at the bump as well. Yeah, exactly. E company. Um, that, that that's exactly true so look he's he's right ready to kill somebody over five thousand bucks but yet katie he's gonna act all chummy chummy and buddy buddy with her and all that kind of stuff so it's 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 really uh it's really a um a shot in the dark wild crazy story that they're they're coming up with it just has zero credibility um Speaking with, oh, you're okay. Katie Cooley, you're hi. You're speaking with John. Okay, that's cool. Um, so I guess we're going to, we're probably going to be back on here another minute. I'm going to get off here and take my own break a second, and then I'll see you back on in a few minutes.
Ben, are we muted? Hey, Ben, is the courtroom silent? How come it's... Um... It's silent right now. Okay. can be seated except the witness please raise your right hand sergeant hill do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth i do sir you may take your seat thank you sir please introduce yourself and spell your name uh, good afternoon my name is corey hale i'm a sergeant with the tallahassee police department and my name is spelled C-O-R-E-Y-H-A-L-E. -E. How long have you been with TPD? Uh, close to 23 years now. Did you have some involvement in the investigation regarding the death of Dan Markell? I did. As part of the investigation, did you interview a witness by the name of Jeffrey Lacasse? Yes, ma'am. To the extent we can remember Mr. Lacasse's testimony from last week an issue was raised regarding the timeliness of a particular piece of information that he reported to you okay this item relates to the defendant charlie adelson characterizing a dinner out with his sister wendy after the murder as a celebration dinner are you familiar with this item that mr lacasse gave to you yes ma'am all right did mr lacasse mention anything about this celebration dinner during your interview with him? He did. And when did you tell us, I guess, each time that you met with this witness? Um, I met with him uh, pretty early on in the first part of the investigation. Uh, and then during that interview, it was my job to either include or exclude him as a potential suspect in the case. Uh, I'd have to refer to my notes to remember exactly what the date was on that. I was going to prompt you on it. Does July 21st of 2014 sound correct? 
Yes, ma'am. All right, and did Mr. Lacoste come directly to you from somewhere out of town, the airport? I believe so, yes. Okay, and were you able to include or exclude him as a potential suspect in this case? Yes, we well, were. And which was it? Uh, he was excluded as a, as a suspect due to him being in another state at the time. All right, so you were able to look at some documentation to confirm that that's where he was? Yes, ma'am. Uh, his cell phone records as well as his bank records, and we also obtained uh, video footage of him in Tennessee. Okay, and was there a time when Mr. Lacoste reached out to you thinking he might have some more potentially relevant information to provide? Yes. When was that? Uh, that would have been on August 12th. Okay, August 12th is when he reached out or August 12th is when he showed up? He showed up on the 12th. He reached out on the 11th. Okay, so on the 12th, he comes back into where? TPD to talk to you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And during that interview on August 12th, is that when he gave you this information about the celebration dinner? It is. When did he report to you that he learned of this information about the celebration dinner? I want to say it was a week or so prior to him talking to me. Okay. And when was the celebration dinner itself supposedly, when did it supposedly occur? I believe it would have been on July 31st. All right, so he told you about this information within a week of receiving it? Or so, yeah. Okay. So it's incorrect to state that Jeffrey Lacasse waited until March of 2015 to disclose this information to law enforcement? That's correct. Correct that that's incorrect? Yes. <laughs> Clear as mud. Um, were you able to find any text messages in the text messages provided to law enforcement in this case to corroborate that any such dinner between Wendy, or I guess including Wendy Adelson and Charlie Adelson occurred during this time frame that Lacoste had this information about. Yes, ma'am. All right. I'm gonna show you what I've marked as states 126. Yes, ma'am. Right, judge, I've And when were these text messages sent and received? Uh, July 31st, 2014, and the times are listed beside the text. All right, and these messages indicate that Wendy and Charlie are going out to dinner, yes? Yes, ma'am. And also some reference there at 10.57 p.m., the last text message on the bottom right that Wendy was feeling a little poorly at some point after the dinner. It would seem so. No further questions. set for a long time and her mom was commenting that she's finally smiling that's the way i understand it yes sir you can take it off now um professor lacoste told you that he before he and wendy broke up 
he looked through her calendar and phone because he thought she was being unfaithful. I right? believe so, yes. And his behavior suggested to you that even before the murder occurred, he knew that he was on his way out as her boyfriend? Um, I think that was coming eventually. I don't know if he would accepted it at that point. He reached out to you fairly frequently, unprompted? Yes. He complained that Wendy was unfaithful multiple times? Um, I believe he did mention that, yes. He was upset that Wendy had broken up with him? Yes, he was upset. And when, he, when you interviewed him the, the first time, he didn't even bring up Charlie Adelson's name, right? I don't remember specifically if uh, he did it in the first or second interview. He was uncomfortable, he told you, because he was giving a lot of information about Wendy Adelson, and he said to you, I'm uncomfortable because if she'd have me back, I'd go back to her, right? Uh, he may or may not have said that. I don't recall specifically. Now, he was upset that he was labeled a person of interest, right? Yes. And he thought that Wendy Adelson was responsible for labeling him a person of interest, right? I'm not sure who he thought was responsible. He was also upset that because he thought Wendy had referred to him as a stalker, right? Yes. And he sent you emails reflecting how upset he was about being labeled a stalker, right? Yes, sir. Now, regarding the celebration dinner, if he testified that he didn't tell you till March 2015 because he was too scared to tell you earlier, that would have been inaccurate testimony, right? Yes, sir. He told you that he learned about this supposed, but we don't deny the dinner, but he termed it a celebration. He said that, that uh, my client told Wendy, who told him that it was a celebration dinner, correct? That's what he indicated to me. And he told you that he had heard this from Wendy and from friends, right? Yes, sir. But he couldn't give you any names of any friends that he had heard this from, right? He did not. Did you ask Professor Lacoste why Wendy would tell him that at a time when they were broken up? I didn't. I didn't pry into it. Now, did Professor Lacoste ever show you any of the notes that he had taken during the course of his investigation? Not that I recall specifically, sir. You don't recall him showing you pages and pages of notes? He may have. Did you tell him to destroy those notes? No, sir. During your investigation, you learned that Katie McBanawa was on Facebook, right? Yes. You learned that she was on Instagram as well, right? Um, under I'm not name, sure about that. I know about Facebook. I wrote a search warrant for that. Under the name Katie Cash? I don't know. I, specifically, I did a Facebook search warrant. And she was on Facebook, right? Yes, sir. May I have a moment? Redirect examination. No questions, Your Honor. Sergeant Hill, you may step down. Will he be recalled by other party? No, sir. Have a good day, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. You're released. Please call your next witness. Please call Sergeant Chris Corbett. Here, I think the sergeant was helpful to establish that. Uh, Indeed, Jeff Lacoste had an ironclad alibi. He was not in any way involved in the murder of Dan Markell. And it also helps, I think, show that he was set up because um, he was concerned that he was being labeled a stalker by um, by Wendy. And this uh, sergeant never asked for the names of folks. So I wish that would have been clarified. You may take your seat. Good afternoon. Second, just put your get your laptop together. Thank you. Okay, no problem. <coughs>
Yes, Corbett is the uh, cell phone guru. Mm -hmm. I believe he also had uh, some other information on the wire tabs. Still booting up. I got it. Okay. We can probably go on while it's ahead, coming yes. to life here. All right, great. Will you introduce yourself to the jury and spell your name for our court reporter, please? Certainly. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Corbett, and that's C-O-R-B-I-T-T, -T, and I'm a sergeant with the City of Tallahassee Police Department. And you mentioned you're a sergeant. What unit do you work in at TPD? I currently supervise the Technical Operations Unit, and that's the section of the agency that's responsible for sort of all the high-tech or technological ways that we help out in criminal investigations. That includes things like uh, computer and mobile device forensics, audio and video, um, CCTV retrieval, um, our uh, LPR systems, we have a public safety camera system, all of those. And then what I spend most of my time doing, which is the analysis of communication records or analysis of phone records. And how long have you worked in the technical operations unit at TPD? Uh, for quite some time, uh, I believe 2012, 2008 is when I started in there. Okay, and how long have you been uh, the sergeant supervising that unit? 2012. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about, well, we've heard a little bit about your experience, but your training and experience to be in your position. One moment, one moment. The bailiff will take you back. We'll have a brief recess for the moment. I sound like somebody said they got sick. I don't know if that's a juror or whatever. I don't know if Johnny's gonna be able to tell us what's going on in there. But yeah, Sergeant Corbett, he was an excellent witness for the state back when they prosecuted the other two Kitty one and Kitty two trials. He was able to show all the uh, cell phone location data showing exactly how Katie was with them when they picked up the rental car, how the hitman drove up to the Tallahassee, not just once, but twice. Um, yeah, so Johnny says, uh, juror raised his hand and said he feels sick, walked out briskly, short recess. So um, that's uh, <clears throat> that's a good reason to take a break. And uh, that's why we also have alternates in case, you know, unfortunately, if he wasn't able to attend, then uh, we do have some backups for that. So. But yeah, this, this shows how, exactly how um, also the phone calls were being made between Charlie, Donna, and Wendy the morning of the, um, the murder. So I think it was very, very critical information that they were able to extract. And it took a, it took a time to extract this information as well. There's a lot of details involved in trying to find the phone numbers, trying to cross-reference phone numbers with each other. So it's a lot of uh, spent thought, probably a many hundreds of man hours to, to accomplish this. But uh, like I say, he did an excellent job. So it looks like they're just waiting in place. So apparently just that, yeah, the jurors are still seated. Just that one individual juror rushed out. So hopefully he's gonna feel good enough to come back here and uh, we can keep this trial moving along. But I think the pace of the trial is going very good. Um, I don't think Rashbaum's dragging out too much at all. I think he's making whatever points he thinks are necessary. And uh, with, with this wild theory that he has, that's uh, not gonna fly with jury that I would, uh, I think he's doing a, a pre pretty okay job given the fact he has nothing to work with. and. Um, yeah, that's a good question, Julia. I think that Rob is probably available to testify, whether he's actually testifying or not as to family dynamics uh, remains to be seen. But I would go ahead and um, use testimony like that. I think it helps show um, that this is actually something that ex elimination of a spouse, if you're not on, um, if you're not on Donna's good list, if you're on her hit list, that they, they'll go to extreme measures to make your life miserable if uh, if you don't drop somebody that you want to marry. So I think that would be um, good, consistent information to show the family dynamics that way. Yeah, I don't. 
I would say that uh, Charlie's sometimes looking over there, whatever. I, I I don't know how much he's actually trying to make eye contact, though, with jurors. It seems like he's sort of zoned out. I know there was a doctor on there, Canella, and I know uh, uh, Debbie Martin's a physician as well, and they, they were saying that, you know, it could be anything from the um, ADHD or some kind of tics that... Um, that Charlie has, or it could be Seroquel. Seroquel is an antipsychotic. That's what uh, Dr. Canella said. And so, if he's on a Seroquel, that's a that's not antipsychotic drug. It's, uh, it can really would affect. Be, are you good to sip to the rest of today? Are you good to sip to the rest of today? All right. You may continue, Ms. Dickham. Hi. Could you tell us a little bit about your training and experience for your position? Uh, certainly. I have uh, a little over 1,675 hours of general technical training um, across kind of all of our disciplines. And then I have just under 900 hours of training specific to uh, communication record analysis. And that, again, involves the collection of records or obtaining the records, the various types of analysis that we do, including location, um, estimating the location of a handset or calling analysis. Um, I instruct other law enforcement officers and uh, analysts across the state and really across the country in communication record analysis. Um, I believe that's... And what is communication record analysis? Um, communication record analysis is kind of a general term for um, what we can do with the records that are primarily, we're talking about the records that come from communication carriers, like our AT&T, Verizon, cell phone carriers is primarily what we talk about. We also do get records from forensic analysis of phones. We can add that in, but primarily, again, uh, the carrier records. And from the various types of reports they're able to give us, we can do analysis such as who a, a handset, and I say handset for cell phone, communicates with most frequently. Um, again, estimated locations, approximately where was uh, a handset when a certain call was placed. Um, the uh, calling pattern analysis, who calls who, when, all of those kind of things. Really, there's a variety of analysis that we can do with those records, kind of uh, pertaining to whatever the investigation uh, needs. And have you ever testified where you've given an opinion in court in the field of historical communication record analysis? I have, yes. About how many times? Uh, 101. Um, Judge, those are all my questions as to his qualifications in that field, if defense has any void here. Mr. Rushmore? No, Your Honor. Pleasure. Is there any objection to the witness providing an opinion in the field of historic communication analysis? No, Your Honor. Members of the jury, the witness will be permitted to provide you with an opinion in this area of historic communication analysis. You may continue. All right, so we're going to get to your analysis in a minute, but before we do that, I just have to move certain things into evidence, so we're going to go through that. Um, all right, so you told us that in your position at TPD, you often pull records, call detail records from phone companies. That's correct, yes. Um, are these types of records kept in the normal course of business for phone companies? They are. And are they kept by an automated system by a computer that has knowledge of those events in the records? Yes. And are you familiar with how to interpret and read those records? Yes, I am. In this case, have you reviewed the phone records of um, what's been marked and shown to defense um, and uh, you in previous proceedings? And I'm just gonna go through all the numbers and names. States Exhibit 85, Luis Rivera, call detail records. States Exhibit 86, Sigfredo Garcia, call detail records. States Exhibit 87, Wendy Adelson. 88, Donna Adelson. 89, Charlie Adelson. 90, Harvey Adelson. 91, Catherine McVanua, and 92, Daniel Markell, call detail records. Yes. Okay. And, oh, there in, on, in, right in front of you on the witness stand, I've left a chart that's already been admitted into evidence, I believe, as states 59. Does it say 59 on the pink sticker there? It does, yes. Okay. Just to kind of save us time and without having to recite every number, do the numbers below each picture on that chart reflect the numbers for the call detail records we received for each one of these parties? Yes. Okay. 
All right, in addition to the call detail records we spoke about, um, did you also review traffic tickets received by Sigfredo Garcia, car rental agreements from Comfort Rental and Save Gas, surveillance video from Premier Jim, uh, documents from Sperry on GPS, Comfort Rental, Save Gas, um, as well as the iCloud of Charlie Adelson and the Cellbrite of Wendy Adelson cell phone. Yes. Okay. I want to ask you about those last two items in just a second. But for the call detail records and the businesses I named out, when you receive um, records from a business, does it contain a certification from that business uh, verifying that it is a legitimate record from that business? Did the records in this case have those items? Yes, all the carriers provide or can provide a business record certification uh, attesting to the things we mentioned earlier. Okay. And um, as far as the Wendy Adelson Cellbrite, what is a Cellbrite? Uh, Cellbrite is kind of a, a, a carry or catch all name now. We do forensic analysis of um, mobile devices and computers. And there's a number of tools that allow us to do that forensic analysis that actually interact with the handset and allow us to retrieve the information that's on it. Um, Cellbrite is one of those, and it is one of the tools that we use. So we uh, kind of say a Cellbrite report is a uh, forensic report. So uh, once we extract that information, then the software goes through and kind of analyzes it for us and says, well, this is a text message and this is a call log and this is a Wi-Fi access point, whatever it may be and creates a report for us that we're able to review um, and to be able to search through and print out excerpts, whatever we want to do. But it's a tool that allows us to analyze the results of that forensic extraction from the device. And was that forensic extraction of Wendy Adelson's cell phone done um, the, on the day of Dan Markell's murder, July 18, 2014, when she came to Tallahassee Police Department? Yes, it was. All right, and then at some point during this investigation, I mentioned this iCloud, was a subpoena sent to Apple to get the information from Charlie Adelson's iCloud. I believe it would have been a search warrant, but yes. Search warrant, my, my apologies. And um, when we received the information from that iCloud, were there messages in that iCloud? Yes. All right, and what is an iCloud, for those who don't know? Uh, again, kind of a general term, but for iOS users or Apple users, they have the ability to back up um, most of the contents from their device to uh, the iCloud, Apple's cloud storage. Um, with a legal demand, we were able to um, recover that or, or be provided that um, backup information from the cell phones um, of Mr. Adelson. Again, Cellbrite being the software we use to analyze that, to kind of parse everything out and, and allow us to review it um, and, and do the analysis of that, of that uh, iCloud return. Okay. Did you base your opinions in this case on the records that you received um, from those businesses that I named out, from the um, extracts from the iCloud, and also from the call detail records that you received from the phone carriers? Yes. All right. Um, all of this information, was this um, voluminous amount of information, hundreds or even thousands of pages? Uh, definitely thousands of pages. Okay, did you prepare a summary in order to show the jury what these records say about the phone activity and locations of all these parties um, and that you'll be relying on for your testimony here today? I did. All right, and did that summary include the call detail records, the business records we talked about, and also just certain extracts from Wendy Adelson's cell phone and the, cell, the uh, iCloud of Charlie Adelson? Yes. Okay. At this time, I'd like to move in um, item 64, the comfort rental contract, 65, another comfort rental contract, 66, Spirion GPS information, 80, traffic ticket of Sigfredo Garcia, as well as 85 through 92, which are all of the call detail records um, that I described earlier when I named out each person. Any objection from the defense? No, Your Honor. Please go for the numbers again. Yes, sir. They are admitted. That should be 85 through 92, 64, 65, 66, and 80.
And then finally, this summary that we're gonna see where you combined all of that information. Um, did you create uh, a PDF version to be printed and moved into evidence today? Yes. All right, now, um, do you also have a version via PowerPoint that we can see here in the courtroom all together? I do, yes. All right, Judge, um, at this time I would move um, his summary into evidence. This is State's Exhibit 67. There's gonna be both a, um, a flash drive containing this and then a physical copy. Any objection to 67? No, Your Honor. State 67 is admitted. All right, so if you could pull up the summary, the PowerPoint on your end, and we'll get it started. Is. It, it is? is on my okay, end. so let me see what I need. Oh, I, need, I know what I need. Okay, so you told us that um, about part of your job is getting these call detail records from phone companies. Can you describe to us what these call detail records look like and what's contained in them? Certainly, so this is a sample of uh, call detail records. This is one page um, from the many records that we received. And you can see there's a lot of information here on the page, but there's certain sections that we kind of look at for our analysis. So here on the, on the left-hand side, we have the date and time of events. And when I say events, it could be a voice call, it could be a text message, or it could be a data session. Um, they, different carriers provide records for different types of events. But in this case with AT&T, we generally see records with um, voice, text, and data. But we have the date and time of that event. Sometimes our records are provided in different time zones and we have to do an adjustment to our local time. Um, but in uh, the older records here that we have, these records were actually provided in our local time. Some of the later records we had were not. So that section again tells us the date and time of the event. So if we're looking for something that happened on a certain day, that's the section that we go to. The next section here involves uh, who's calling who. These are the phone numbers involved, and one of those would be our target number or the number that the records are for, and the other number would be the person that's either calling that person or being called by that person. So uh, we see also the what they call their seizure time, how long it takes to, to connect the call, and then the elapsed time, how long the call lasts. We will do a lot of summaries of call detail records. It's easier to read when we kind of do it in a different format that allows us to put a name with a number so we know kind of who's calling who. It's a little bit easier to read. But those uh, summaries will come from that section of the records as far as what phone numbers are communicating with, uh, with whom else. And then the other section that we have here is the location section. So this is the cell site or cell tower that the handset was communicating with for that particular event. And they give us both a unique identifier for it, a number that we can go to a key or a spreadsheet and look up. And in the case of AT&T, they also provide us the latitude and longitude um, of that cell site. So when we do location analysis, it kind of looks like this. We can just take that latitude and longitude they give us or which we looked up and confirmed in that key and we can plot it on the map. And here it's just represented by this blue dot but that would be the location of the cell site that this handset was communicating with during that particular sample event. Sometimes just knowing where the cell site is is sufficient. We don't really need to, to know any more. Um, we can do kind of our location analysis. We know this phone was generally in the South Florida area. But our cell sites are almost all broken down into multiple sides or sectors. And so that means they have antennas that are facing different direction and a handset will communicate with one of those sectors. And we're also provided with that information in the call detail records. So not only do we know where the cell site is, but we know kind of which side of the cell site a handset was on for, for particular events. And sometimes we will look at that to help uh, narrow down where a handset could have been. So sometimes we'll represent them. Um, you can see here the large blue arrow would represent the sector that the handset was using the smaller black arrows would represent the other cell sites on that or other sectors on that cell site um, that were not being used. But that kind of gives us an idea of how that cell site is divided up. Three being the most common um, kind of division of a cell site. Can you say exactly or precisely on a map where a certain handset is? No. Okay. 
Um, how do you, um, how do you, do you say whether a handset is consistent with the location or inconsistent? Yes, generally we're provided with an address and we're asked to say, could this handset have been at this address, the scene, this incident? And so we look at where the cell site is located, we look at the sector the handset is communicating with and make an opinion as to whether uh, that sector of that cell site services that incident location. And if it does, if we think it's within the coverage area of that particular cell site and sector, then we would say yes, your incident location is included. If that address were to be somewhere far outside of the cell site that we do not believe the signal from that cell site could reach a handset, then we would say no, that location is excluded or the handset could not have been there. If a phone is out of battery or turned off or just not being used at that time, um, are you able to get locations for that handset at those times? So that's a, a good point. We can only make estimations about locations when we have events with location. If they're not in the records, then we don't know where a handset could be. Um, and so yes, in some of those situations, if a handset is not being used, it may still generate data records. So we may still see location information, even if no one is actively um, making a phone call or sending a text message. And with some of the carriers, uh, we don't see those. We don't see the, the passive events. Um, and we may not have location information for some time. But yes, we, we only can make that determination when we have an actual record with location. All right, so let's get into this case. Can you walk us through uh, Dan Markell's known locations um, the day that he was murdered on July 18th, 2014? Yes, we knew that um, he had been in three distinct locations that morning, one being his house, um, the second being when he dropped his children off at daycare, and then the third being uh, Premier Health and Fitness Center, uh, where he was before returning home. So we knew we had those three locations. Did TPD believe that whoever shot Dan Markell was at at least one of these same locations or more that he was at that morning? Yes, we did have evidence that he was being followed uh, at least at the, at the last location. Um, so we did believe that it was a probability that the suspects were possibly at all three of those locations around the same time Mr. Markell would have been. Okay, and the last location with the surveillance video you're speaking of is the um, Premier Gym? Yes. Where the Prius was following him? Yes. All right, so how did TPD try to identify who was in that Prius? The first thing that we did is um, what we call a tower dump, which is kind of a generic term for collecting all of the events that were processed through any cell sites that could service a particular location. So we gave the carriers those three addresses and the time frame that we believe the suspects would have been there and said, please give us all the events that your cell towers processed and the phone numbers associated with those. Um, and so that we could try to do some analysis and determine if again, those suspects were, uh, were following him in those locations. And which phone companies had cell sites in the area? Uh, at that time we had uh, T-Mobile, uh, Sprint, Verizon, and AT&T. Okay, so those four companies? Yes. So TPD, you said, then subpoenaed those records to get all of the numbers with events in that location. That's correct. Okay. All right, so um, state has marked and shown to defense and the witness in previous proceedings states 93, which is the tower dump of T-Mobile, states 94, tower dump of AT&T, States 95, tower dump of Verizon. States 96, the tower dump of Sprint, which all contain certifications of business records. Did you review the tower dumps of all those four companies um, in your analysis in this case? I did, yes. Okay, um, at this time I would move states 93 through 96 into evidence of certified business records. Any objection? No, Your Honor. States 93 through 96 are admitted at this time. So, uh, was, was this um, analysis of those tower dumps a, a quicker and easy thing to do? Uh, no, not, not quick or easy. Um, we do have software that helps us that we're able to import these records into and it kind of does some of, the, some of the hard work for us in the background. But again, the results that we get have to be researched and, and analyzed and worked from that point. Okay, after looking through all of the numbers in all of those four disks in, in um, evidence and all of that data, was there any one number at all of those locations that Markel was at that morning? Uh, there was not. 
All right, so since you couldn't find one number that was in every single one of those locations, what did y'all do next? Well, the, the next thought was um, the call or the tower dump is, again, just kind of a listing of a bunch of phone numbers of handsets that were present in those kind of critical places and times. And at that point, we also had a significant number of records from the subjects in the investigation. So we were actually able to compare the phone numbers of phones that were in the tower dumps with both all of the target numbers or subject numbers that we had uh, obtained records for and all the people that they had talked to. We were able to kind of compare those two data sets to see if something would, would uh, come out. Okay, and what did you find? We did, in comparing these, we did find a number that was common to the tower dump from the Premier Health and Fitness, and it was also a number that had been called or called into uh, one of the uh, subjects in the investigation. And which subject was that? That was uh, Mr. Harvey Adelson. And that's Charlie Adelson's father? Yes. Okay, can you show us that call? I wanna ask you about the date and time and duration. Yeah, okay. so this, Go ahead. sorry, July 1st of 2014, uh, and while it looks like three events here, it's actually only one call, and this is something that we see in the records. There are a number of routing events um, that happen when the call is received, and, and in this case, there's an indication it was routed to voicemail, so that routing shows up as multiple events in the records. So while it looks like more, it is actually only a single phone call. And what date was this call Again, on? July 1st of 2014. Okay, and what was the duration of the call? The duration was 37 seconds. So that was the time from the, the time the call connected to the time the call ended? That's correct. Okay, um, could that be consistent with um, the 786 caller leaving a voicemail on Harvey Adelson's phone? It could be yes. Uh, all we know is that it was connected for 37 seconds and there is uh, the indicator of routing to voicemail. Okay, was there any other communication in the phone records between this 786 number and Harvey Adelson besides this one call, this one 37 second call? There was not. And who did the 786 number belong to? The 786 number belonged to Mr. Sigfredo Garcia. And so Sigfredo Garcia's number was consistent with being at Premier Gym at the same time of the victim. And that number having this 37 second call on July 1st to Harvey Adelson is what brought him to the forefront. One way, yes. Okay. And was Sigfredo Garcia linked to Charlie Adelson? He was, yes. Can you show us how? So again, one of the main analysis that we do with phone records is what we call a frequency report or just a simple report that tells us who a particular handset communicates with most frequently. It helps us identify people that are significant in their, um, in their lives, maybe co-conspirators or other people, but again, we do that uh, frequency report. So we looked at his frequency report, and at the very top we had this uh, number that ending in 1312, clearly communicated with a significant number of times uh, by Mr. Garcia. And who did the 786-1312 number? So the 1312 number was Ms. Magbanois. Okay, and how was she linked to Charlie Adelson? Again, uh, looking at her frequency or who she communicated with the most, we see her second most frequent uh, contact was a number ending in 9223. And who did that 9223 number belong to? That was Mr. Charlie Adelson. Who was another one of Sigfredo Garcia's top contacts besides Catherine McVanilla? So we did look at all of his uh, contacts or all the people in his frequency report to attempt to identify who he may have been with. Going back to the tower dump return, we found that there was a phone number in the AT&T tower dump return, also from Premier, um, that uh, that number was also in Mr. Garcia's frequency report. So someone that he communicated with relatively frequently was also here in Tallahassee at the same time. And who does the 8153 number belong to that was here at the same time? That was Mr. Rivera's. All right, looking at your next slide, does anyone else in this chart have phone contact with Sigfredo Garcia down at the bottom or Luis Rivera right next to him other than 
Catherine McVanwa and that one 37 second call between Garcia and Harvey Adelson on July 1st of 2014? No. Okay, so speaking of that July 1st, 2014, 37 second call, was it your understanding through this investigation that that call came after an incident where Garcia confronted Magbanwa and Charlie Adelson on July 1st when they were gonna take out jet skis and then Garcia left an angry voicemail on Harvey Adelson's phone? Yes. <clears throat> In looking at Charlie Adelson's iCloud, were there messages that reference the message left on July 1st? There are, yes. Okay, can you show us those messages? Or yeah, what do we have so here? This is just a sample of the, of the Cellbrite report that we've been talking about. We can see that uh, this is just containing the one message, but this is an example of how the Cellbrite uh, report looks and how we're able to go through and get information. For most of our summaries, we will um, convert those out into something that's a little bit easier to read. We can see that the print's kind of small and there's all kinds of information in there. So when we do these uh, summaries of the text messages, we will kind of bring them out into these bigger bubbles. But we have the, the two messages here on the left that are from Ms. McBanawa and the response from Mr. Adelson. And again, this is July 2nd of 2014. Okay, and in this message from from Charlie Adelson to Catherine McBanois on July 2nd, 2014. So this would be the day after the 37 second call to Harvey Adelson's phone? That's correct. Okay. Charlie Adelson says, I'm sorry, but he's a fucking pussy? Yes. Okay. And then he says that leaving messages is so childish, but whatever. Is yes. Is that right? That's correct. All right, was Luis Rivera interviewed by law enforcement back in 2016? Uh, he was, yes. All right, and did he admit that he and Garcia were in fact in that Prius at Premier Gym that followed Dan Markell on July 18th of 2014? He did, yes. All right, and did both Garcia and Rivera live in Miami back in 2014 to 2016, that time range? Yes. Did Rivera tell law enforcement during his interview about an additional trip to Tallahassee besides the one that law enforcement already knew about where Dan Markell was killed on July 18th? He did, yes. Okay. Um, what did y'all do once you learned that information that, that before the murder there was this first trip or additional trip to Tallahassee? Well, we certainly investigated that. We looked at the records that we had to see if we could confirm that trip and then uh, researched other evidence that we may uh, have been able to collect um, to document that trip. And were you able to see from the records that um, Luis Rivera traveled to Tallahassee not only in July of 2014, but also in June of 2014? Yes. Okay, so I wanna go now in chronological order, starting with the June trip and then going into the July trip, which culminated in Dan Markell being murdered. All right. Looking first at June 2nd of 2014, what did um, law enforcement find evidence of that happened that day? The first thing that we found was the rental contract um, for a rental vehicle that was ultimately driven up here. Um, with that contract, we see that it was in the name of Mr. Garcia. We see the vehicle description here on the right-hand side is a Nissan uh, Altima. And we have a, a due in in the contract that indicates it was due back on June 5th at 8.50 p.m. Okay. Using that date and time it was due back, what time was law enforcement able to determine that it was rented? Knowing that they were 24-hour rental periods from this company, then um, it, it was logical that it was rented around 8.50 p.m. So we looked at records in that time frame. Okay, so around 8.50 p.m. on... June 2nd. June 2nd. Okay, yes. so three days before. All right, you mentioned it's a N Nissan Altima that he rented. What color was that Nissan Altima? A silver. And this is Sigfredo Garcia that's renting this vehicle? That's correct. Does Luis Rivera's name appear anywhere on this rental contract? It does not. Okay, and you said that this is from Comfort Rental? Yes. 
All right. Was there any phone evidence or records to show how the rental car was picked up yes. on June 2nd? So we know the location of the Comfort rental car um, here represented by the yellow flag and the label Comfort rent a car. And we also have Ms. Bagbanawa's residence at the time. Looking at her phone records, the cell sites that her handset was communicating with the evening of June 2nd, we can see on the top right here, there's a cell site at 825, which is near her residence. We have another cell site at 834, where the handset has moved kind of west and south a little bit. And then we see uh, events on the left-hand side, 853 through 858, where her handset is now communicating with a cell site uh, much closer to the Comfort rental car. Did Sigfredo Garcia's phone records from June of 2014 have location information? Uh, they did not. And why not? Why might that happen? Uh, he was a, a Metro PCS customer, and at that time, um, T-Mobile was going through an acquisition of Metro PCS, and the record keeping was a bit sketchy. Uh, we ended up obtaining records from both T-Mobile and Metro PCS, and we went back on multiple occasions to try to get more, but we were able to get basically partial records from both providers, um, but nothing uh, that had location information for the June trip. Okay. Okay, so we see that you've plotted her cell phone locations on this map, or the cell site locations that her phone was using on this map. After she's consistent with the area of comfort rental from 853 to 858 does she stay in the area or does she travel back to her home she will travel back here we can see for those events when looking at the specific sector that her handset was using it's further consistent with the comfort rental car location and then as you ask uh, she has events here we see on the left at 917 consistent with moving away from comfort rental car and then the next event with location to the right hand side being at 943 and 1001, which will be consistent with her returning to the area of her residence. Did you look at the records to see who um, Catherine Ragbanwa and any other parties in this case were talking to during this time frame? Yes. Okay, can you tell us um, about that communication? So this is again the call detail summary. So this is where we've taken all of those kind of hard to read records from the carrier and we've put them in our software and it's able to uh, print out a report for us that's kind of easier to follow. We're able to attach names to phone numbers and we're able to do time adjustments if we need to so that we make sure that all of our records are in the correct time zone as well. So these are the communications um, starting at about 825 and running through approximately 1130 for that evening of June 2nd. This is um, during the period of time that this rental car is being picked up. Your mic's and, muted, Carl. Uh, and Mr. Garcia are traveling back and forth. Um, that first call that we see to Geico, would that call be kind of during the time that she would be driving out to the comfort rental area? Yes. Is she speaking to Sigfredo Garcia at all during that time frame where she's traveling out to comfort? She is not. Could that be consistent with them being together during that time? It could be, yes. All right. So. Then looking at during the time that she's at Comfort and the time period, which was 8.53 to 8.57, I believe, and the time period when she's traveling back to her home, who is she on the phone with during that time? Uh, she communicates with Mr. Adelson, uh, primarily. Okay, can you tell us the duration of those calls with Charlie Adelson? Uh, I can, the first uh, at 8.57 is, uh, is actually an outgoing call from Mr. Adelson to Ms. Magbanoa uh, for a minute and eight seconds. We have a call at 9.17 p.m. from Ms. Bagbanawa to Mr. Adelson. That is 25 minutes and 27 seconds long. Uh, and that's the third call down from the top we see? That's correct. Okay, so that 25 minute call, she would have been on the phone with him for much of her drive back home from the car rental? That's correct. And who does she call as soon as she gets back home from the car rental after she hangs up with Mr. Adelson? Uh, we have uh, outgoing calls to Mr. Garcia at 10.01. Okay. Now, I want you to walk us through this in just a second. And I, um, do we expect most of these parties to be talking each other, to each other on a daily basis, given that the, Adelson, the Adelsons are family members, given that Charlie Adelson is in a dating relationship with Catherine Rangbanwa and that Catherine Rangbanwa has children with Garcia, um, with uh, Sigfredo Garcia, would we expect those folks to be talking to the person that they're in their, their respective relationship with? Yes, I believe we would. Okay, so 
Are you going to be walking us through throughout your presentation certain periods of communication, though, that stood out to investigators? Yes. And why did those, since these are people that all may be talking to each other anyway on a daily basis, why did these certain periods stick out to, to investigators? Well, these are communications that occurred during periods of time where significant events were happening um, in, this, uh, in this crime. And so this is the evening that the rental car, this is the first rental car um, is being picked up. And this is the rental car that will subsequently be driven to Tallahassee in an attempt to, uh, to murder Mr. Markell. So it's kind of the first, from my perspective and what I can see in the records, it's the first kind of physical act that I can see where there's something actually happening. Someone's traveling someplace to pick up a vehicle to go and do this thing. So that's why this period stood out. There are communications that occur during the trips um, while Mr. Garcia and Mr. Rivera are in Tallahassee. Um, there are communications that occur then and communications that occur upon their return after the eventual homicide of Mr. Markell. Are there other things about certain communications that stand out to investigators, like a quick turnaround between phone calls? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Uh, we can see in this uh, demonstrative here, the third call down we talked about is 25 minutes and 27 seconds. So Ms. Bagbanawa and Mr. Adelson would have been on the phone from 917, add 25 minutes to that. And we see at 944, which is just about the time that call would have ended, um, Mr. Adelson then makes an outgoing call to the Adelson residence, also for 25 minutes, 25 minutes and 32 seconds. Okay, so looking at situations where one of these conspirators hangs up with one and immediately calls the other, that could be something that stands out to investigators. Yes. Okay. And then in, is another, I guess, um, detail in the communications, maybe calling a number that they might not ordinarily, ordinarily call? Yes. Okay. All right, so if you could walk us through the communications that we see, as you said, on like the, the, the night that the first physical act of this murder is occurring during this first trip to Tallahassee where this car is being rented. So again, to help kind of uh, visualize the calls, we can look at our subjects and then look at our communications. So we already mentioned uh, the 857 call um, where Mr. Adelson calls in to Ms. Bagbanawa just over a minute. We have the next call at 9.17 p.m. This was the 27 or 25 minute phone call that we talked about. And that's on, while she's on the way back from Comfort to her home? That's correct. Okay. And so in this relatively short time frame, we're also kind of keeping track up here on this one at the top, how much kind of the, the total time of communications that we have. So again, uh, at 9.31, Wendy Adelson uh, text uh, Harvey Adelson the phone call we already talked about from Mr. Adelson to the Adelson residence for 25 minutes. Catherine Magbanawa then uh, communicating with Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia back to Ms. Magbanawa. Harvey Adelson calls Charlie Adelson. This is 1016 and that's a five minute phone call, a little over five minutes. Charlie Adelson calls back for a little over three minutes. Ms. Magbanawa is communicating with Mr. Garcia again, and then Mr. Adelson for another 23 minute phone call. And then text messages from um, Mr. Garcia to our call and then text from Mr. Garcia to Ms. Magbanawa. So about an hour and 25 minutes of communication um, between our parties in this time frame. Okay. More here, 1105. Um, short calls or a 27 second call and then, then a four minute phone call um, from Ms. Magbanawa to Mr. Garcia. Again, communication from Mr. Garcia back to Ms. Magbanawa. And that was the last. <coughs> All right, we saw a call from Charlie Adelson. You mentioned it. Catherine Urbana was talking to Charlie Adelson on her way back from dropping Garcia off at the at Comfort Rental. She talks to Charlie Adelson for 25 minutes on her way back, and then Charlie Adelson, after he gets off that call, calls his parents' landline, Harvey and Donna Adelson's landline. That's correct. Okay, does the, does the defendant, Charlie Adelson, most often talk to his parents on their cell phones or at, on their home landline? We looked at, again, for all the records that we had for Mr. Adelson, 
and uh, our analytical software is able to kind of tally up for us how many communications are with the cell phones, the combined cell phones of Mr. Donna, or Mr. Harvey and Ms. Donna Adelson, uh, compared to their uh, landline or their home phone. And again, we know that events kind of make multiple records, and, and so we know that it may not be exactly 3,868 calls, but not all calls are completed, all of those. But statistically, we can see that there were only 28 contacts or attempted contacts between Mr. Adelson's cell phone and the um, Adelson residents, um, compared to a significantly greater number to the cell phones. So you said 99.3% of his communication is with his parents' cell phones as opposed to the 0.7% of time he calls the landline. That's correct. All right. And are there actually, there's, you said 28 contacts or 0.07%. Those 28 contacts, those are from May of 2014 through March of 2016, almost two years. There's only 28 contacts total. That's correct. And this is one of them that happened that night. Yes. And that was at a time also in that call flurry you just showed us, there were calls where there was a, a long duration of a call to Harvey Adelson's cell phone as well too, right? Yes. Are you familiar, I wanna talk a little bit more about this landline call before we move on. Are you familiar with statements by Charlie Adelson on the wiretap? where Charlie Adelson tells people who call him on his cell phone that he'll call them back on a landline. Yes. As somebody who's familiar with technical operations of law enforcement and wiretapping, is there a, a perception, whether it be wrong or right, but is there a perception that talking on a landline phone is, is safer than talking on a cell phone as far as who can listen in or whether law enforcement can listen in? Yes, I believe there is. All right, where was Rivera's handset during this time where the car was rented? So again, knowing the approximate time for the car rental, we looked at Mr. Rivera's cell sites that his handset was using, and we can see that they're consistent with the area of his residence and would be inconsistent with the area of comfort rental. Is there any evidence that Rivera was involved with the rental of this vehicle? There's not. All right, do we have any other evidence that law enforcement was able to find uh, to show who rented the car on June 2nd besides the last rental contract we saw? Yes, I believe you mentioned earlier a traffic citation. Uh, we did recover a traffic citation that was issued to Mr. Garcia. Um, and in that we can see that he is driving the rental vehicle, uh, the same information from the rental contract. Okay, and was this citation from 9.48 p.m. on June 2nd? It is, yes. So within an hour of renting this car, he got a traffic ticket. He did. All right. Um, and that was in that silver Nissan Altima? Yes. Are you familiar with the statement that uh, Jeffrey Lacoste drives a silver Nissan vehicle or drove that at the time of, of this murder? No, I am familiar with that, yes. Now, did this traffic ticket create a record that law enforcement would be in possession of? Um, and that record memorialized the fact that Sigfredo Garcia is driving this Nissan, silver Nissan rental car from Comfort on that day. Yes. All right, so after he got that traffic ticket that memorializes that, that law enforcement is gonna have, what did he do next? Uh, there was a change of vehicles. So we have an additional uh, contract from Comfort rental car um, that indicates the vehicle was changed out for a, a blue Hyundai. Okay, so then he goes back to Comfort, rents a different car. That's correct. All right, this time a blue Hyundai. And again, was it Garcia renting it and not Rivera? That's correct. All right. What can you tell us about the travel of Luis Rivera's handset on June 4th of 2014? So again, Mr. Rivera is the only one that we have location information on uh, for this period. And again, just looking at the cell sites that his handset is communicating with, 
We can see that it's consistent with leaving the South Florida, Miami area. We see down here at the bottom right, um, early morning hours of June 4th of 2014. And then we can see that it uh, is consistent with getting into Tallahassee uh, the early morning or later morning of uh, June 4th. Was Rivera's phone ever consistent with being near the victim Dan Markell's home on Trescott Drive the following day on June 5th of 2014? Yes, we did see a number of events uh, where his handset was communicating with a cell site and a sector um, very close to Mr. Markell's residence. Are you familiar with Rivera's statement in his interview that they were at a park near Markell's house? Yes. Were, was the phone information here, was that consistent with Winthrop Park near Trescott Drive? It is. We can see here at the top the end of, uh, location of Trescott Drive and uh, the blue kind of square there represents the GPS information for the rental vehicle. Um, the rental companies did have kind of asset recovery tracking on their vehicles and uh, they provided a location for the rental vehicle at 3.17 p.m. here on June uh, 5th. And we can see that the vehicle is, or that and the cell site just down here would both be consistent with Winthrop Park just on the south side of Baton Rouge. And sometime after this surveillance, surveillance of Dan Markell, did Luis Rivera's handset end up traveling back down to the Miami area? It did, yes. Okay. It, immediately after that, we can see that uh, the handset, again, just looking at the cell sites, would be consistent with traveling back down to the South Florida area that uh, afternoon and evening of June 5th of 2014. All right, did you look at the records to see what the communication, if any, was between the different um, parties during this June trip to Tallahassee? Yes, we did. Okay, can you tell us about that? And again, just merely bracketing the period of time that the trip to Tallahassee was occurring, we can look at the communications. This is a summary of just the subjects in our investigation and um, uh, other targets. So we've eliminated all the other people they're talking to. Um, and just focused on the phone calls where they're talking to other subjects in the investigation. But we can see that there are a number of events um, from the 2nd through the 5th. Okay. Did Charlie Adelson contact Catherine Magbanwa a number of times during this, during this trip to Tallahassee? Yes. Okay. Was that about 10 times? Yes. So again, looking at this, uh, just this time kind of tallying up the number of contacts uh, between our uh, subjects, we can see, yes, Mr. Adelson uh, contacted Ms. Magbanawa 10 times in this time frame. What about Catherine Magbanawa to Charlie Adelson? Seven times. And what about Catherine Magbanawa and Sigfredo Garcia? 12 times. What about Sigfredo to Catherine Magbanawa? Five times. What about Charlie Adelson and Donna Adelson? Five times. What about Donna Adelson to Charlie Adelson? Two times. What about Wendy Adelson to Donna Adelson? Two times. What about Wendy Adelson to Harvey Adelson? One time. And what about um, contacts to uh, Wendy Adelson to the Harvey and Donna landline? We have one contact there. Okay. And what about Wendy Adelson and Charlie Adelson? We have Charlie and Harvey one time. Okay. We have Wendy and Charlie one time. Harvey and Donna one time. Ms. Bagbanawa to uh, Mr. Rivera one time. And was that um, at his number he had in July of 2014 or was that an old number for him? Uh, that was an old number for him. Is that number though listed as Tato in her phone? It is, yes. Okay, but it wasn't working at the time of, um, or for the call detail records we have, we have his new number. That's correct. Okay, so he had a new number at the time even though she's calling an old number and not getting in touch with him. That's correct. Gotcha. Okay, and what about Luis Rivera and Sigfrida, Sigfrida Garcia? We do see one contact between them as well. Okay. All right, looking at June 6th of 2014, um, what can you tell us about the location of the rental vehicle that day? Again, we were able to obtain kind of periodic 
um, locations for the vehicle. It was not constant tracking, but uh, we were provided with another location that was at 8.48 a.m. on June 6th. We can see the location of the rental car by the blue square and uh, its proximity to Ms. Magbanawa's residence. So is that consistent with her being at her residence at that time? Uh, it's consistent with the rental car being near her residence at that time. Okay. All right, so I wanna ask you about a message um, from the Cellbrite of Wendy Adelson's cell phone from July 6th of 2014. So chronologically, this is gonna be after the June trip that we just saw, and it's gonna be before the July trip where Dan Markell ended up being murdered. Was there a text sent on July 6th by Wendy Adelson to Dan Markell? Yes. All right, can you show that to us? And what does this text say? Uh, from Wendy Adelson, it inquires of Mr. Markell, are you in Tallahassee July 14th through the 18th? I just wanted to know if I can have the kiddos on the 16th, thanks. Okay, and he says, yes, you can? He does. All right, the dates that we see that Wendy Adelson is asking Dan Markell about, what is significant about those dates? July 16th, I'm sorry, July 14th through 18th. Uh, those would encompass the second trip to Tallahassee where Mr. Markell was murdered. What happened on July 15th, which is in that date range? Uh, 15th would have been, I believe, the first rental vehicle. So the, the Prius? Or second rental vehicle, sorry. Okay, so the Prius was rented on July 15th? Yes. Okay. And then on July 16th, that was the date that they traveled to Tallahassee? Yes. Okay. Garcia and Rivera, I mean? That's correct. And on the 18th is when Dan Markell was murdered? Correct. Where was Wendy Adelson when this text message was sent? So looking at her cell sites, we can see that she is in South Florida at this time. Um, that text was sent, we see here around 1049, 1047 to 1049 is the AM is the text exchange. 1014 is the closest event that we have with cell site location for her. And we can see the location of the icon, which was the residence of uh, Mr. Harvey and Donna Adelson at that time. So Harvey and Donna Adelson lived in a condo in the icon building yes. at that time? Okay. Where was Charlie Adelson, the defendant, when that text message was sent? So we have location information for him in the early morning hours of the 6th to 12.30 a.m. and the next event being at 11.46 a.m. Both of those are consistent with uh, the proximity to Ms. Magbanawa's residence. Um, again, we don't have an event exactly at the time of that text message. Now, July 6, 2014, um, was that a weekend day, a Saturday or a Sunday, I believe? Uh, I believe it was, yes. Was that weekend the weekend of Harvey Adelson's birthday at the Adelson residence? Yes. Did Charlie Adelson also go to his parents' home at the Icon on that day that this message was sent? He did, yes. For events um, starting about 1228 in the afternoon of that date through a uh, little after nine, all of his uh, communication events are connecting to cell sites in that area of the Icon. All right, so now I wanna go forward to the July trip to Tallahassee. Can you walk us through, uh, well, I wanna talk about the location information surrounding the trip to Tallahassee that took place that week of July 14th that we saw referenced in the text message before. Um, Whose phone records did you have location information for for the July trip? Uh, as far as those traveling, we had location for both Mr. Garcia and Mr. Rivera. Okay, so before we had only Rivera, but now we've got both for the July trip. That's correct. Okay, was it a similar situation as the June trip where they rented a car in Miami and drove to Tallahassee? Yes. All right. You told us before that July 15th was the day that that car, that Prius was rented. For the June trip, we looked at the night before the car was rented and we saw some activity and some things on that day. Did you look at the night before the Prius was rented on July 14th, 2014 for the July trip? We did, yes. Okay, can you walk us through 
that night before the Prius was rented? Walk us through the communications and what happened that night. So we see uh, communication here between Ms. Magbanawa, um, Mr. Charlie Adelson, and Mr. Garcia. We have some calls uh, starting here in this summary a little after 7 p.m. and going through just prior to 2 a.m. will be the morning of the of the 15th. And when you say between the three of them, you mean Catherine Rambano is talking to Charlie Adelson, and then Catherine Rambano is also talking to Sigfredo Garcia at different times? That's correct. Okay. Garcia and Adelson are never talking. That's correct. Okay. All right. Were you able to find the location data um, or any messages between Adelson and Magbanwa that night? Yes. And again, going to uh, the iCloud return and looking at, on that date, um, we see a text message or a message from Mr. Adelson to Ms. Magbanwa where he indicates he had just tried calling her. We see that's at 856. At the top, we can see there was, in fact, at 853 an outbound call from Mr. Adelson to Ms. Magbanwa that only had a one second duration. Does his handset end up going down towards her residence? It does, yes. He indicates in messages that he's five minutes away and then on 79 in response to her request to eat uh, closer to her. And then we can see he has a cell site event at 9.27 p.m. where, again, his handset will be in the proximity of Ms. Magbanwa's residence. Okay. Um, and what time did he end up leaving that residence for good that night? Well, there's some travel around after that. Um, the handset returns to that area a little before 12.40. We have an event at 12.42 a.m. where we can see the handset is again in the area of Ms. Bagbanawa's residence. And then the next event we have at 1.02 a.m. We can see here to the left and up indicates that the handset has moved away from the area of her residence. Okay. Now going back, if you don't mind, to the call flurry, to the list of calls we saw, who does Catherine Magbanwa communicate with immediately after uh, Charlie Adelson leaves the area consistent with her home that night? So we see down the list here at 1248 AM. So that's about halfway through? That's about halfway through, yes. Okay. We see an outbound call from Ms. Magbanwa to Mr. Garcia. Okay. And what time did you have him last consistent Oops. with her residence? That was at 12.42. Okay, so 12.42 a.m. is the last time that Charlie Adelson is consistent with Magdanua's residence. After he leaves the area, we then see him quite a bit north at 1 something a.m. Correct. Approximately six minutes, though, after he last is consistent with the area, she's calling Sigfredo Garcia. That's correct. Okay. All right. Can we now look at July 15th of 2014, which is gonna be the day of the Prius rental? Yes. Again, we have a uh, number of communications between all of our parties for that day. And again, this summary is limited to just those persons. Um, but we can see as we go through here, um, one of the first calls, Mr. Garcia does communicate with other people in the overnight hour, but we see that at 9 a.m., um, he makes an outbound call to the Comfort Rental Car, which is the same rental company from the previous vehicle rental. So we see Charlie Adelson leave the area consistent with her residence at 1242. Then she calls Garcia at 1248. And then there's a num number of other calls, it looks like, between Magbanwa and Garcia in the one o'clock hour that morning? Yes. All right. And then Garcia, you said, calls Comfort Rental basically first thing in the morning as soon as that probably shortly after that company would have opened at 9 a.m. Yes, I don't know their exact hours, but yes, it's early in the morning. Okay. All right. So he calls Comfort Rental, and then what happens next? There's a series of calls throughout the day between, um, again, all of our parties. We see that at 4.28 p.m. Uh, is when he makes a call to Hybrid or Save Gas which ended up being the rental company for the Prius. We see that call is made. And we see that there are a number of communications um, between, uh, again, all of our parties, but ending down here at the bottom just after six uh, with Mr. Rivera, between Mr. Garcia and Mr. Rivera. Was there regular communication between Garcia and Magbanwa that day? There was, yes. And Garcia and Rivera? Yes. All right, so was law enforcement able to find that car rental agreement from Safe Gas? We were, yes. All right, can you walk us through that? 
So again, just a couple of excerpts from uh, that rental contract. We can see that the renter's name is Luis Rivera. We see written above that the indication of brother and it provides a phone number that is Mr. Garcia's phone number. And then down here at the bottom, we can see the um, Toyota Prius. We can see the color of it, the license plate, but that's the vehicle information. And that it shows being out at 6.15 p.m. Okay, can you tell us about the, their locations at that time? Did they have locations consistent with being at that rental? So looking at both of their location information, uh, Mr. <coughs> Rivera, by the nature of his carrier, has more events. I mean, he has several events uh, with a cell site in very close proximity to, uh, to the Save Gas rental. And Mr. Garcia has an event at 611. Again, the car was out at 615. Um, and he has an event also on a cell site in the immediate area of the Save Gas rental. All right, can you walk us through the communication between all of these players the day that this car was rented and right afterwards? So again, the evening time hours on the date of this rental, we can see that there are um, a number of communications. Um, and a, again, kind of looking at a summary of that, looking at the communications this time just between people, kind of tallying those together. But we can see that Charlie Adelson contacts the Adelson residence three times. Again, this is the evening hours of the 15th. Uh, three times for a combined 44 minutes and 17 seconds. And so you said before that there's only 28 calls total from him to his parents' residence from 2013 to 2016. But now from the time that the first car was rented that night and then now again the time that the second car was rented, four of those 28 calls are those days. Yes. Okay. What's next? We have uh, Mr. Harvey Adelson being contacted by the Adelson residence. Could that uh, be consistent with Donna Adelson being present at the residence and talking at the, at, on the landline phone? That's correct, yes. Okay. We have five communications between uh, Mr. Adelson, Charlie Adelson, and Ms. Mike Vanua, combined a little over 11, almost 12 minutes of communication. 32 times. Again, communications or attempted communications between uh, Ms. Bagbanawa and Mr. Garcia. Only about seven minutes and 41 seconds of communication. <coughs> Mr. Rivera and Mr. Garcia communicate 10 times. A little over three minutes of communication. I believe that's it. Okay. And on July 15th, did um, any of the parties ever meet up that night? Yes. Okay, can you tell us about that? Well, we see in, again, going back to uh, the call detail summary, this is Mr. Garcia's records, we see that he has a number of communications to Ms. Bagbanawa, and that ends at 9.30. So we have a number of attempts, we see here 8.45 um, up through 9.30, a number of communications or attempts, and then it kind of ends at 9.30. So what we see looking at Ms. Bagbanawa's locations, that will be consistent with her being at her residence. And then if we look at Mr. Garcia's resident or Mr. Garcia's cell site information after that 930 timeframe, we see that his location information would also be consistent with her residence. Okay, and was there a GPS that, um, that pinged that night? And where was that? Yes, and we also see that uh, again, another location from the rental vehicle uh, and we see it's represented by the blue square, it's proximity to her residence. Okay, and did Garcia and Rivera's phones appear to leave the Miami area the next day on July 16th of 2014? They did, yes. Here again, we have um, Mr. Rivera's information represented by the blue towers, Mr. Garcia by the orange, and we can see that both of their handsets are consistent with traveling from Miami to Tallahassee. <coughs> Obviously, we have a number of events here in this time frame, so we can't see every single time. Some of them are kind of hidden behind other labels, but we can uh, pretty clearly see the general time frame of that trip getting into Tallahassee in the very early morning hours of the 17th. All right, um, were either of their phones ever consistent with being near Markel's residence on Trescott on July 17th, the next day, um, which was the day that Rivera said that they were doing some surveillance 
on Markell? Yes, again, here we see the location of Mr. Markell's residence on Trescott Drive by the yellow flag. We see the blue arrows that represent the cell sites and sectors that Mr. Rivera's handset was communicating with. We can see how those are oriented, that they're both towards the area of Mr. Adelson's re or Mr. Markell's residence. We also see a cell site and sector represented by the orange arrow for Mr. Garcia. We see it's also oriented towards uh, the residents and will be consistent with being in that area. Was there <coughs> communication between all the conspirators between July 16th and July 17th during this travel to Tallahassee and on the day that there was surveillance done in Tallahassee on July 16th and 17th? Yes, again, this is just the summary of the communication during that time frame. We can see again that there are a number of communications between our uh, involved parties. If we could focus in on the very late night hours on July 17th of 2014. So this would be the night before Dan Markell was murdered. That's correct. The night before and into the very early morning hours of Mr. Um, Markell's murder. We do see events here starting at 1018. And same thing, we can kind of look through and see uh, who's communicating with who. 1018, we have a call from Charlie Adelson to Don Adelson for about four and a half minutes. Another call for just over four minutes at 1029. We have Ms. Magbanoa again attempting to contact Mr. Rivera at the old number, same number we saw earlier. Ms. Magbanoa attempting to call Mr. Garcia Another attempt to Mr. Rivera's old number. We're now at 1141. There is a call to Mr. Garcia for about 10 minutes. Could these calls previous to that be consistent with her not being able to reach Garcia? So she calls a friend of his to try to talk to him? Yes, generally preceding the calls to Mr. Rivera's old number, we see attempts into Mr. Garcia where um, they do not appear to connect. They're very short duration, which could be consistent with her not being able to get hold of Mr. Garcia. And then the attempt to Mr. Rivera's uh, old number. Okay. So it ringing or maybe leaving a voicemail, but not like some long conversation. Correct. Okay. So what's next? So 1201, um, Ms. Bagbanoa again reached out for Mr. Garcia. 1207, Mr. Charlie Adelson is uh, contacting Ms. Magbanoa a little over three and a half minutes. 12.30, Ms. Magbanoa calls Mr. Adelson back, 53 seconds. There's an outgoing call at 102. It does not really have a duration, but there is an outgoing call in Mr. Adelson's records to uh, Donna Adelson. And this is at 1 a.m.? That's at 102 a.m. Okay, and then what does he do next? <clears throat> and then at 103, immediately after, there is the outbound call to Ms. Magbanoa for almost 20 minutes. All right, so now if we can go to the next day, July 18th of 2014, uh, the day Dan Markell was murdered. What can you tell us about communication between all of these players that morning? So again, same uh, summary for the morning of the 18th. We can see communications between um, our involved subjects here and uh, we have an indication here, this would represent the time that Mr. Markell was murdered um, between these events. And we can look at these kind of in detail again as we have. Okay, and what do we see as far as their communication? So here we have also included um, the information from Wendy Adelson's forensic extraction or her Cellbrite report. So we're able to see other things that were uh, contained in her phone. One of the first things we see is that she had a calendar entry um, for that day for listed as fixed TV. Um, now we see that it's deleted. Yes. When would that have been deleted? Uh, sometime prior to our analysis of the handset. And your analysis of the handset was done that same day? <coughs> it was done, yes, the afternoon of the 18th. Okay. So this calendar event, fixed TV, was deleted at some point before her phone was taken by law enforcement and and looked at that afternoon? That's correct. Okay, go ahead. Then we see that there is an outbound call from Wendy Adelson to Donna Adelson. And that's starting at 8.09 in the morning? 
That's correct. Okay. An immediate return attempt. And then a text message. Again, this is from uh, Wendy Adelson's uh, handset itself, but there is a return text message or a text message from Don Adelson to Wendy um, communicating about Best Buy and coming by for the repair of the TVs. Okay, she says, Best Buy just called me and I told them to confirm with you. They are on their way over now to help you with the TV set in your living room. Yes. Okay. All right, what's next? We have a text to from Wendy Adelson to Charlie Adelson stating this is so sweet. We see that that's deleted. It is, yes. <laughs> that would have also been deleted prior to law enforcement um, analyzing her cell phone that afternoon, the same day as Dan Markell's murder? That's correct. Okay, what's next? An attempt from Charlie Adelson to call Wendy Adelson. And then a return call from Wendy Adelson to Charlie that lasted just over 18 minutes. And what about after that 18 minute call between Charlie Adelson and Wendy Adelson? Well, there's a, this will probably be almost during that, but there's a 938 call, um, or just after that, from Charlie Adelson to Donna Adelson, an attempt for 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then at 957, again, an outbound from Charlie Adelson to Miss Mike Banawa, 12 seconds. Return call, 958, 13 seconds. And again, Mr. Adelson to Ms. Bagbanoa for six minutes and 46 seconds. Charlie Adelson again attempts to call Wendy Adelson at 10.06 a.m. 10.07, 10.08, there's a couple of contacts between Ms. Bagbanoa and Mr. Adelson, one just over a minute and one about nine seconds. And then 10.09, Charlie Adelson called to Ms. Bagbanoa for uh, five minutes and 54 seconds. All right, and then I guess the last time we have here is 10.09 a.m. By less than an hour after that, Dan Martell is murdered. That's correct. Okay. All right, so what can you tell us about, I know you already showed us Dan Markell's locations the morning that he was murdered. Um, I'd like, could you show those to us one more time? I can, yes. Okay. So again, we have the Trescott Drive where he departed from, the Creative Preschool where he dropped his kids off, and Premier Health and Fitness where he worked out before returning back to Trescott Drive. What can you tell us about Rivera and Garcia's handset locations that morning, looking at phone records and also any other evidence that law enforcement was able to gather? So again, from the uh, surveillance video of Premier Health and Fitness, we do see the green Prius entering the parking lot. Um, following Mr. Markell, we know from Mr. Garcia's records, we have events at 9.36 a.m. and 9.58 a.m where his handset is communicating with a cell site in a sector that will be consistent with Premier Health and Fitness. And Mr. Rivera's handset has the events we see here between about 914 and 944, all of them together, that are communicating with two different cell sites and sectors, again, both of which, which would be consistent with a handset being at or near Premier Health and Fitness. Um, and these are two different carriers, you said, right? That's correct. But they're in the same location, even though they're communicating with cell sites that are in different places. Yes, sometimes the carriers are what we call co-located, where we may have more than one carrier at the same set base, same site, um, sometimes on the same tower or same equipment. And then sometimes they will have uh, towers that are not that close or in different um, locations from the other carriers. So here we can see between the orange arrows and the blue arrows, that AT&T and T-Mobile have some cell sites that are close together and some that are further apart. But all of those, the ones that are being used, will be consistent with a handset at or near their Premier Health and Fitness. All right, so even though they don't have any other locations after 9.58 a.m. for cell phone events, what time do we know that they left the Premier Gym area from the surveillance video? We see the time on the surveillance video just after 10.38 a.m. We see Mr. Markell's vehicle. 
And then we see the green Prius, Mr. Garcia, Mr. Rivera, again, leaving the gym area. All right, so his last, Garcia's last location uh, from his cell phone records was 9.58 a.m. when he was consistent with Premier. What's the location for his next active event on his cell phone? So the next event that we see is at 12.30 p.m. We can see here that it has traveled a reasonable distance from Tallahassee before we see that next event. And is he the orange dot here with 12.30 p.m. next to it? He is, yes. Okay. That looks around about Gainesville-ish area? Uh, north of that, yes. A little north of Gainesville. All right, so that's the first phone call that Garcia made after leaving Premier? Yes, that's the first event with location that we have. Looking at his phone records, what do his phone records indicate about the status of his phone during that time where we don't see any events? Well, what we see, uh, we see the 958 event, an incoming text, we see some events, 1218, 1219, there's two incoming calls from this 305 number, um, very short duration, and we don't see locations for those. So those calls did not reach the handset. Powered off, battery went dead, broken, whatever it may be, but those calls did not reach the handset. 1229 and 1230, we see these short codes or these short three digit numbers here, and those are associated with T-Mobile voicemail events. Um, and then immediately at 1230, we have the outgoing voice call um, that provides location. So that would indicate that the handset was now back in service with the network. And could that be consistent with him turning off his phone after he left Premier and then powering it back on after he figured he was far enough away from Tallahassee? It could be consistent with that, yes. And then who was his first call at 1230 when he was north of Gainesville? Who was the first call that either of these Garcia or Rivera makes after the murder? Miss Bagbanner. Okay, can you show that to us? That was the 1230 call? Yes. We see a very short duration. Is that 20 seconds? It is, yes. Okay. All right, switching gears here, I want to see where Wendy Adelson was during that late morning, early afternoon time when Markel was murdered and during the couple hours after. Um, are you familiar with her statement about her locations on July 18th as far as being at home for her TV repair appointment, then going to ABC Liquors to buy a gift, and then going to lunch at Mosaic? Yes, I am. All right. Based on the, her call detail records, were you able to um, um, determine where, what time she would have gone by the Trescott Drive area? Yes, we do know the location of her residence at the time here on Aqua Ridge Way. We do know that she was going to the ABC. This was located on Thomasville Road. Um, looking at her records, she has a, a rather lengthy voice call. It begins at 12.31 p.m. We see that's on a cell site that would be consistent with the general area of her residence. We see at 12.35 p.m., kind of in the middle of the screen here, her handset's now um, kind of halfway between there. And then that call ends at 12.47 p.m. and it ends on a cell site here very close to uh, ABC uh, Liquor Store. So looking at that, <coughs> again, the receipt time, 12.49, the call ending time, 12.47, um, we can kind of approximate that she would have been by the Trescott residence you know, at, at 10 or so minutes earlier than that. Okay, are you familiar with Officer Brandon's statements that he saw a, a person in a, a red van that matched the description of Wendy Adelson's vehicle um, at the roadblock at Trescott Drive um, that day in the 12 to 1 o'clock hour? Yes. All right. About what time would she have been in the area of Trescott Drive when she's on her way from home to ABC? Well, again, I would say sometime between 1235 and 1247 or 1249 for sure at the uh, absolute because she would have been in the store at that point um, for the transaction. So some, sometime in that 1240 time frame. Okay. Now, did Dan Markell have he and Wendy Adelson's children the morning of July 18th? He did, yes. All right. And he had taken them to school that morning, right? Yes. All right. Looking at um, her cell bright, were you able to see her calls that morning after she would have past this Trescott Drive area? Yes. All right. 
After driving by that street, the road being blocked, the crime scene tape, and police cars, did she attempt to contact Dan Markell to make sure he was okay or the kids were okay? Here we've kind of highlighted the calls that were made after that time, starting at 1247, and we can see that there are to a variety of people. Um, none of them were Mr. Markell. Did she attempt to contact uh, Creative Preschool? make sure the kids made it to school. There wasn't type, some type of incident at the house. She did not. Did she attempt to call 911 or law enforcement to check and see what was going on since her kids were staying on that street? She did not. She just continued on to ABC and then up to Mosaic? Correct. Now, are you familiar with the area at Thomasville Road and I-10 where Mosaic was located back in 2014 when it was around? Yes. Were there any liquor stores in that area back in July of 2014? There were, yes. Okay, which ones? So we have the Publix Liquor Store. They're off of Thomasville Road, Market Square Liquors, Market Square Shopping Center, and there is another ABC location a little further north on Thomasville Road. What route could she have taken to one of those three liquor stores? Of many, the one of the routes is the one depicted here by the red dashed lines, um, which would have taken her up Centerville Road and then over to Thomasville and down to Mosaic. What route did she actually take to go to the ABC liquor down on Thomasville and then to Mosaic? So we can see here her um, path would have been the purple line and the shortest distance again being the red dotted line. Now I know. I mean, obviously that looks like the shortest distance, but how much shorter are we talking about? Oops. So we can only, uh, our mapping, our GIS software is able to provide uh, approximate travel times and distances, kind of like Google Maps. Um, and so what we can see is that the miles for the shortest route would have been 3.63, and they estimate travel time in about 11 minutes. The uh, other travel was almost nine and a half miles which they estimate travel at a little over 20 minutes. Okay, so switching gears here again one more time. Still on July 18th, but now switching back to Garcia and Rivera, who we last heard had um, it, their cell phone records were consistent with turning off the phones, turning them back on again above Gainesville, a call from Garcia to Meg Banwa for 20 seconds. What happens after that? So again, yes, we see their travel back. There's fewer communications, fewer dots on the map um, during fewer their return. Fewer dots than when they, when they drove up? Correct, sorry, yes. Okay. Uh, we see the, they reach the South Florida area in the, just after 6 p.m. Uh, on the evening or afternoon of the 18th. And then the first thing that we see or information we have is a ATM transaction um, from Mr. Rivera. Okay. Uh, based on the ATM transaction that was seen in the bank records, what did law enforcement do? So first we look at the location information from the handsets to make sure that it's consistent. <clears throat> we do see around the time of that transaction, we do see both Mr. Rivera and Mr. Garcia's handsets communicating with cell sites around the area of the bank. And then uh, investigators were able to yeah. locate the surveillance video from the ATM. We can see uh, Mr. Rivera see Mr. Garcia in the passenger seat, and we see the green Prius. Okay, continuing on, once they get back to Miami, after they go to this ATM, can you show us the communication between all these parties on July 18th that evening? Okay, yes. so what we see here is all the communication between all of these parties, starting at that 1230 call from Garcia to McBanwa, and then down through midnight that night. Uh, down through 1020 in this particular summary. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, can we focus in on later that evening and I believe the 8, 9 o'clock hour? Yes. Okay, so um, who is Catherine McBanwell communicating with that evening around that time? Well, we see communication with uh, Mr. Adelson and uh, Mr. Garcia, but the uh, communications with Mr. Garcia end here, this 946 is the last event, um, where her handset communicates with Mr. Garcia's that evening. Okay, and who also is she talking with that, that evening? In addition to the communication with our um, subjects that we've been looking at, we've added in Ms. Yendra Mascaro, uh, 
uh, and we see that Ms. Magbanawa is communicating with her through the evening hours um, also on this uh, 18th of July. Okay, and are you familiar with the statements from Ms. Mascaro and Ms. Magbanawa? <coughs> Ms. Mascaro um, babysits her kids or was babysitting her kid on the night of July 18th? Yes, I am. Okay, so after her communication with Ms. Mascaro, what happens next? So what we see events earlier in the lower right hand side, we see cell site events in the 710 to 846, which would be consistent with uh, Ms. Bagbanawa's residence. The next events we see 920, 923, be consistent with her moving away. And ultimately 942, uh, one of those last events we saw with Mr. Garcia, her handset is now communicating with the cell site in proximity to Mr. Rivera's residence. We know that also on the way is Ms. Mascara's residence, relatively on the way. Okay, so that could be consistent with her dropping her children off at Mascara's and then heading back up towards Rivera's residence? Yes. Okay, so um, what about Garcia and Rivera? Were they ever consistent with uh, Rivera's residence that evening? Yes. Here uh, for Ms. Bagbanawa, her, her 946-947 events, and looking at the sector that she's using, again, consistent with Mr. Rivera's residence. And if we look at um, all of the cell site usage for Mr. Garcia and Mr. Rivera, they are also consistent with the area of Mr. Rivera's residence. Okay, and who did she speak to on the phone during the 10 o'clock hour? Uh, there's uh, contacts with uh, Mr. Adelson. We see, oops, we see at 10, 12, there is, uh, Mr. Adelson attempts to call Ms. Bagbanawa, two seconds. And then at 10, 20, Ms. Bagbanawa uh, calls Mr. Charlie Adelson uh, for a minute and 56 seconds. Were you able to find any other evidence um, about Catherine Magbanwa and Charlie Edelson's plans that night? Yes, again, going back to um, her location information here, the 1020, 1022, she is fine, uh, consistent still with the area of Mr. Uh, Rivera's residence for those two events. And then we see um, communication from the iCloud through the evening hours of the 18th uh, between Mr. Edelson and Ms. Bagbanwa. Okay, and it appears he's pretty, Charlie Adelson's pretty busy at work that evening? Yes. Okay, um, at 8.23 he says, just finishing, I'm not feeling good, maybe we can just hang out at my house? That's correct. Okay, um, and this statement about not, he's not feeling good, is that, would that be before Catherine Magbanoa? Would that be before Math Catherine Magbanoa goes to Charlie Adelson's house that evening? It would be, yes. Okay, so at 8.23, she's still over more consistent with her residence and on her way to Rivera's residence. Correct. Okay. All right, so after he says he's not really feeling well, maybe they can just hang out at their house. Um, then we see the call with them, you said at, at I believe, 10.20? Yes. All right, and where she's still consistent with Rivera's house at that time? That's correct. What can you tell us about Charlie Adelson's locations? So we can see uh, first event here, 9.19 p.m. We see the cell site is represented by the green dots. Um, at the top of our screen, 9.21, a little further south, and then 9.40 and 11.39, and the next events we have with location would be consistent with the area of his residence. Okay. Now, who arrived at Charlie Adelson's residence during the time when Magbanwa was still consistent with Rivera's residence? Uh, Donna and Hartby Adelson. Okay. Foundation. Okay. I could rephrase my question, Judge, too. Would that be all right? Okay. Go ahead and do that. Was there some evidence in the iCloud um, involving messages between Donna Adelson and Charlie Adelson where she says she is at his house on the evening of July 18th during a time when Catherine Magbanua is still more consistent with Rivera's house? Yes. Okay, can you show us that message? I can. Okay. So Donna Adelson here says, call us ASAP at 7.12 p.m.? Yes. And then at 8.59 p.m., she says, outside your house? Yes. And Charlie Adelson says, 10 minutes at 9.19? Correct. Okay. 
10, about 10 minutes from when he sent that text message, so maybe about 9.30 p.m., is that when he's consistent with being at his house? Yes. And according to this message, his mother is already there? That's correct. All right, does Charlie Adelson stay at his house that evening? He does, yes. Okay, so you, the location we saw before, he was still there at 11.39 p.m.? That's correct. All right. Let's go to the next day then, July 19th, 2014. So this would be the, the morning after the murder of Dan Markell. What can you tell us about Charlie Adelson's location that morning? So we see his events 10.22 through 11.09 a.m. He's still communicating with a cell site adjacent to his residence. Okay, and what can you tell us about the communication from Catherine McVanwas phone that morning? Uh, well, we see that um, we have some events here, 308, this is again the morning of the 19th, uh, just Ms. Magbanoa's uh, records. We see three attempts from Mr. Garcia to call her, beginning at 308 through 326 AM, and they're all short duration, 41 seconds or less. But those are three incoming calls from Mr. Garcia um, to Ms. Magbanoa. Those, Go ahead. I'm sorry, those records do not have location. So again, meaning that those calls did not actually reach her handset, her handset was not in communication with a network at that time. Okay, thank you. That was my question, is did she have location? So no location because her phone was not connected to the network. Could that be consistent with her phone being off? Yes. So the last location then we have from her before the morning of July 19th is when she's consistent with being near Rivera's residence and she's speaking to Charlie Adelson on the phone about 10 to 1 p.m. the night before. That's correct. Okay, what is Catherine McBanwa's first location on her call detail records that next morning on July 19th? So the first location that we see, um, we saw the calls, the outbound calls there at 9.44 a.m. We can see the cell sites, again, hers represented by the red dots. Um, that will be consistent with travel south from the area of Mr. Adelson's residence or somewhere south of that towards um, Mr. Rivera's residence. Okay, so could this be consistent with her leaving Rivera's residence, turning her phone off, going to Charlie Adelson's home as they discussed in those texts we saw, and then turning her phone back on as she's coming from the direction of his house? Yes. All right, and if from the records you just showed us, it looks like she was repeatedly trying to reach Sigfredo Garcia starting at 9.44 a.m.? That's correct. Was she able to reach him? Did any of those calls connect? They did not. Um, why not? Well, if we look at Mr. Garcia's records, um, we can see here that he has an event at 5.12 a.m. Um, where there is a successful completion of that call and then his event starting at 7.09 have no location. This is a sample of the T-Mobile records, um, Metro PCS records, and we see that there is no cell site identifier, so none of these calls after that are reaching his phone. So again, his handset is now off the network, unable to communicate, battery went dead, whatever the case may be, but there is no more events in his records that actually uh, reach his handset. What was his last known location before his phone went off the network? It would have been the area of his uh, girlfriend's residence at that point. Okay, was her name Stephanie Carmona? Yes. Okay, um, and could this be consistent with him basically getting rid of, dumping his phone the night of Dan Markell's murder or the early morning hours the morning afterwards? Yes. Does he ever have any more communication on the phone after that? Uh, for the records that we have, there are no more uh, originating communications. There's no communications that actually reach the handset. There's no indication that that handset is used at all after this 5.12 a.m. event. Okay. Now tell us about the other attempted communication with Sigfredo Garcia's phone on July 19th that morning that, that are relevant to this case. So there are a number of communications um, between, again, Ms. Magbanoa attempting to reach Mr. Garcia. Ms. Magbanoa reaches out to another um, phone number as associated with uh, Mr. Rivera and Mr. Garcia, uh, attempts to um, communicate with them. And then for the first time we see Mr. Rivera actually call in to Ms. Bagbanoa um, from his actual phone. Uh, and there's more calls that go back and forth throughout the morning. And then all that kind of culminates at 10.31 a.m. where we see that last communication between uh, where Ms. Bagbanoa was trying to communicate with either Mr. Rivera or Mr. Garcia. 
And that number associated with them, that Anthony Ortiz person, is he a documented kind of friend of Garcia and Rivera's? Yes. Okay. Um, so this could be consistent with her not being able to get in touch with him, so she's calling friends of his to get to find him. That's correct. All right. And what about Rivera's location that morning? What, is, what did his record show us? Uh, he shows us that he was uh, near his residence, um, and then at some point he travels to the area consistent with Ms. Um, Carmona's residence, Mr. Garcia's uh, girlfriend's residence, and then returns to the area of his residence. Could that be consistent with nobody being able to get in touch with Garcia, so Rivera goes out to find him, get him, and bring him back? Yes. Okay. And does this kind of flurry of attempts to get in touch with Garcia abruptly stop at the 1030 time frame? Yes. And that's when the calls between Magbanwa and Rivera stop too? Correct. All right, what is the next, um, or tell us about the location then at 1031 after this flurry stops. So picking up with Ms. Magbanwa's locations from the previous um, 9.47 a.m., she's getting closer to Mr. Rivera's uh, residence. Events from 10.02 to 10.25 is communicating with a cell site again, relatively close to Mr. Rivera's residence. Um, and then that final event, we saw that final communication at 10.31 a.m. Um, we see, again, looking at the sector that her handset is using, that it is consistent with Mr. Rivera's residence. So could this be consistent, or is Rivera's location here after his phone travels out from Carmona's and back? Yes, we do have events with uh, Mr. Rivera. Um, these are the times, approximate locations, the cell sites, again, consistent with his residence. All right, so could this be that, could it be that Magbanua, Garcia, and Rivera are all consistent with being at Rivera's residence at the same time that morning? It could be, yes. Okay. All right, when is Catherine Magbanua's next communication on her phone? So the next communication that we have is 11.23 a.m. So an about outgoing. 50 minutes later? Yes. All right, and... Where was her phone located 50 minutes later at 1123? So 1123, we see the cell site and sector that her handset is using. Um, it will be consistent with having moved away from Mr. Rivera's. It's now south of Mr. Rivera's um, and could be consistent with um, <coughs> Ms. Mascaro's residence. Okay, could this be consistent with her leaving Adelson's house that morning, dropping the money off, and then going to pick up her kids from Mascaro's? Yes. All right. Um, I want to move on to our next section, which is I wanted to ask you about some different messages that you found in the iCloud, and then we'll be it, and then we'll be done. Okay. So the defense theory in this case is that Catherine Urbanois frantically showed up at the defendant's home the night of July 18th, informed him that some violent men killed his brother-in-law, and were now blackmailing. Were there any text messages between Magbanwa and Adelson about blackmail or extortion in the days following the Dan Markell murder? Uh, certainly none that I found. Can you show us the text between Magbanwa and the defendant in the week that followed the murder? So these are some text um, from that week. This would be July 19th. This would be the day after the homicide. Um, these texts start at 1213, just after noon on the 19th and we see them uh, going back and forth about going to the pool or the beach um, and kind of casual conversation. Okay, so this is the day that, the same day of all the call activity we just saw. Yes. And locations we just saw. And so sometime after noon at 12.13, Charlie Adelson says he's headed to the gym. Are you going to the beach? It's so nice. Yes. Okay. Looking at also that week, looking at your next slide, July 22nd. They're talking a little bit about the weather, how late it is in the day. Catherine Magbanwa asked for Jerry to call in a prescription scalp medication. Yes, a prescription for shampoo. Okay, Sham prescription shampoo, okay. All right, and what's next? So on July 23rd.
So on this one, Charlie Adelson says, don't forget to text Jerry your info. He'll call it in in the morning, sweet dreams. And then later she says something that he says, laugh out loud to you. Correct, yes. All right, what's next? So the July 25th. So on July 25th, she says, have a good day, smiley face. He says, you too. Yes. In all of the messages, or um, let me, in all of the messages from the records between this defendant and Catherine Van Wall from 2014 to 2016, are there any messages where they discuss Charlie Adelson being blackmailed or extorted or violent people wanting to hurt his family, anything like that? None that I found. During those years, though, I mean, do the defendant and Catherine McBanois stay in regular contact with each other, even after they, they break up that fall in yes. 2014? Okay. Um, from the messages, do they appear to have a close friendship? They do, yes. Okay. And when I say in regular contact, sometimes they talk multiple times a day, every day. Correct. All right. I want you, can you show us just a couple of examples of their close friendship? Can you show us October 6, 2014? Yes, so this talks and these um, be 2.18 in the morning. Uh, or I'm sorry, 2.18 in the afternoon of uh, October 6th. There's communication about him being uh, a good father, uh, potential to be a good father. Okay, and he's, she's saying that you have to find the right girl that you can deal with and to see if she's worth it? Yes. Okay, and what's next? And if she gives you hell, Catherine Mary Van Wall will set her straight, winky face, and he says, I love you. It makes me feel good that you care about me. I'm very lucky to have you as part of my life. And he says, I'll always care about you. That's correct. Or she says that, rather. That's correct. All right. Next, she says, no, can we go back to the next one then after he says, He's lucky to have her as part of his life. Yes, I'm going to need to fix something on that slide. Okay, no problem. Judge, for time purposes, maybe you have 10 minutes left, I would say. 15 minutes left, if that. Okay. Um, can you show us the next one? Okay, yes. I think that's the last one we read. Okay. Can you go to the next one after that? All right. She says... Here she says, I always know, this is in February of 2015, is that correct? Correct, February 24th. He, she says, see, I always know how to make you smile. He says, yes, you do. She says, good, I love you. He says, I love you too. Correct. All right, what's next? On October 27th of 2015, she says, hey, you're probably busy celebrating your birthday. I just want to thank you so much for helping me out. I love you. I, I love you, have a great birthday, I hope I see you soon this week. And he says, can't wait to get lunch with you. You're the best, and I'm lucky to have you as a friend for life, smiley face. Yes. Okay, what's next? All right, and then this one, they kind of exchange, you don't miss me, I do miss you, with some, okay. Yep. Go to the next one. All right. Um, this one, they're talking about something, and he ends it with, LOL, you're the best. Correct. 
And LOL, does that mean laugh out loud? It does, yes. All right. Were you involved in securing a wiretap of some of the suspects in this case in 2016? Yes. And what is a wiretap? A wiretap is sort of a general term for our ability to intercept either wire communications, something said over a phone line, electronic communications, maybe a text, or oral communications, things that are spoken. But when law enforcement is able to lawfully intercept those to record them um, during the course of an investigation. Does an order have to be signed by a judge and sent to the phone carrier in order to have authority to conduct a wiretap? Yes. And so because of that, I mean, are we able to go back and, and listen to the content of these phone calls that we've seen today from back in 2014? No, we don't have the ability to go back and record phone calls in the past. The only way that we would know about communications would be um, if we were to extract a phone, like we see the um, cell bright extractions or forensic extractions of phones, we may be able to see some text messages, but we don't have the ability to capture things back in the past. At that time, we didn't know that a crime was about to be committed. That's correct. Okay. Um, but if for a wiretap investigation, pol police can get that order to listen to suspects' phones in real time. That's correct. All right. Can you explain to the jury what type of equipment is needed to conduct a wiretap? Uh, certainly, it's, it's relatively complicated in today's world, but there is equipment on the carrier side where they're able to um, send us information about the activity, the text message content and information about the calls, who's calling who, all of that information. And then they're also able to send us the actual content. So they're able to send us the audio when someone's on a phone call of what's being spoken. And then we have computer servers that receive that information and software that displays it for us, a, an intercept um, kind of interface where we're able to see the incoming calls. We have some controls where we can um, play calls back and we can see um, you know, calls for the day, write synopsis for them as they're coming in. Um, so it's, it, again, a lot of computer equipment necessary uh, to, to conduct that. Do the people who are listening or monitoring to these calls in real time have to go through certain types of training to do that? They do. Um, first, we do what we call minimization training. And we are not, law enforcement, we're not allowed to intercept calls that may be privileged or not relevant to the investigation. So we can't listen to everything that is said. So the first thing that a monitor or someone who's listening has to know is one about the investigation. So they have to read that affidavit, the application for the wiretap. They have to read that thoroughly and be briefed on the investigation so that they know the relevant persons, the relevant evidence that we're looking for, um, <clears throat> kind of the history of the investigation, so they have some context when they're listening to these um, calls going on. And then they have training on how to actually do that minimization, how to actually stop the recording, <clears throat> so that we can't hear that information, we can't record that information that we don't believe is relevant um, or authorized under the order. So they receive, again, training about the investigation and then how to actually operate the software. And they're required to minimize it, right? If it's not relevant to the investigation, it's not That a is choice. correct, yes. Okay. And are you limited in time to, to decide whether the conversation is relevant or not? We are. Again, everything is geared towards not intercepting communications that we shouldn't. So uh, for uh, parties that we know never talk about anything relevant, then that period of time that we listen may be less. And then we immediately minimize because we know historically they never talk about anything that's relevant to the investigation. For parties that do communicate about the investigation, then that period of time may be a little longer. Um, the amount of time that we stay minimized or the amount of time that we come off of that <clears throat> before we come back and spot check or we will come back and see if the topic of the conversation has changed. Are they now talking about something that's relevant? Again, that varies a little bit based on the monitor's knowledge of the case, history of communication between them. But yes, we do have some guidelines for the amount of time that we can listen and how long before we can go back. Okay, how can we as listeners of the call tell if an officer is doing that? Uh, you'll hear an audible tone uh, during the call. It's an abrupt audible tone. Um, and is the portion of the call that is minimized recorded then? It is not recorded. All right, when listening, do you have to be on the lookout for suspects who may try to mask the meaning of what they're talking about just in case law enforcement is listening? Yes. Is that common for people to do? Uh, it is, yes. 
All right, and were Catherine McVanwa and Charlie Adelson's phones tapped in this case? They were, yes. All right, who supervises these uh, wire calls? Uh, I was the wire room supervisor, the person responsible for kind of the technical side of it. Um, and then from the legal side, there is a, a state attorney assigned that is um, uh, conducts the training, keeps up with the investigation, and ultimately a judge who authorized it. And who keeps or maintains the recordings of the calls? Uh, during the investigation or during the, the course of the wiretap, we have a partnership with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. They're the first point that receives that and sends it on to us. They maintain those originally and then at the completion of it, um, those tapes are transferred to us in our custody and maintained securely. Okay. All right, so the, the bump in this case, was that at 1.47 p.m. on April 19th, 2016? When I say the bump, I mean when Donna Adelson was approached by the undercover officer and handed the article about Dan Markell's murder? Yes. All right, so looking at 1.47 p.m. on April 19th, 2016, who was Donna Adelson's first call after the bump? Can you tell us that from the call detail records? I can, yes. <clears throat> So we see here her records from that date. The red line in, uh, indicates the time of the bump or the time of the contact. And uh, we see that her first call at 2.09 p.m. is outgoing to Charlie Adelson. We have seen um, and heard about emails in the course of the trial which detailed Donna Adelson's strong interest in the divorce of Wendy Adelson and Dan Markell. Is there phone communication in the iCloud between Charlie Adelson and Donna Adelson that shows Charlie Adelson's interest in the divorce? Yes. Okay. Can you show us um, that first message? Uh, looking at maybe October of 2013, was there a message in mid-October about that? All right, what does this say? So this is from Donna Adelson to Charlie Adelson. Uh, it says, Hor a horrible evening for your sister and for us. Dad finally had to walk outside to lower his blood pressure. Just awful. I can't even explain. She says she's on the way back to Wendy's house. Okay, yes. Okay, can we go to the next slide? Um, now on the slide before, um, did it say, I bet let's talk this week by Charlie Adelson after he heard that? Yes. Okay, looking at the next slide, what happened on October 30th of 2013? There is again a message from Donna Adelson indicating she just got a text from Wendy mentioning that she's moving ahead with the purchase of a home. Okay. And what does Charlie Adelson respond to that? Can you read those to us? He indicates uh, she never told me why is she doing this? She never mentions it to me on the phone. I guess it's because it's stupid. Did Danny give her permission to move schools? Okay, and what does he say after that? He says he will hold that over her and use it as leverage, especially after she puts money down. She is really stupid. Give them their asking price, question marks. And what about after that? says, I can try again, but I only talk to her about one time a week and leave about seven messages. And then okay. he indicates this would be uh, October 31st, and the times here on these messages are still in coordinated universal time. So in October, we're uh, four hours behind, but that should be about 1 a.m. But he says, spoke to Wendy. I think I made some headway. Hope you're having an awesome time in Israel. Have a good night. Okay. Now, the times that we saw earlier in your presentation, those have all already been converted to the actual time that that was sent, right? That's correct. Everything okay. up to this point um, has been converted to our local time. And I do point out that communications with Donna here that we've just been talking about, those, if you notice the time in the bottom of the messages, still say UTC plus zero, which means there's been no offset or subtracting of time to get to our local time zone. So in those messages, he seems to be thinking that her buying a house is not a good idea. Danny will hold it over her head, use it as leverage, and he's trying to talk her out of it. Correct. All right, and then what's the next message to his mom? Wait, I'm sorry, what was, did you read the last one? I did, uh, spoke to Wendy, I think I made some headway. Hope you're having an awesome time in Israel, have a good night. Okay, 
And how does his mom respond? Okay, um, let me go to... Just indicates that uh, the Adelsons appear to be in Israel at the time um, and look forward to speaking with him soon. Okay, Danny sent them some pictures of the kids in Halloween costumes, it says? Yes. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So Charlie states, uh, spoke to Wendy for 20 minutes last night. She texted me today that she pulled the plug on the house. Okay, with some smiley faces? Yes. And how does, she, and how does Donna Adelson respond? Uh, wow, Charlie, thank you again. How did you accomplish that? You're a miracle worker, tell us. Okay, lots of exclamation points used there. Yes. And this is on Halloween of 2013, on October 31st of October 21st, 31st of 2013, and then the day after? Uh, yes. Okay, and then the conversations about her buying the house and Charlie Adelson against it, that was all the day before Halloween of 2013? Yes. Could buying a house in uh, an area be um, unfavorable for like a motion for relocation? Uh, I believe so, yes. All right, what about in February of 2014? I believe there's more here in this exchange from November 1st. This will be the continuation of the October 30th to the 31st to the 1st. Okay. But he indicates um, in response to the question of how did you accomplish it, he responds with a series of text about how that went. So he, Danny would have used it against Wendy as leverage. She needs to get permission from him. He has several other reasons why it would have been the dumbest mistake of her life, the second dumbest mistake of her life. Yes. Okay, and what's next? It says it took about 15 minutes of talking to her. I basically told her owning a house is like getting married, renting is like dating. Why the F would you want to get married again? Okay. And what's next in February of 2014? Was there some more messages from the mom? Yeah, so February 15th of 2014. So it's been in the evening hours or afternoon hours. Um, Donna Adelson indicates that Wendy is stressed out. Okay. Um, does she say that she'll have to go, Wendy will have to go through another depo? Could that be short for deposition? Yes. Is that where the other side's attorney gets to ask you a bunch of questions? It is, yes. That, that's outrageous. They're talking about repetitive motions being filed and the half million dollar account is the same 50,000 he tried to get his hands on last time, but it's in Wendy's name? Correct. Okay, and what does Charlie Adelson say to that? Crazy. And what does Donna Adelson say after that? Total waste of the court's time. Yesterday, he sent Wendy a text that said he saw her leaving the school at 2.07. He's stalking her. Yes. Okay, and what does Donna Adelson say after that? That Wendy wants to file a protective order, is that what that said? Yes. But that, that's very hard to do unless there's a history, a previous history of threats or abuse. But she wants to let the judge know he's stalking her? Yes. Okay, what's next? And he, Charlie Adelson says, I agree? Correct. All right, what does Donna Adelson say after that? Anyway, it looks like mid-March or mid-April before anything will be resolved regarding him paying her through the court system. Okay, and then does Donna Adelson go on to complain about the judge on the case giving him too much time to pay? Yes. Okay, and what's next? Okay, is that more complaints about the judge in the divorce case? Yes. Okay, what's next? Charlie Adelson, is that where, does he say how much per hour the divorce attorney costs and that she needs to give a refund or complain to the bar? Yes. All right, and what's after that? Does he ask whether Wendy's mad at her attorney yet? He does, yes. Okay, what's next? What does Donna Adelson say here? 
in response, she says yes, but don't get, I assume that to be her, worked up about it. She's too stressed about it. Let's just keep conversation with her light and not add to what she's dealing with. Let her just get through Monday with positive family support. Nothing stressful, trust me on this. Okay, so Wendy's so stressed out, he doesn't, she doesn't want Charlie Adelson adding any more stress to her. Correct. All right. Um, what about after that on February 17th? So is, does Donna Adelson indicate there that she's just leaving the courthouse? Yes. Okay. And what does Charlie Adelson say? He says at work and then ask, how did it go? What does Donna Adelson say to that? Okay, we'll talk later. Okay. Charlie Adelson asked what happened? Yes. Does Donna Adelson then go into some detail about what happened in court, Wendy, what Wendy wants the parenting coordinator to do, and that she hates, Wendy wants the parent, parenting coordinator question because she hates Danny and will ask the court to have. Are you objecting? Yes. Are you objecting? Read the whole thing or not all of it? Please read the whole thing, the rule of completeness. The judge was really pissed at him for not paying Wendy but she will allow them to depo her with very strict limitations on the questions. Then Wendy wants the parenting coordinator question because she hates Danny and will ask the court to have him court appointed psychological testing, exclamation points. Okay, and what's next? Charlie Adelson uh, states, this is February 17th, her attorney is going to run up a very large bill for Danny. All right, and Donna Adelson says, yep. Yep. All right, what about two days later on February 19th? Another text from Donna Adelson. If you speak to Wendy today, tread lightly. Don't ask questions about the depot, her lawyer, etc. Tough day and she's really stressed out. The asshole showed up at soccer yesterday and when she tried to leave with the boys, he said, no, stay here and play with Abba. She to the boys that Abba had to leave and he said, no, I don't. Of course, she woke up to another email from him telling her that she is lying to the boys about their father's whereabouts and that this will be brought before the court. Such a fucker. It was Wendy's day. He is allowed to attend the children's activities, but that's where it ends. So Donna Adelson looks like she was mad that he didn't just attend the activities. Uh, Dan Markell engaged with the kids, gave him a hug, said he wanted to play with them. Yes. All right. Was there a text message exchange in March of 2014 where Donna Adelson asked Charlie Adelson to erase a text that she sent? Yes. Okay, can you show us that? Can you read it to us? Two texts here. The first um, says 37 miles to Gainesville. And the next is, I can't talk now, but I'll text you before we stop in Gainesville where I can go to the bathroom and have a moment of privacy. Then I'll call. Please pick up because I will have very limited, quote, alone time today. Erase this text after you read it. Okay, so she wants to go to a bathroom to talk to Charlie Adelson on the phone in private once she gets in Gainesville here. Yes. But wants him to erase that text on his phone. It's what it indicates, yes. Okay. Then a few minutes later, what does she say? We'll stop in about five minutes, and I can speak to you privately about Dad's birthday gift when I'm out of the car. I have some good ideas. Okay. So in this text, she's saying that the text she sent 30 minutes before is about Dad's birthday gift? It would seem so, yes. Or that the call she wanted to make was about Dad's birthday gift, rather? Yes. Does she ask him to erase this text message, though? No. And that's the message where she's talking about what the secret call is supposed to be about, right? Yes. If the defendant's dad, Harvey Adelson's birthday, isn't until July, it would appear that they were planning a birthday present for him here on this phone call in a Gainesville bathroom about four months in advance, right? Yes. 
All right, what does Charlie Adelson say when his mom sends him that? Uh, he replies, great. Okay, and what's next? Charlie responds, if you don't pick up, I'll call you back in 30 seconds. Okay, and what's next? <clears throat> don't call yet. I need five minutes till we get to Panera Bread. All right, was there a, a message in May of 2014 where Wendy, Ad I'm sorry, Donna Adelson references having a tough conversation with Wendy? Uh, yes, and I'm sorry, there's an additional response here okay. after these text messages where Charlie Adelson text, you guys back yet. Okay, and that's it. Uh, I'm sorry, can you go back? Uh, I can that, try. <laughs> that would appear to be about... Yes does not like going backwards. Okay. Does it appear that the you guys back yet message was about six hours after the I'll call you when I get to the bathroom? I believe so, yes. Okay. Could that be consistent with arriving back in Miami from, from stopping in the Gainesville area? Could be, yes. All right. So this message references a tough conversation with Wendy and a horrible morning with Danny? Yes in a tough conversation with her? Yes. All right, looking at June 7th of 2014, what does Donna Adelson say to Charlie Adelson that day? Just waiting for Gary to come, should be here any minute. Hope you have a good evening. Would you like the apartment the weekend of June 19th to the 22nd? I think we're going to tally. I miss the boys too much to wait till dad's birthday week to see them. Besides, we want you to spend some time here. We love you, uh, heart, mom and dad. Okay. Now, June 7th, this would be the day after, would this be the day after Garcia and Rivera arrived back in Miami with um, an unsuccessful trip for them to Tallahassee where they did not accomplish the murder of Dan Markell? Yes. So this would have been the day after they got back in Miami from Tallahassee? Yes. Okay. And what's next? He responds, okay, have fun. Still working on dad's B-Day present. To which Donna Adelson um, says, I know it's a tough B-Day being 70 at all, but I know you'll come through. And then there's a thumbs up, kissy face, mom. Okay. And those messages are on the following day on June 8th, 2014? Uh, they're actually June 7th if you do the time correction. I apologize. So still on June 7th, still the day after Garcia and Rivera arrived back in Miami. That's correct. After they were not able to kill Dan Markell. That's correct. This was uh, quite, quite an awesome testimony by Sergeant, I uh, uh, forgot his name already here, uh, Corbett. This is the most brilliant forensic type testimony I've ever seen in any trial ever. I mean, this is such a great interaction between Sarah Dugan. She was so smooth. He was so smooth as well, Sergeant uh, Corbett. It was just phenomenal. And uh, as I saw some of the comments here, one of them was really funny saying, uh, can't the jury just say this is enough that we don't need to hear any more of this foolishness and yeah unfortunately this the legal system doesn't work that way but seriously this is uh, what we've seen here today they could really stick a fork in it and just go home uh, and say you know what we're just going to start arguments tomorrow uh, unless defense has something to present but uh look at charlie i think charlie fi is finally realizing that uh he's cooked this thing's uh game over night once again, I'm going to give you the same instruction that I always do. Do not discuss the case with each other or anyone else. Do not watch any news reports or seek out any information concerning this matter. Please report at 8.30 again tomorrow morning, and we expect to get started at 8.45. Have a good night.
So as I was saying, this was, uh, this was so damning of uh, testimony showing that all the Adelsons are involved, not just Charlie. So they've really presented the fact that this is a family, this is a family uh, plan to have Dan Markell murdered and executed in his house, in his uh, garage. And so it's what's really also uh, disturbing is that this has not happened sooner. And so I really believe with this convincing and compelling well, information and we'll that, also uh, handle the issue concerning the transcript tomorrow morning. We are in recess. Have a good night, everyone. So I really think that uh, this case is so strong. It just you just see all these other Adelsons involved, including Wendy. So Wendy, keep in mind, was asking Danny about his travels for the 14th to 18th of July. Well, why do you think he was? she was asking about that? Because she was a part of the planning. That's how she knew this was a good time frame to do it. And uh, so she would also found out subsequent to that, I'm sure that he was traveling to go out of town. Of course, he would have told her when he's flying out of town because he's not going to be able to see the kids. So anyway, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's bye bye, Charlie. I mean, this is, uh, this is such an easy slam dunk case for the prosecution. I really don't understand why they wouldn't have had all the Adelsons there at, uh, other tables that they would have brought in to have all the Adelsons tried together. So it, this is a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of time from, um, all these witnesses doing their jobs as well. So, um, I just don't understand it, but I think looking on the positive side of it, I do see now future as happening. I can't believe Jack Campbell can sleep at night knowing this kind of evidence is out there against all these Adelsons. He's got an election coming up. I, I trust he's going to do the right thing. This is uh, this is beyond strange of what's been going on in this case that they've been dragging their feet like this. So um, he's the one in charge. He's a politician. So that can happen when you have a politician and these people are very well connected to the political machine from Miami to Tallahassee, Miami, the biggest city in Florida connected to uh, Tallahassee, um, where all this, what the state legislature is. So the state capital is in Tallahassee for those of you that don't live in the United States. So, um, yeah, I don't know why they wouldn't arrest them already. I mean, um, they should have arrested Wendy when she was up there, you know, why bother, um, waiting for this to happen. So it's, it's so compelling and, and overwhelming of evidence. And uh, that that's why I agreed to get coverage on this case. I, if this case was uh, handled normally, I would have no interest in covering it. I would just be disgusted. But, um, you know, shout out to Sergeant Corbett. I mean, this guy is phenomenal as a witness. What a, what a brilliant man. And Sarah Dugan, what a brilliant uh, attorney she did on this uh, job as well. So I'm very impressed with her and very happy. And I think this, uh, it's similar to what they've done before. But I mean, seeing this going on now, bringing all the Adelsons into the picture. I don't, I don't recall that being previously present, presented in this level of detail. And now we know why the birthday issue was brought up to um, Wendy Adelson when she testified the other day. Now we know where they got this from. It wasn't from Katie, as we heard about. Katie knew a lot less about the other Adelsons, but this forensic information, which is way, way more credible than anything Katie Bang Banawa could say, right? So this is the thing that's going to do them in. This is the thing that's going to force them to either plead guilty or they'll go to trial and they will die in prison if they, if they, uh, if they get a conviction. So these, these convictions are not difficult. And, uh, obviously you got that kind of brilliant, uh, uh, direct from Sarah Dugan on, there's a lot of complicated stuff to go over and to go over all this technical stuff, all these emails have it presented that kind of, uh, smooth package. I mean, think about what Rushbaum presented in his opening, um, the, the timeline, uh, sorry, it wasn't the opening, but when he presented that, I think it was the first day that what timeline chart, I mean, that was something like a, like a kid could have done better. So for this kind of testimony, I mean, it is so impressive. And, uh, I, I like I say, it's game over now. They won the case so well. Um, the jury could go home, uh, with no other evidence from the prosecution and, uh, they, they, they have won it that bad. So um, I think what we'll do now is um, it's been a long day. I've been sitting here in my chair, uh, taking it all in like you have. And for those of us that are doing the whole, whole day of trial work, uh, why don't we take a break? And we're going to be back on at 930 Eastern time. And I'm going to give you a full capture 
of what I think is going on and how all these evidence intersects with each other uh, as much as I can in the short time I have between now and then. But um, we'll see y'all at 930. And I think, uh, let me see if there's any other quick comments. Um, I want to smoke. This is a smoking gun. Yeah, this this is a smoking gun. You're absolutely right. Um, and uh, Scott, perfect comment. Uh, and talk about it ending on a high note. Think about it now. They can't they can't cross the Amman Corbett. I mean, what are you going to say as defense counsel? What are you going to say to Sergeant Corbett? You know, I mean, uh, it, it, it's just so overwhelming. And so, um, like I say, it's, it's just the bigger question is why they've been sitting on this. And like I say, I don't blame um, I don't blame either um, Georgia or Sarah. They're not the chiefs of that office. It's really this goes to the chief of the office. So I, I suspect that they've been wanting to try these cases years ago. So. Anyway, um, I, I just got to look at the positive that their days are numbered and that there's going to be um, multiple more arrests here coming in short order. So, um, yeah, so Charlie took the extortionist out to lunch. Yeah, and he's telling her, I love you and all this. I mean, please, that's your extortionist. That's going to ruin your life. So it, it is just so laughable. It's, uh, it's just a waste of time. But. Charlie has a constitutional right to present whatever kind of crackpot defense he wants to. And uh, he found a lawyer to do it. And uh, I, I can't believe the Rashbaum even does it with a straight face. I mean, uh, you see me cracking up with these comments. If he saw some of these comments, Rashbaum would be laughing and his head off as well. So in any event, uh, hope to see you guys back at uh, 930 Eastern time. Thank you.